Why did the newsroom news not fire up? Crazy. I'm trying to run a professional show here, guys. Okay, good day, mate. Forty here. So, what the heck are we doing here? Why do people watch live streams? And the answer is, we want to feel alive. We want to feel like we're in the middle of what's really going on. We want to be in the ultimate of all inner circles. We want a more authentic and raw and honest type of discourse compared to what what we usually get. And uh, that's why we're here. And uh, I want to carry on with this uh, decoding done by decoding the gurus of Destiny, who's one of the original political live streamers, highly intelligent man, very effective at uh, argumentation. And uh, let's see what makes him so good, what we can learn from him. And what, do, what type of discourse do you need to affect the people who actually make decisions. So we can have a fun chat here, we can have a real chat, we can keep things real, but uh, what's the type of language that actually changes the world, All right? And so just as an introduction, here's a little bit more from the University of Chicago. Right? This man, Larry McInerney, is the former director of the University of Chicago's writing program, and he's talking here about the type of writing that changes the world. This is very important because it changes your readers. Look, teachers read because they're paid to care about writers. Some readers in the world, in many cases, read to find out information they need. If you go to somebody on the quad and say, excuse me, or somebody stops you on the quad and says, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to the library? And you say, okay, yeah, go over there and turn right and go up there. They don't say, well, I doubt that. Because they're not they don't, as readers, have the function of challenging what you say. But at least in theory and in a lot of practice, your readers are different from those readers on the quad, and they're way different from teachers. Your readers have the professional function of challenging what you say. So explaining turns out only to happen inside of these two functions. You only explain inside of value having been generated and persuasion having begun. It is an enormous mistake of PhD level writers that they try to explain first. And I know why you try to explain first, because in school they just wanted you to explain first because the whole thing was just about seeing what you know. So it's hard to economize and make terribly efficient your real life uh, interactions with people. So often you have to endure quite a lot of, of boredom to have the, the, then the, the sustaining rich conversations that, that make life so worth, worth living. On the other hand, when it comes to more considered communication, such as writing or, or even preparing a live stream, you can focus on creating value, right? That's what you need to focus on if you want to build something that influences the world. So I notice what drives most people in their political, social, cultural, and religious activism is just feeling good. But what is truly more important to you? Is it feeling good or is it doing good? And to do good, you have to learn to become effective. Start explaining, line one, classic thing. Begin with the definition. Teachers love this, begin with the definition because it tells the teachers that you, what? You know the definition. Don't begin with definition, guys. <laughs> All right. So back to B. How are you going to make it important? How do you make it important? Now the second word you said. Oh no, that's a terrible word. Do me a favor. Do me a favor. Take the word new, or worse, original. If you think that you're here to do new and original work, if you would find the synapse in your brain that is storing those words, kill it. 
No. And people say to me, oh, does that mean I'm here to do non-original work? No. But you are not here to do original work. You are here to do valuable work. What's the difference? You think... Right, so the difference between valuable work and original work is you're taking into account the needs of your listeners or the needs of your readers. And what people most want with that regard is value. All right, so let me play a little bit more here from Decoding the Gurus, analyzing the live streamer Destiny, whose real name is Stephen Bunnell. TV, I think around 2013, um, from anywhere from, I think, around 2010, 2011, up to 2016. When the Trump stuff started to kick off, I saw all the conversations happening, and I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring and start having, like, political debates. I'd always been kind of like an argumentative debate-type person, and I'd always had, like, a peripheral interest in politics. But then with the Trump stuff, obviously, everybody started to feel very political online, and, yeah, it felt natural to get involved. Mm -hmm. So that tone of voice, by the way, you could hear it slightly different, right? Like a different energy in, in yeah. this interview. <laughs> so, very, uh, very different energy. This is a Destiny Only's best behavior. Not fat loads of cum dropping all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> this one. All right, different situations call for different energy levels, different styles of presentation, different rhetorical styles. Right. To, to be effective, we have to become as sophisticated as possible at the variety of situations that confront us and the different techniques for getting what we want, for moving things forward in our own lives, for understanding ourselves in the most sophisticated level from the bottom up, from the top down, from what's going on with others, what their incentives are, what our incentives are. <laughs> um, and uh, similarly, whenever they're talking about, um, you know, public streaming talks about this. I don't think we've ever had a setup on the planet where you've got a profit incentive on a worldwide thing that encourages people to only consume one type of content. Like, I think if you go back like even 15, 20 years ago before the internet was as big, you still had to be somewhat grounded because you had neighbors, you had your local community, you see people at church, you see people at the union, you see people at school. But now you can have whatever insane opinion you have, you can go online and probably find a community of like 5,000 people that have it, regardless of how insane your opinion is. And I think that kind of thing is relatively unhealthy. So, you know, concerns about polarization and when it comes to whether his gaming skills may have contributed to like his popularity and, you know, debating and this kind of thing. Do you think there's a certain set of skills or set of characteristics that, you know, being successful in one of those communities makes you successful in the other? Probably not. I think that the overlap is more likely that there's a, if you draw like a Venn diagram of like people interested in playing video games and then a Venn diagram of like online early political pundits, there's probably a lot of overlap because of the demographics. Like it skews pretty young, it skews fairly wealthy, it skews fairly white. Um, so when you have all these things together, you're going to... So unlike uh, many trads, I don't think there's anything inherently bad about playing video games. I don't play video games because I know how susceptible I am to addiction. And I want to use all my spare time reading and, and writing and uh, preparing for live streams. But uh, th th why is playing a video game somehow worse than watching TV? I think overwhelmingly playing a video game is a far healthier thing to do than watching TV. I get a lot of overlap between people that are, you know, in both fields, I think. I, it's, I'm of the opinion that most of the people that came from gaming have pretty bad political takes. Mm -hmm. um, when you're involved in, like, a thing that's peripheral to politics, then your entire political view ends up being informed by, like, one issue. So for a lot of people that came from the gaming space, it was, like, basically SJW and being anti-SJW, and that was, like, their entire worldview. So you get a lot of people coming out of the gaming space that were kind of, like, pro-Trump uh, just because they didn't like feminism, I guess, and I didn't like feminism. I mean, they didn't like being told not to say slurs or mm -hmm. not to be bigoted or whatever by the evil woke SJW people. Yeah. Yeah, that's... So I think a key part of uh, gaming's attraction is it gives the opportunity to conquer, right? Men need to conquer, right? Conquer ourselves, conquer the, the wider world. I think one of the healthiest things that we can do is just make money. Right, you, you get out there, you, you make money. I, I remember I had a psychiatrist tell me when I was just starting to get over chronic fatigue syndrome, get out there and show me how much money you can make. And it was great advice because if you make money in a legal way, in an upstanding way, meaning that you would not be embarrassed to share with other people in your life how you are making money, right? This encourages you to think about the needs of other people.
and spending 40 hours plus a week thinking about the needs of other people and how you can meet them in a legal and legitimate way is a really healthy endeavor. And then when you make money, you pay taxes, you build up uh, social security for re retirement, you build up uh, disability. There, there are all sorts of positive things. You build relationships with other people. Right? There are all sorts of uh, positive things that uh, develop when you, you start making money. And that, that urge to go out there and conquer, I, I think it's just absolutely essential to who men are, right? We need to conquer. And uh, so I notice with Orthodox, uh, modern Orthodox Jewish men, right, they're not out there having a life of promiscuity. So they'll go out there instead and they'll buy a sports car, right? They will take their family on an expensive vacation. They will conquer at work, right? They will conquer a, a tractate of, of Talmud. They will develop their religious observance. They will become active in their community, right? They, they will try to tackle some communal problem, right? So most of the important initiatives in, in Jewish life have been done over the past 100 years by non-rabbis. Theodore Herzl studying Zionism, the whole movement against uh, outing and, and stopping rabbinic sexual predators, Right, has come overwhelmingly from the lay side, not from the rabbis. A movement towards uh, ethical kosher guidelines, right? That's come overwhelmingly from non-rabbi Jews, right? From regular balabatim, right? Laity, and it also comes from this this male desire to conquer, right? You be, you see a problem, and you see that no one else is doing something about it, so you get out there and conquer. And uh, playing a video game, right? It it meets this same male need to to conquer. Tim, a little bit, you know, outlining the streamer culture and the SJW, anti-SJW thing, but, but actually saying he's not so sure that the, uh, the kind of characteristics that make somebody a good, you know, streamer of games or game. And uh, Elliot Blatt says, start stacking that cabbage, bro. What does that mean? <laughs> I have no idea what that means. Have I riffed on the Columbia University protests? So I don't know much about the Columbia University protests. What I do know is that we have had six months of Fox News driven coverage, but also other mainstream news media talking about rising anti-Semitism on college campuses. And I'm completely unaware of any stories of Jewish students getting beaten up. So college campuses are the least pro-Israel parts of America. They are the least nationalist parts of America because in academic circles, no, ethno states and Israel is, is, uh, is an ethno state from, from one perspective, not so much of an ethno state from another perspective, but it certainly has elements of an ethno state. And the dominant ethos on university college campuses is the liberal left ethos that we are primarily individuals, right? the perspective that fuels Zionism is not that we're primarily individuals born with certain inalienable rights. What fuels Zionism is the notion that we are primarily members of families, extended families, communities, and nations, right? Which is the traditional way of looking at the world. I, I do believe that we are primarily members of a group. We're primarily members of a tribe before we're individuals. I, I don't agree with the liberal left outlook on life, though I recognize its uh, contributions to creating great societies, all right? Th there's much about the liberal perspective on life that we're individuals with inalienable rights that I, I think is wonderful, but it is a severe distortion of reality. And the whole reason we tune into live streams is that we get sick of distorting reality. But to this uh, notion of uh, rising anti-Semitism on college campuses, yeah, I'm uh, uh, unaware of one Jewish student getting beaten up for being Jewish on an American college campus. So I think this rising anti-Semitism is vastly overhyped. What you do have is rising anti-Israel animus on college campuses, which is not necessarily the same thing as anti-Semitism. I think overall, American college campuses are among the safest places in the world for Jews to be. So this idea that American college campuses are places of rising threat to the safety of individual Jewish students, I think is absolutely absurd. But 
American college campuses are the least nationalist and the least friendly places to ethno-nationalism in America. So it's understandable that they would resemble Europe, generally speaking, in their attitudes towards the, the Jewish state of Israel, which to, to some extent you can view as an ethno-state. It is a state primarily for the Jewish people. And the liberal left ethos that dominates college campuses is you know, aghast at that. So if you are a good leftist, right, it doesn't make you uh, a bad Jew, right? If you have a negative attitude towards Israel, you are simply placing your left-wing identity, your left-wing values ahead of your Jewish identity. Those Jewish leftists who support Israel are simply placing their loyalty to Israel, their loyalty to their people, their identification with the Jewish people ahead of their left-wing ideology. There's nothing inherently superior or inferior about whether you place your political ideology first or your loyalty to your particular people first. So, yeah, there, there are protests regarding Israel around uh, Los Angeles, and the, many people I talk to have uh, considerable concerns about rising anti-Israel sentiment around the United States, ar around the world, and on college campuses. But as far as a, a visceral threat to Jewish life, I have yet to see any concrete examples of that on American college campuses, so I think it is uh, considerably overstated. And having a contrary point of view on Israel or having anti-Israel protests, I, I don't think that is inherently threatening to the lives of Jewish students. Makes them uncomfortable, but it, it's not the job of <laughs> American universities to make students comfortable. Right? Isn't it usually the right wing that complains the left are a bunch of snowflakes and it's not... Uh, it's not the job of public policy to make people feel comfortable. Well, let's apply that, that same right-wing talking point to the growing threat of anti-Semitism on college campuses. Now, all, all this could change uh, today, right? There could be something horrible and uh, Jewish students could come under threat. And I know at Columbia University, you've got a rabbi saying that Jewish students should just participate virtually. But uh, until someone is, is beaten up, right? I, I think the, the threat to the safety of Jewish students is vastly overstated. Player actually carry over into political debates and that. And he said a similar thing when Jordan Peterson asked him, like, do you treat debates like a game? Is that part of your motivation? And he, he sort of said, no, he doesn't think so. But I actually do think there is a, a, a gamified element to the way that he approaches debate. But in any case, all of the comments that he says about gaming culture and their relevance Okay, so let's say that Destiny does approach debate as, as though it were a game, right? There's this idea that if we can sum up one way that people go about things, that we have just summed them up. And, and it's not true. If there is a gamified element to Destiny's political presentation, right, that's just one element. So I know that when the mainstream news media would profile me as a blogger, their primary prism was, am I doing good journalism? But a, a live stream and a blog is not necessarily preeminently trying to be good journalism. There are elements of reporting and journalism to what I do, but there's also a considerable realm for other things. And so that we sum up, you know, one quality by which people go after things, right? Uh, we, we're usually motivated by some self-serving reason for everything we do, but that's not the only reason, right? We also have pro-social impulses. We also want to help other people. People are complicated. So you can have a gamified element to your presentation and that doesn't sum you up, right? That, that doesn't dismiss your contributions. Relatively superficial political takes and whatnot. That all rings true there, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, it'd be interesting to hear what he himself says about what he offers but um my recollection is he's quite upfront about that that he is running a business that he is a professional i don't know what you'd call it an entertainer or a commentator or whatever hey art bell my friend is in the chat luke fun channel this guy traps hogs hands them off to people dream job mate i got friends in australia who just love to be an outback ringer All right uh, there's a, a tv tv show is it outback uh, ringer yeah Outback Ring, a TV series in Australia where you catch bulls and men want to hunt, like men want to capture, right? And Outback Ringer follows the work of men and women who catch feral bulls and buffalo in the desolate Australian outback. So 
culture is the product of a particular set of genes combined with a particular environment. And what has shaped so much of Australian culture is, in the words of historian Geoffrey Blaney, the tyranny of distance. So in the 18th century, 19th century, to get to Australia would take two and a half to three times as long, typically, as going to the United States. So that's a large part of the reason why so many more people move to the United States rather than Australia. And even flying on a plane, all right, it takes about uh, eight hours to fly from Los Angeles to London. It takes 15 and a half hours to fly directly from Los Angeles to Sydney. Australia is an enormous country, about the size of the continental United States, with a population about uh, 8% as large as the United States. And so much of Australia's history, its culture, its ethos, its economy is shaped by this, this tyranny of distance and the vast desert that dominates Australia. Right? The, the Aborigines who developed and evolved to best uh, deal with, with this type of challenging environment, right? they had certain parts of their brain that grew much bigger than other types of, of brains, and that has largely enabled them to have superior tracking and, and visual spatial skills compared to Europeans and Asians because Aborigines became particularly adapted to the Australian environment. So Australian culture is shaped by this tyranny of distance. You feel separated from the rest of the world. About half of Americans who moved to Australia moved back, just like I believe half of Californians who moved to Texas eventually moved back. But you f it's easy to feel somewhat isolated in Australia. And all the big... Music groups still tour Australia. You still get the same TV shows and, and movies. But you just feel cut off from the rest of the world. And the countries that are closest to you, such as uh, Indonesia, you don't feel that much in common, right? Indonesians speak a different language, have, have a different religion, have a different genetic background from the overwhelming majority of Australians. So you, you do feel cut off. Overwhelmingly, Australians live in urban centers very close to the ocean, and very few Australians live in the vast outback. There was a, a good documentary, I think, on Amazon about uh, outback rabbis. So here is Molly Hemingway. I, I appreciate her commentary. So let me just uh, tune in to what Molly Hemingway is saying about the Trump trial. Number three under Merrick Garland at the Department of Justice. He left that cushy job at the Department of Justice to go be a line prosecutor in a, in a city office, that shows how coordinated this is. It's not just him. In fact, there was a law firm here in New York City that's known as a Democrat law firm that, that handed over a few of its attorneys to help bring charges against Donald Trump. This is part of a widespread and coordinated effort, and I think everyone kind of knows it. But it is really interesting to me to see this man out there today. And you look at how so many Republicans can't even handle a minute of negative coverage from the media. And this guy has people attempting mm. to bankrupt him, imprison him. You have actual House members trying to remove Secret Service protection from him. And he knows that if he were to just be no threat to the regime, it would all go away. And every day he gets out there and he keeps making his case. And that does a lot to explain why he is so beloved by so many Americans. Joey. Yeah, you know, I, I want to go back to what you said about he's on message. And if you accept the premise that most of us on this couch accept, which is that the what's happening in Georgia, the lawsuits in New York, and now this trial are politically motivated. They're geared towards helping President Biden win by defeating President Trump before he gets there. We have two men running for president. If you want to talk about on message, President Trump is running this campaign. So just thinking about how distance shapes us and genetic shapes us shows how much of what shapes us is not under our direct control. So when it comes to our own lives, I think most of us feel like we have complete freedom of, of will. But then when we look back at our lives, we see how we went in seemingly inevitable directions. And when we look at how other people behave, we see the material and physiological and genetic and religious and cultural influences that have driven them in, in their direction. So we, we live life forwards, right? Thinking about the future, but we understand our life backwards. And in the present, it feels like we've got complete free will, right? I, I could spend this time reading a book, going for a walk. I, I've got the day off before Passover. 
but when I understand my life looking back, it just seems like uh, so much of it has just been fated. And I used to suffer from tremendous amounts of self-loathing. Now that's, that's gradually diminished in large part because approximately 10, 12 years ago, I adopted the perspective that uh, given who I was at the time, I could not have acted differently. And I'm not arguing that that belief is true. Just saying that belief has been useful to me in letting go so much of my self-loathing. All right, back to decoding the gurus on destiny. He, um, he thinks of it as, uh, as a job, a job that pays quite well. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think um, he does have an extraordinary ability to marshal those facts, like do that sort of research, perhaps not, perhaps not super deep, but certainly very broad, marshalling all of those facts and arguments and then remembering them and then being able to go to an, a debate, say, with a Jordan Peterson and be fully and totally prepped. Um, yeah, I mean, just, yeah. Before we, but just before we leave that colourful language stuff, I, I don't think people should... It's, like, it's coming I mean, back, Matt. It's coming it's not, back. That's, <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not gone, so don't worry, but continue on. Oh, well, I could save my comment for then, but I mean, I think, um, I think some people could think, well, someone who talks like that, um, you can't really take them seriously, right? They're not, they're not a, a serious commentator. But I, I was just... Re- so we all had this economizing device where we are eager to find things to dismiss people. So if you have a scandalous past like I do, I used to write on the pornography industry for, for a decade, there are strong arguments for just disclosing that up front with clients, with employers, with, with dates, anything where that could come back to bite me in the ass. There are all these incentives to you know come forward with my, my scandalous past past and i at one one time just just as a philosopher i directed a porn movie now the downside of that approach is that it's wired into all of us to quickly dismiss other people because it's generally a useful heuristic so that we economize on our energy and we are careful about who we allow into our life and so very early on when we meet someone if we catch one red flag, we're highly likely just to dismiss them from our employment, from our love life, from our social circle. And you spot that one red flag and you just dismiss people. Or if you're looking for opinions on, say, the Israel versus Iran conflict, you you hear one perspective that irritates you and you may be very tempted to just write off that pundit or that strategist or analyst forever because we only have so much energy. And if we you know, dismiss people who don't seem to serve us, then we can spend our energy, our time, and our attention on those who, who do serve us. So that's a strong argument for not leading with one's red flags. And I know that uh, I have a tendency to want to test people because uh, underneath I have this insecurity and anxiety. And so I just want to test people to make sure that they're really going to be on my side and not just be a fair weather friend. But when you test people, you exhaust people and you are hurting people, right? If you unnecessarily exhaust people, you are hurting them, right? If you are constantly asking for reassurance from people, you are hurting them. You are increasing the cost of socializing with you and you are limiting their ability to be able to relax into connecting with you. And nothing good can happen with people until people let down their guard. And if you're constantly testing people, constantly seeking reassurance from people, right, you exhaust them and it makes it more and more difficult for them to let down their guard and, and truly connect with you. So Cyberview says you should just come to Jesus and everything will be better. I know a lot of people for whom coming to Jesus has made their life better. People who are nasty and then they came to Jesus and immediately there was a profound psychological change doesn't tend to work that way in Judaism. So Christianity has an ethos, come to God as a little child. And you see in the Robert Duvall movie, The Apostle, where Robert Duvall is able to change a very nasty man in in a couple of minutes. So you get these profound psychological shifts upon conversion to Christianity, evangelical Christianity, that you don't see so much with conversion to Roman Catholicism and conversion to Judaism. The Judaism and Roman Catholicism are much more legally oriented than evangelical Christianity. They require much more training. They both accord 
a much more important role to tradition. So the ethos of evangelical Christianity is to bypass tradition and go straight to the Word of God, and you, you form your own direct personal relationship with God. And uh, this is a more powerful spiritual life-transforming experience for many people rather than the alternatives. Type of view. I went out to dinner last night with a woman who told me over dessert that she likes nose candy. Red flag. Yeah, but I, I'm sure she's a complicated person. I'm sure there are hidden <laughs> layers of depth. Okay, I have, I have never kept anyone in my life who does cocaine, but one time a fan flew me over to United Kingdom for two or three weeks, and my first uh, evening staying with him, he was exhausted, and uh, we were going out to a club, and he said, oh, sorry, I need a bump. And, like it, His place was filthy, absolutely filthy, and uh, he cleaned off a little section of the table and like poured out some cocaine and, and gave himself a bump. Never seen that before. Then a few weeks later, he must have been going off the cocaine because he was just calling me in, in great distress and, and paranoia. Look, good to see Fox has coverage of the Trump lawsuits. Will they cover his speeches ever? It's an election year. Intimidating for YouTubers is, I see one minute clips only of uh, Donald Trump speeches. Yeah, if uh, social media is restricting Donald Trump's speeches, that, uh, that does not serve him. On the other hand, it will propel the growth of alternative media such as Rumble. Remember how discouraged people on the, the distant fringes of, of politics and culture felt about, what was it, four years ago with the growing power of internet censorship. Now it feels like YouTube censors less than they did four years ago. They, For example, I think they've stopped censoring claims that contest the legitimacy of the 2020 election. I believe that the, the 2020 election on, on a legal basis was legitimate and that all the changes to election law around the 2020 election were done legally now, you could argue, as I am open to arguing, that the Democrats simply worked election law changes more effectively than did Republicans. But on a strictly legal basis, yeah, I believe the 2020 election was, was legal. Now, we, we have the, the growth of, uh, of all these alternative media sites, uh, Odyssey, Rumble, et cetera, and it's not nearly as, as discouraging. Right, as we felt four years ago, when I don't know about you, it just felt to me like the walls were kind of closing in on us, and there'd be less and less room for perspectives that are outside of the Overton window. Reminded of, um, you know, we talked about Martin Luther recently. Oh, so back to Jesus, evangelical Christianity. I'm sure there are different spiritual and religious paths. There are different paths in life for, for different people. There are many different ways to lead a life, and wouldn't surprise me if different uh, religious and spiritual paths, you know, work with uh, different effectiveness for, for different people. So some people who grow up Jewish will you know, find a, a thrilling, fulfilling relationship with God in Christianity. Now, as someone who converted to Judaism, that emotionally upsets me, but intellectually, I, I see this obviously true. Other people who grow up Christian, such as myself, will find it much more intellectually fulfilling in, for example, Orthodox Judaism. Other people will find sustenance from uh, Buddhism or, I don't know, Hare Krishna approach to life. There, there are many different personalities and there are many varieties of the religious experience. And uh, that's humbling for those of us who converted and put everything on the line to you know, join with one particular approach to God. Right. Someone who is. Oh, you're going to compare destiny to Martin Luther. Oh, well, Go ahead. Go ahead. well, we we compare Jordan Peterson to Martin Luther, so I think we can compare destiny. Um, okay. You know, like by the standards of the time, he spoke the same way. Sometimes, yes, he could do the very careful theological, right. philosophical arguments, but he also called the Pope and the clergy farting asses, and mm -hmm. he talked about resisting the devil with a fart and chase him away, and it's a lot of. Right, so you don't see a lot of discourse in the dominant <laughs> elites in academia or in the mainstream media about chasing evil away with, with a fart. Right? That's kind of live streamer talk. So Martin Luther was the, the first live streamer, right? He, he, he was the, the rise of the, the guru with his own idiosyncratic uh, approach to religion. 
people like uh, Jordan Peterson, uh, Martin Luther, Dennis Prager, right? They don't practice religion in a way that's recognizable to most religious people in their denominations, right? They have their own highly idiosyncratic approach to religion that you could call Pragerism or Jordan Petersonism or Lutheranism. So the the gurus who are so influential today, they they don't tend to practice religion in the conventional way. They they do it in their own special way that uh, doesn't really resemble anything else going on for people. What about Buddhists? They don't believe in God. They are atheists. But I'm sure they, they believe in the transcendent, and I'm sure they they have a path you know, forward that uh, works for them to, to varying degrees. Now, I'm sure Buddhism both produces certain kinds of societies and is particularly appealing to certain types of people, right? Certain cultures, certain uh, genetics will be more predisposed to Buddhism as opposed to another religion. But overwhelmingly, we're all going to, if we were going to be religious, we're going to be with the religion we were raised in because from any outside perspective, every religion looks stupid at best. At best, other religions look bizarre and stupid. At, at worst, they, they, you know, they look downright evil. All right? So if you're not a Muslim and you look at what hits the news regarding Islam, you're going to be appalled. If you're not an Orthodox Jew and you see when Orthodox Judaism hits the news, you're frequently going to be absolutely uh, appalled. So... Any religion outside of our own looks weird because we we're all tend to be evolved to our particular in-group. The hog man gives Bible passages. You see, he gets urban guys to help take the meat and to haul the hogs. Look, I miss you playing Charles Johnson Twitter spaces. We need them. Okay, there is a big difference between that which is compelling, that which is entertaining, that which is exciting, and that which is important. And unfortunately... So much of what Charles Johnson says is so dramatically outside of the realm of even the possible that I become uh, more and more reluctant to engage with him. On the other hand, I do recognize he's a very smart man. He's a very capable man. And in all the detritus that he puts out, there are going to be absolute gems. There are going to be perspectives and information that you can't get elsewhere. So people are complicated. Charles Johnson is complicated. And he is going to come with innovative perspectives and breaking information that you don't get elsewhere. He's going to be way ahead of the curve with, with many news stories, but he's just so consistently seemingly wrong on many issues that it's hard for me to take him seriously. You'd have to give me timestamps, right? Give me links and timestamps to particular things that he has said that, uh, would be an economizing device so that we go to the heart of what he says that might be valuable and skip the detritus. Scatological language there, which, you know, to us sounds quaint, but was was appealing, I think, to the medieval... I, <laughs> I like this dick, man. I like this dick. Gamers as the theological clergy of the Reformation. Um, the, the, yeah, saying retard and whatnot. But I think but the, I, point I, is, but, but the, the point is, is that someone like Martin Luther... So think about soccer hooligans, right? It's hard to think of a more antisocial group of people, but these are people who are naturally inclined towards nationalism. And if nations start fighting for their lives may well be the type of person predisposed to being a soccer hooligan who also becomes an effective warrior for their people. So in some situations, our traits are maladaptive, but those same aggressive traits in a different situation may be adaptive. They may save the day, right? Europe may be saved by its soccer hooligans. All right, uh, live streamers may seem like a bunch of nerds, but uh, live streamers at times have opened up discussions that uh, are valuable and you simply can't find in mainstream news media had different coded language as well right he could he could go oh yeah through, yeah. And, yeah and i i mean i think you can these clips i'm playing now are from this uh, institute of ideas or i forget the specific name for it but anyway that that interview they did and you can hear a more measured mainstream appropriate tone right and um when asked about you know 
his uh, to be at tendencies and this kind of thing. He he said this. But back then, I would say it was willing to put in some effort to research, willing to have like sharp rhetorical skills, willing to be pretty edgy, and then mm-hmm. inhabiting like a left-leaning political ideology. Um, all those characteristics, again, besides me, were pretty rare. So I think there was a lot of hunger and thirst for it on the internet to see kind of like that group of people come up to fight against all of the kind of like the right-wing edgy people. Okay, so again, you know, like this, that's him positioning himself in a way in the kind of contrasting space, willing to fight fire with fire against the alt-right people. And also... So, contra points. Remember, remember that guy who pretended to be a woman and was taking down the alt-right and just received nothing but laudatory news media coverage? Uh, contra points is a great example of about how it, with, with elite discourse, the, the dominant ethos in the news media, right? There, there are good guys and bad guys. And someone who's a man pretending to be a woman is automatically a good guy for much of our elite uh, mainstream media discourse. And I, I don't recall reading anything critical about ContraPoints. And uh, yet she, she burned out. He, she burned out very quickly. And uh, on the other hand, if uh, he had received a normal amount of criticism, all right, it, it may well have served him better. All right. Accurate criticism makes us better people. You know, a bit edgy and that kind of thing. And and the fact he mentions there that he did research, which put him into a different category, which we'll get into. And I think is also true. But here's him actually from the other piece of content that we're looking at, which is from his kind of manifesto, why I'm not a leftist announcement um, where he the main part of that video is him litigating in excruciating detail a debate that he was in with a bunch of other leftist people, right? So the reason why um, the reason why I wanted to go over this is because this was like one of the big podcasts that now I'm getting attacked for by a lot of different people, but also because I noticed that there's a lot of revisionist history that surrounds what happened on this podcast. It takes a certain amount of strength to be able to keep going when you're attacked, right? Think about the tremendous inner strength that, that Donald Trump must have. And uh, same for someone like Destiny, who's been doing his thing for many years. He's, he's like a father of uh, political live streamers. So it requires the ability to stand on your own two feet. And it, when you outsource your own self-respect, to to other people, it makes you highly vulnerable. So to the extent that I can stand on my own two feet, and if I think I've I've written a good blog post or made a good video, then I I don't need other people to prop me up and say that was great. I mean, it was incredibly flattering and energizing to hear yesterday Curious Gazelle come on the show and talk about how much she appreciates my work. And that is wonderful, right? It's absolutely icing on the cake. And I'll admit, it's much more intoxicating when it, when it comes from a beautiful young woman who speaks with a, a Cambridge Ox accent. All right, that, that feels great. But as long as I don't depend on it, you know, I'm going to be just fine. I can just stand on my own two feet and I can have the inner strength to disagree with everybody in my chat and be self-authenticating, right? To, to be motivated by intrinsic considerations rather than depending on other people to prop me up. Podcast. So, you know, I spent about seven hours last night asking my audience for clips, going through clips myself. I said, okay, well, you know what? Eh, maybe I am full of shit. Let's, I rewatched about probably about two hours of the debate myself to make sure that I had like a coming in. Great question to ask oneself. Maybe I'm just full of it, right? Maybe I'm just wrong, right? What, what, what gives somebody good energy? I, I think it's someone who's rooted in reality and who has a sense of how they can be great at certain things, terrible at other things, vulnerable in some areas, strong in, in other areas, and an appreciation for the flaws and gifts and griffs of other people. Right? It's when, you, when you meet someone who's got that radical amount of self-acceptance, right? someone who's at ease with himself, all right, it, it frees you up. And it unleashes good energy. Fresh. I have a fair characterization of what happened here. And 
Yeah, you know, let's check it out, okay? And he's, he break. So we're often taught to feel good about ourselves if we do the right thing. But if you have the type of self-acceptance, right, that transcends your performance level, right, that is a more valuable type of self-acceptance than one that depends on your performance level. So if you've screwed up, right, if you've done the, the wrong thing, if you've engaged, let's say you, you've engaged in something that was honest, but it appeared dishonest. And as a result, you got you know, terrible consequences. You might have been fired. You might have uh, lost a client. You might have lost a girlfriend. You might have lost status. You might have lost uh, friends. All right. You, you know, may have been rejected by family members. All right. Because you're engaged in behavior that, that looked inappropriate or looked dishonest. All right. Then, then if you have a radical amount of self-acceptance, you can just look at it without berating yourself. You can just understand, hey, how did what I do serve me, right? The best way from a book I, I just read by Ross Allenhorn, uh, How to Change and 10 Reasons why, why We Don't. And it makes the point that according to one study that uh, change primarily comes about as a result of deep contemplation, right? To make a personal change in your life is to make a decision and to commit to that decision. That's why depression is often adaptive. Right? Let's say you've had... A, a series of failures at work, you've been fired from a series of jobs, right? To go into a depression, meaning you stop participating so actively in the world around you and you start considering where you have gone wrong. Then you start to formulate a new path forward and then you play out that new path forward in your mind and think about how it might work in different scenarios while you're in a, in a contemplative stage of your life, right? This will look like depression, but it's adaptive if you learn from your failures without berating yourself, the more you berate yourself, like my self-talk used to be, you stupid mother effer, you've really effed up, you're such a dumb effer, right? That, that's what used to dominate my, my thinking. And I noticed that becoming particularly strong after I went on Wellbutrin. So sometime around 2005, I think I went on Wellbutrin. And then chronologically it was connected. I don't know if physiologically is connected. My, my self-talk just became particularly harsh but it's hard to learn from your mistakes when you're berating yourself. So the reasons we, we don't change all right, are important. Right? The reasons we drink are, are important because there are many wonderful things that come with drinking. Uh, I have struggled at times with pornography and pornography is incredibly intoxicating. It just seems more intense, colors seem more, more vivid, life seems more exciting. I feel stronger and more powerful you know, when I'm watching uh, pornography than uh, any other endeavor. So the reason that people drink or use pornography or spend money or even under earn, right? Under earning is comfortable for under earners. It's a safe place, right? It's a familiar pattern. It makes your life smaller so that you're less vulnerable. So Ross Allenhorn in his book, How We Change and 10 Reasons We Don't, he says the only way to make a committed decision that leads to change is to do the hard human work of contemplating the pros and cons of your situation before you act. There's no chicken and egg riddle between contemplation and advice. Contemplation always comes first to succeed in making the change that you want to make. So most people in the United States who quit habitual drinking do so without treatment and without a 12-step program, right? Most people who quit this highly addictive habit do it on their own. And people who quit drinking on their own stay sober longer than those who enter treatment facilities, right? How do treatment facilities uh, make money by getting you to come back? Is there a new documentary called Body Count uh, documentary about uh, rehab facilities? Uh, damn, I, I've got to I've got to find the name of this uh, documentary about uh, rehabs. I, I just heard about it this morning. But uh, if you if you recover after going to rehab, all right, you don't come back, and so. The, the road to recovery, right, for the individual is not exactly aligned with the road to the m maximum amount of income for rehabilitation facilities, right? Rehab facilities make money by people coming back again and again and again. On the other hand, people who contemplate and take the decision on their own to quit drinking, they have much greater success levels than people who go to rehab. Their sobriety lasts longer, because the self-propelled sober person holds firmly to their own internal compass through their recovery instead of following someone else's advice. In other words, it's an inside job. So 
we have many reasons why we don't change, right? Staying the same protects you from awareness of how alone you are and your accountability for your own life, right? Particularly if you don't have children, there will always be the prospect of the, the terrible emptiness that, that lies, seems to lie at the heart of life. Staying the same protects you from the accountability for what you're going to do next. Staying the same protects you from the unknown. Staying the same keeps your life small and so re- seems to reduce your vulnerability. Staying the same protects you from your own expectations. Staying the same protects you from the expectations of others. Staying the same protects you from seeing where you are in life. Staying the same protects you from the insult of making small steps. Staying the same protects this monument that you have erected to your pain that because your parents or your ex did something horrible to you you've erected a monument to your pain that uh, from the outside looks like consistent maladaptive behavior saying the same protects you from changing your relationship with others staying the same protects you from changing your relationship to yourself so successfully reaching a goal is an important way one person can relieve the tension between where they are in relation to that goal and the goal itself but there's another Easier way to get rid of this tension just by giving up. No goal means no discrepancy, which results in no tension. Stein, all of the rhetorical techniques that they engaged in and how they misrepresented and how their positions are incoherent or whatever. It's a three and a half hour video, right? One thing that's gonna be a trend for this debate is he's gonna bring up a whole bunch of studies but he's not going to talk much about them. You know what that's called? Don't hope, don't say it. Don't spoil it for your chat. There's a specific name for this, okay? You might have seen it in a lot of threads accusing me of doing it. But we'll get to that. <gasps> we'll get to that right here. The Gish Gallop is a technique used during debating that focuses on overwhelming an opponent with as many arguments as possible without regard for accuracy or strength of the arguments. Now, could I do that to people? Maybe. One of the things that I say before every single debate I have, and you can go back and listen to any of them, okay, is, hey, I talk a lot. And sometimes I even talk over people if I'm getting like real excited. If I ever say anything you disagree with, stop me immediately and we'll go over it. But at the beginning of it, he left. And uh, looking at the chat, uh, Bill says, I wonder why Richard Spencer does not do Twitter spaces anymore. It hurts. No shows hosted by him. It seems maybe the tech problems put him up. No. I- I think what's going on is that he does his shows on his sub stack and you have to subscribe. So he's likely trying to drive up his subscription revenue. And also by limiting his shows to people who subscribe to his sub stack, he gets a friendlier audience. So many people would love to be rich and famous, but they don't want the scrutiny that comes with that. They, they don't want the aggravation that comes with that. There are advantages to doing a wide open show on X, but uh, the very openness of the show means that you'll likely get a lot more hostility and challenging questions than you would if you restrict your shows just to those who choose to subscribe to you. So we we all have many different goals in life and they, they tend to conflict. If you can restrict your goals to that which is aligned with your best interests, and that may mean making yourself a smaller target and less vulnerable to, to outside critics, right? Uh, that uh, seems to work better for people. Lays out his kind of political position, such as he understands it, right? So this is him talking to a streamer audience in about a similar sort of topic that we just heard him talking um, about with a mainstream audience. And I think there are clear parallels here in what he's saying. And this ties back into the fundamental reason why I got into politics. Um, so as a reminder, the, the, the only reason why I got into political fields is because I feel like people weren't having conversations that were reflective of reality. That's, That's a primary reason why people turn to live streams, because they see so much of mainstream discourse as stilted, convoluted, and, and bogus, uh, filled with tropes that, that don't reflect uh, the raw, painful nature of reality. Now... We can have some idea of our motivations, but the idea that uh, this is literally the the one reason he got into to politics is, of course, you know, bogus. It's a, it's an opportunity for self assertion. It's an opportunity to feel like uh, you're making a difference in the world. It's uh, exciting, challenging. It uh, is more prestigious. 
the only reason why I got into politics. Um, I'll repeat stuff I've said in the past. I didn't get into politics because I wanted to help minorities or because I care so much about LGBT issues or because I'm trying to save the planet from fucking climate change or because I think I'm the white savior of whatever black people, African people, whatever. I got into politics because I thought that people had conversations that weren't reflective of reality. Now, as a result of my analysis of certain problems, I've come into positions that are incredibly pro-LGBT, um, incredibly pro-minority, and not just when I'm around them, but when I'm not around them, um, that it, it put me into incredibly pro-welfare positions economically. Like, these are the positions that I've wound up at because these are the positions that I've... So Destiny's on the center left. I'm right wing, so there are many issues I don't agree with him on, but he does argue very effectively. He is highly intelligent. He's... Uh, fairly rooted in reality for a, for a live streamer. And uh, he seems to generally act with a very high degree of ethical integrity, uh, particularly when you situate him in his particular genre, right? What, what uh, draws people to live streams is uh, shock talk, raw talk, you know, often vulgar talk, the type of talk that you don't get in the mainstream news media. There's the whole drama spectacle component of what, uh, builds attention to a live stream and so you can't expect a live streamer to say uphold the more rarefied ethical standards of somebody in academia thought myself into um tying back that back into what i just said why i got into politics was, was because i wanted conversation to be reflective of reality i noticed that a lot of the criticisms that i get for the way that i behave are not reflective of reality. And this is incredibly difficult for me to sort through while I'm also trying to deal with thousands of comments of negative criticism, both from my community and without my community. So there, right, he's talking about misrepresentation, but he, I, one thing that I admire here in a way is that he's not presenting himself as being like fundamentally motivated by super altruistic principles. You know, he doesn't want to save the world. No, his motivation was that he felt that people weren't representing political positions honestly, and that frustrated him. So he wanted to engage in that and try and be more direct or more honest or whatever. And I will say that I think that is true. Like, it will go in to look at some of the other stuff that he says, but I think even where nobody's going to be consistent all the time. And you can also take issues with the particular positions that destiny is choosing to try and be consistent on or to you know outline clearly but in that expressed desire so consistency authenticity they, they have their values but they're hardly the preeminent uh, value that overrides all others the older you get right the more sophisticated you get in your moral thinking you realize that uh, ethics and, and morality and values are primarily a constellation right, where one value competes with another. For example, I love having a maximum amount of freedom of expression for me as honestly as possible to tell you about the world around me. On the other hand, I am willing to give up some of my freedom for my own economic well-being, for my own social well-being, for my own situation in Orthodox Judaism. I also, in addition to loving freedom, I also love being part of a religious community. And almost all of my life, I've been a concrete part of a, a concrete religious community. And to achieve that and to stay in that and to enjoy that, all right, I am willing to give up a considerable amount of freedom. So I try to steer a middle path between community and freedom. They're both important to me, so I'm willing to give up some sense of community and some attachment and comfort level in intense religious community for freedom and i'm willing to give up some freedom for community it's a, it's a balancing act because both are so important to me and that's i think a more sophisticated understanding of reality right there are all sorts of competing values all right saying what is true is a is an important and often beautiful thing but sometimes it's more important to say that which is kind to say that which is effective Right, frequently saying that which is effective is more important than saying that which is true. Right, acting in an upright ethical fashion is important, but sometimes it's even more important to act in a way that appears to be ethical and upright. And the, the appearance is more important than the substance because the appearance may well be seen by more people than the substance. Are there to be clear and to lay out 
positions clearly and be honest. I think he is somebody that strives to do that, including when he's talking in different audiences. Like he's not lying in the different things. He's just modulating his message depending on who he's speaking to. Yeah, well, particularly. Right, a normal person speaks differently to his lover than to his brother, than to his mother, than to his boss and his co-workers, right? We should be modulating ourselves depending on our situation. Particularly the style of the message. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it is interesting that he casts himself not as being motivated um, as being on a moral crusade, but rather being motivated by frustration. Frustration? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that the people aren't thinking clearly about the facts, at least in, in his mind. Um, and, you know, that is different from most of the other influences we look at. Like if you look at Hassan, he's definitely positions himself. It's moral grandstanding, I suppose. If you look at Jordan Peterson, he positions himself as yeah. being on a moral crusade. You could try to shoehorn um, Destiny's motivations as being, uh, you know, a moral crusade. In Okay, so that movie I was talking about earlier is called Body Brokers. It's a 2021 American crime drama about a young drug addict brought to Los Angeles for treatment and started his life over. The man learns the rehab center is not meant to help drug abusers. It's really an organized health insurance fraud ring enlisting addicts to recruit other addicts. And uh, this is frequently what's true, right? There's, there's often just reckless disregard for, for the well-being of, of addicts in many rehab centers because currently there's a, a lack of regulation and there's just a recklessness with which the industry operates and its financial incentives are that you don't get well because if you get well, you're not going to come back to rehab. And, and think about how soul destroying that would be to work in that kind of circumstance where you get paid, right? Your economic well-being depends on your clients getting better, but not well. It reminds me of Tom Wolfe's last uh, novel, Back to Blood, where there is a psychiatrist who specializes in sex addiction and the psychiatrist accompanies his you know, sex addict uh, billionaire client around you know, various uh, tempting parts of, of Miami life. And the, the psychiatrist is able to help the sex addict, but he's not able to get the sex addict to a place of recovery because if the sex addict recovers, all right, he is uh, not going to need the psychiatrist anymore. He's not going to be paying money. So we need to be able to stand on our own two feet, obviously, as much as possible. But when there are areas in life where we clearly can't stand on our own two feet, like if uh, you're like me, you consistently don't make uh, good decisions in, say, the area of, uh, of love, then, then you have to know when to ask for help favor of fact-based <laughs> and coherent argumentation but you know that's that's a pretty dry moral crusade if it is one yeah so let's let's hear a little bit about him reflecting on the debate pro topic for the two different audiences so you know who also opens uh, operates in a way kind of akin to body brokers and that is the more extreme religious devotees who don't have a normal level of human connection so for many Christians, everybody they meet is simply fodder for Christ. Right? They don't really relate to the humanity of other people. They're just looking to you know, create more, more converts. So my father was a Christian evangelist, and he would often get together with other evangelists, and they'd talk about how many people they had baptized. Right? That was their status. Right? How many people have you saved for Jesus? And this bread an attitude of looking at other people primarily as fodder for Christ. There are certain Orthodox Jews who primarily look at non-Orthodox Jews as fodder for halakha, fodder for Torah. And instead of embracing people in their full humanity, it just, uh, it's just an approach that uh, wants to you know, get people into a, a Torah way of life without you know, regard to the complexity of the human being that you're interacting with. So whether it's people who treat you as fodder for Christ or fodder for Torah or fodder for a political, cultural, or any cause, right? It, it's no fun to be treated like fodder. Right. So this is him on the, the more mainstream outlet kind of talking about that issue and, you know, the ethics of debating people and so on. Like, I can understand platforms saying, like, no racial slurs or something. Like, that's fair. But when we start, like, axing off entire 
parts of the ideological spectrum that we're not allowed to talk about, whether it's like COVID or vaccinations or um, election denial or whatever. Um, it does really bad things, I think, to the discourse. Uh, it makes us other people on the right feel unheard, which they should feel heard, well, even if I don't agree with them. It makes people on the left dumber because now they don't have any opportunity to kind of like sharpen their uh, I guess blades fighting these types of opinions. And then it just kind of drives all of us into these further, uh, like, uh, further radicalized like echo chambers where nobody has any idea <laughs> what, what what's actually going on. Like anytime I see a person on the right and the left come together and talk now, they just, in their minds, they just have the most ridiculous caricatures of the other's mm. opinions and nobody even knows how to have a conversation anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty cogent defense in favor of platforming and um, free speech, you know, having, having those discussions, I, I think. Um, I mean, and these decoding the gurus guys, they are not huge unqualified fans of, of free speech and, and talking to people on dissident fringes, particularly they have you know, absolute contempt for quote unquote platforming Nazis, meaning you shouldn't talk to people on a certain edge of the right wing spectrum. They don't seem to have any problem with the quote unquote platforming communists, right? You can interview commies all day long and uh, don't think the host of Decoding the Gurus would have much of an objection to that. He has been criticized for giving legitimacy to neo-Nazis, say. We'll get, we'll into, get that. into that. We'll, we'll get into we'll... that. And information does not act like a virus, right? If uh, someone talks about Mein Kampf, all right, it doesn't turn you into a zombie where the information just inexorably, inevitably you know, works at your soul and then turns you into a Nazi, right? People have evolved excellent mechanisms to detect when others are trying to manipulate them. We're not so good at detecting when our own thinking is faulty because there's probably a good evolutionary adaptive reason for that in that uh, self-confidence is uh, evolutionarily adaptive. It gives us the strength and the power to, to go through life. But we all have excellent mechanisms for detecting when other people are trying to manipulate us. That's why propaganda and uh, advertising, right? It, uh, it's not terribly effective, right? Uh, propaganda did not change the minds of people whose interests were allied against the Nazis into Nazis. And uh, propaganda didn't turn anti-communists into pro-communists, right? Our academy, our school system, our labor unions, uh, many of our institutions are dominated by the liberal left, and yet half the time we still elect Republicans as presidents of the United States, because even if you get a left-wing brainwash, right? Dennis Prager talks about going to universities, getting a left-wing brainwash, but we did not evolve to be gullible. And so all this uh, quote-unquote left-wing brainwash, or if you get a right-wing brainwash, it's not going to change your mind because we all have you know, pretty good ideas where our own best interests lie and we don't allow other people consistently to manipulate us. <laughs> we'll get to that. There's, there's clips that speak to that. And uh, yes, but, but I think you heard though, the echo of him, you know, what he was just complaining about, that he has to say all this stuff in order to get right-wing people to feel heard, right? But that's what he was exactly doing there. And he you have to go to great efforts to talk to people with a different perspective than your own, right? You have to put the reality of other people's lives ahead of your own. And right? if you're going to be effective at work, you need to take into consideration what your boss, what your superiors want. If you're going to be effective in your relationship. You have to take into account what your, your spouse wants. If you're going to be effective with your friends, your community. You have to think about other people and what's going on for them. And that requires effort because we naturally think about ourselves approximately 95% of the time. One economist came up with the idea that we're about 95% selfish. So when I talk to my sponsees, I say, try to live a life that's only 90% selfish, all right? If you can just dial that, that down a little bit, right? Your, your own you know, obsession with yourself, just dial it down just a little bit. If you can live a life that's only 90% selfish, you're ahead of the game and you're gonna be more effective. This is him then, a slightly different thing, but like him talking about the accusation that he's a debate bro. Uh, and this is him talking to his streaming audience. So the reason why I made this post was because I have to go through a great deal of effort after I engage with certain people to make sure, hey, like, am I full of shit? Like, am I maybe, like, maybe I am just like totally fucking getting high off my own fucking shit right now. Like, I might be 
I might be totally wrong on this. Like a lot of people are saying that, you know, I engage in dirty debate tactics, that I'm a huge piece of shit, that I scream over people like, fuck, like maybe, you know, maybe I am. Fuck it. And usually when I start to get these ideas, because I don't think I'm some exceptional genius that can walk. Right. So if you engage in dirty debate tactics or you do the wrong thing at work or you do the wrong thing by your spouse or by your kids or by yourself, right, it doesn't make you a piece of crap, right? I have spent most of my life feeling like, you know, a piece of crap that the universe revolves around. But we, we are not our biggest mistakes. Into a crowd of 10 million people and just be right. I don't think I don't think of that me uh, that of me at all. I think I'm probably somewhat above average intelligence, but like, I don't think I'm fucking Einstein or whatever. I think I'm just a reasonably intelligent person. I can read pretty well. It's about what I have going for me. I got a lot of Wikipedia articles under my belt. Okay. So when I run into situations like this, sometimes it's good for me to take a step back and go through the evidence. Well, okay. People say that, um, so let's, let's a couple of examples. And I, I sometimes I ask my uh, community for this. People said that I, um, <clears throat> people say that I talk over people that I talk too much. That's really interesting. When I had people go back and look at my debate with Nicholas. So let's look at the evidence, right? That's, that's the, the cool way to try to assess things. It's not the only way to assess things. It's not the only good way to assess things. It, it's hard to determine on the basis of evidence, you know, what, what's better, the traditional conception of marriage between one man and one woman or a more open conception of marriage, say, between two men or, or two women. So from a traditional perspective on life, right, we are not buffered, right? What, what goes on with you affects me. What goes on with my neighbors affects me. And we fear the pulling on the thread that holds social morality and social cohesion together. And so we instinctively tend to believe that traditional ways of organizing families and organizing life and the traditional ways of, of doing things in terms of interactions between people and building community and building family is, is superior to untested ways. But it would be hard to say right now on the basis of empirical evidence that uh, the traditional conception of marriage is you know, clearly superior to uh, gay marriage. But if you're a trad, right, you likely instinctively feel that, that gay marriage is an abomination and you're not a bad person because you're not reasoning on the basis of evidence, right? If you believe that God is real, if you believe that the angels and devils are real, if you believe that there is the holy and the unholy, right? If you see all sorts of dimensions to, to the world of holiness and the profane based on your religious, spiritual perspective on life, you know, that very likely may be a more adaptive, more powerful way of living life than the so-called empirical academic approach. Fuentes, he spoke for twice as much as I did, um, literally two hours to one hour. When I had people go over my debate with Michael Brooks, I think he spoke for like 35 minutes to like my 15. It was insane. Um, when I had people go over my debates with, um, there was one other, but oftentimes at the end of my debates, I'll have my audience go through like, hey, can you go and check? Like, can somebody like go, go and actually map this out? Did I really speak? Because I don't feel like I did. I feel like I have a pretty good like vision of myself from the outside. So, I mean... Uh... I have to have the caveat that I've only listened to 0.001% of Destiny's total content, but I, but I have listened to two debates. One was with Norman Finkelstein and some other people. That was about you know, uh, Gaza, uh, Israel. Gaza and Israel, yeah. And, and there was another one that was about the use, the use of the N-word, which is probably another thing we'll talk about. No, well, that, I, that is, that's the content that's that we're referring to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I have to say that, I mean, like in both those bits of content destiny's telling the truth like you know he was the person that was attempting to speak at least relatively speaking compared to the people he was dealing with he was acquitting himself well in terms of it being a, a good faith discussion however you want to describe it yeah he's trying to present his positions right like he's not trying to hide from them even where they involve him like clarifying that he doesn't think dropping the nuke that will kill 2 million Palestinians or whatever is not necessarily genocidal, right? Now, he wants to argue that because he wants to say that there can be things which are bad, which are not genocidal because they're specific characteristics. But that is him trying to clarify his position. Now, you can still disagree with it. You can regard that as like a very bad stance to hold. But he is trying to be clear about what his position is when he's doing that. 
Um, and I, I do feel that a lot of the people that he engages with, that a lot of the frustration comes when he is trying to get them to like say what their actual position is and they do not return the fever, right? right? Mm-hmm. So to speak. So yeah, and maybe these are clips that are relevant here. So from that um, stream, the one where he litigated. So if you get tired of the censorship in YouTube chat, just a reminder, I'm going out live right now across dlive.tv backslash look forward live streams. I am currently live on Rumble. I just realized I have two Rumble channels. Uh, that was kind of embarrassing. So I got 951 subscribers on rumble.com backslash Luke Ford. And then I've got 18 subscribers on rumble.com backslash user backslash Luke Ford. So <laughs> I was wondering where many of the videos I uploaded went. Apparently I got about 2,600, 2,700 videos uploaded to each channel. But I'm going out live across Rumble, across uh, Twitter, uh, across Odyssey, in addition to YouTube. And there is basically censorship-free chat on DLive, on Odyssey, on Rumble, and on X. Like A large part of it is litigating his argument that people should be able to use the N word in private, which seems an insane political position, like a hill to die on for someone, um, especially with liberal sensitivities. But th- I think that speaks to the point that like, if he thinks that that is the correct argument, he's going to die on that hill as many <laughs> times as necessary to argue why he thinks it's coherent. So let's play a couple of clips about him, you know, highlighting this desire he has to represent his politics accurately and what his politics are about um my political beliefs are what they are and i consistently present them through every single part of my life um i will say them on stream i will say them to friends i will say them on a stage full of black people who might even be police officers full of an audience of black people that are conservatives that hate me um i have lost business relationships um i have lost friends or acquaintances um i've cut off family members i've lost fans i've gained friends gained fans gained business acquaintances all of this has been like a big shift um as i've kind of like grown and evolved with my political beliefs over time uh all of my money comes from advertising on twitch and then subscriptions, and then revenue that I make through merchandising sales, and then the individual sponsorships that I sell along the way. I'm not paid by any major media organization, um, the Young Turks, Washington Post. None of these people give me money. I don't take donations for political purposes from anybody. Uh, the views that I express on stream are my views through and through. They always have been, and they always will be. That will never change, because I don't care to change them for anything else. Yeah. I'll just have to say that this commentary of himself gels with the information that I've got about him and the impression that I've got, which is that, well, first of all, he's very upfront about it's a business model he's got. Um, but but yeah. also, you, we, as we talked about at the beginning, the streamer brand is one in which you seem to break down the, any distinctions between your personal life and your private opinions and oh, your yeah. public facing commentary, right? Um, for, for good and ill, perhaps. But what that means is that in practical terms, when you are, um, you know, just talking for hours and hours on end every day, the brand is authenticity, right? Like, like him or loathe him, uh, you know, the, the, the brand is the character, whether it's Hassan or destiny and he does seem to be serious about his attempt to be whatever to be consistently himself i guess in all of these different contexts yes yeah so i'll take a slight pause matt we'll we'll continue back to destiny you know owning his beliefs and being sincere or not but i i feel a sidetrack might be useful at this point to just illustrate to people who are you know wondering like what exactly do you mean in terms of personal and political and whatnot all getting intermingled? So this is from a stream Destiny did after getting divorced from his wife. And he's now 
commenting on her contacting him about some money or something, right? Like the stream is an hour and a half going over the various issues that he has with the way that his wife has acted or whatnot. And this is Melina, a 20-year-old at the time they got married, fellow streamer. or in- Hey, Curious Gazelle is in the, the chat. Oh, man, let me pull up the, the chat. But there are comments about my shirts. So all my shirts are pretty much the same. My sister bought me this type of shirt. And then I got, she got me that blue shirt, the, 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 dark, the dark blue shirt. And I got so many uh, positive comments on it that, that I just kept buying this uh, Van Heusen men's dress shirt fitted poplin solid. So this is, I think, dark blue, Persian blue, Persian blue. I think that, that was the first sh- shirt that my sister bought me. I got so many compliments on it that I then only bought that type of shirt in you know 10 different colors and I never got another compliment of the shirt so Persian blue is overwhelmingly I believe the the shirt that uh, people like the like the best uh, I like black but uh, the only one that people seem to resonate with is the Persian blue okay Luke needs to up his merchandise game I'm going to do an analysis of an analysis of an analysis of analysis and analyze your decoding of the decoders. You must be a fan of the Iran deal. Curious Gazelle likes likes black. So the serious point for doing an analysis of the analysis of the analysis of the analysis is if you can get increasing clarity, then it's worth doing a show. If I can contribute something such as increased clarity on a difficult issue, then it is a worthy endeavor, right? So if you can add to the clarity when you're doing an analysis of analysis and analysis, keep trying to get things down to their essence as much as possible, then I think it's uh, worth doing a show. Instagram person. Anyway, let's just hear a little bit of that. Does the therapist know about that trait, talking shit to other people and Mel? Yeah, of course. It was one of the huge things that would come up over and over and over again. But she always had like an excuse for everything. So there are some excellent co codes for for decoding and one of them is like why do i resonate with a particular text or idea or philosophy or approach like how how does it serve me like what is it in me that likes that that gets a payoff from this particular type of uh, religious text uh, secular text because usually there will be some resonance in my personality and in my life that uh, that moves me. So for example, I, I got, I was sick when I went to UCLA and my time at UCLA was severely limited by my quote unquote chronic fatigue syndrome. And, and that was a very deep pain for me because I had built up UCLA in my mind that this would be the place where my life would really take off. And instead it was the place where my life essentially came to an end for the next uh, five years due to chronic fatigue syndrome. So when I hear about other people who had some devastating illness or accident when they were at university that, that forced them to leave university, I can, I can relate. It, it's such a powerful emotional resonance with me. I love walking around the UCLA campus. It just, it just causes this enormous ache in my heart. I, you know, I think about the life that might have been if I didn't have this crazy vegetarian diet, if I'd gotten diagnosed earlier with ADHD. I just remember the sense of possibilities that I had and, and the vastness and ambition of my dreams when I was at UCLA. And so people who've gone through something serious, similar to that, right, I, 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 I resonate with them. I empathize with them. It, it's just so uh, emotionally powerful for me. How did I feel about our chat yesterday? Did you find an increase in clarity? I would love an honest answer. Yes, because uh, one of the things that I like about you, Curious Gazelle, is that you're not afraid to tell me that I'm completely wrong about something. So you, you, helped, you helped me clarify, uh, the, say, the, the greatest fear for the two hosts of Decoding the Gurus, and, and I believe it's, it's falling out of resonance and sympathy with their peers, which should be a very powerful fear for anybody who's got any kind of profession. You don't want to fall out of consensus with the people who are most important to you in your professional path in life. Oh, 
I was really moved by the the compliments that you gave me. So I, I strive to be primarily self-authenticating. Uh, I strive to primarily be intrinsically motivated, but it's, it feels like a beautiful thing to be appreciated. And yet I'm able to, I believe, handle that appreciation so that it doesn't intoxicate me and lead me to bend over backwards to cuck to you to try to get more of that appreciation, right? I'm happy to tell you where I disagree so I can, I can process and appreciate the appreciation without then bending or cucking myself to try to manipulate you to give more of it and to avoid conflict with you because you become such an important part of you know, my emotional sustenance, all right? I'm, I'm a man who can stand on his own two feet and, and I don't need to, to bend or try to manipulate myself to get uh, you know, more feedback or more appreciation from people who I like and respect. Yeah, our levels of analysis were, were different. And I'm a different person when I talk to you. I'm a different person when I talk to Ricardo. I'm a different person when I talk to Stephen J. James. Right? Different people bring out different parts of me. And it is particularly important for me to talk to women because according to my YouTube statistics, 100% of my audience is male. And women have different insights and different levels of emotional sophistication that is not usually available to men. And so getting that, that different perspective uh, it is something that I'm not going to get just on my own as I go through life. How is the relationship I have with you different from my relationship with Duvid? What aspect do I bring out in you? Ooh, that's uh, that's shall. Well, here's what you and Duvid have in common: that you both frequently have perspectives that I never would have thought of, that are like like completely out of the box. And, and, you know, outside the, the realm of possibility. And, and therefore often present a challenge that uh, I was not, not prepared for. What I appreciate, uh, particularly with, with you, Curious Gazelle, is that you seem to, <laughs> to get and appreciate what I'm trying to do. Right? When you try to do something, try to build something, trying to offer something, try to give something to the world, and you seem to sense the, the very nub, the essence of, of what I'm, I'm trying to do here. And that, that moves me. And you give me a stimulus of questions and challenges that uh, I don't get elsewhere. And you, you have an experience that is different from the experience of almost everyone else in my life. Uh, prior to you, I don't think I've, I've had a Muslim friend. I've had positive interactions with, with individual Muslims, but I, I've never had a Muslim friend. Yeah, you and Duvid have not committed to no FAP yet. <laughs> I, I don't think no FAP is the path for everyone, right? I, I think it's a good path for certain people. Um, I'm just trying to think of like where I want to... Because uh, there's like there's just like one or two quick things I wanted to run over, and then I might like I'll probably do a more comprehensive thing. Um, why do you think that she isn't going to leak or talk shit? Uh, Melina will not leak or talk shit about any of this because she knows that uh, everything about this makes her look like a f***ing satanic demon. She knows that. Uh, she's threatened it a million times. Like oh, I'm going to start leaking everything. Oh yeah, let's go. Okay, if you really want to, holy. F my reputation is already zero in regards to our relationship. Everybody thinks I'm a horrible piece of shit. We want to start leaking shit. We can do it. She knows that she looks horrible, though. Yeah. So, so wait, man. Well, let me just play the second clip for that, and then I'll allow you to come in. So that's that's one thing. And then uh, here's a little bit more of that. So normally that would just be an absolutely horrible thing to say about your ex. But I remember once I, I dated someone who was a writer, uh, Holly. She'd done a BA in English at uh, UCLA. She also was a writer. She enjoyed being a public figure. We were two perhaps narcissists in love. And I would, I would you know, run by her things that I wanted to blog about uh, publicly. And you know, overwhelmingly, I you know, got her permission. There, there were a couple of times where I didn't, and I, I paid the price. All right? Our relationship ended over this. Right? One day, uh, Holly said to me, it, it, it's really difficult to cook for you because of the turbulence in my childhood. I grew up very inflexible with regard to food. I'm a vegetarian who doesn't like vegetables. So 
many women have found it hard to cook for me. And so I suggested to, to Holly that she contact my stepmother because my stepmother knows the type of food that I like. And so my stepmother gave Holly a recipe for lentil stew, which was one of the staples in my childhood upbringing. I remember in my teens, my family was watching 60 Minutes on a segment on illegal immigrants to California. And it talked about they were so poor that they had to subsist on a diet of beans and rice. I said, hey, that's us. We, we subsist on a diet of beans and rice. So Holly went to tremendous effort to create this lentil dish for me. She, she went to different stores to get the ingredients. Right? She went out of her way. And then I came over to her place and I get grumpy if I'm hungry. So I came over and I essentially said, you know, I need to eat right now. And because of my grumpiness and my demands, Right. She didn't get to fully and properly cook the dish and it didn't taste that great. And and she kind of sensed my lack of enthusiasm for it. But I still wanted to take it home because it was better than anything I, I'd make for myself. But she she'd thrown it out. OK, I was still OK. Right. Our relationship was still standing. But then I published on my blog of the time a conversation that I had with my friend Kevin Blatt, and I t said, you know, I'm so amazed and, and moved by what uh, Holly did for me going out to contact my stepmother and going shopping at different stores to prepare for me a lentil dish. And then Kevin said, well, how was it? And I think I said, not that great. And I made the mistake of putting that on my blog. And that was it, right? That was the end of my relationship with Holly Randall. And also, unfortunately, I, when, when Holly went to rehab for alcoholism, went back to rehab for alcoholism, I, I think I said something like alcoholism, right? Uh, it's not a disease. It's just a, a failure of moral will, which is ironic considering how about four years later, I too embraced the 12-step model. And she had limited access to the internet and to her phone when she was in rehab, but she found out about what I said and I got you know, a furious phone call about it. And so what I said was incredibly hurtful to her on, on those two occasions. All right, that was outside the bounds of what uh, we had arrived at as being you know, legitimate for me to talk about publicly. But with, with a you know, normal girlfriend, I'd never talk about anything publicly, but because Holly was a writer, Holly was a public personality, you know, Holly enjoyed some of the drama that, that went with all this. So it was appropriate and okay for me to discuss her publicly in you know, some areas of life with, with her explicit and, and tacit permission. Then Holly was working the 12 steps and she was working the ninth step where you make amends. And so she said, I want to take you to dinner so that I can work my ninth step. And so she took me to dinner and she apologized for some parts of her behavior when we were together. It's nothing heinous. It's just like the normal bruising of any intense relationship. And of course I forgave her and she paid for dinner. She paid for every time we ate out. I remember Holly on a podcast said, most men are bothered when I pay for things, but for some reason never seems to bother Luke Ford because I think that my contributions to civilization through my writing, my blogging, my podcasting, all right, uh, are of sufficient merit that uh, it's just wonderful when other people, you know, pay for our meals out. And then we start chit-chatting about other things, and I confided to Holly that uh, it's hard for me to look at porn because when I look at porn, the face of my rabbi comes to my mind, and and the pain that I, my my bad behavior has caused my rabbi is so intense for me that uh, I can no longer look at pornography. And so I've, I've stopped uh, masturbation. I've stopped using pornography. And then Holly, she had a, I think, a biweekly column in one of the porn industry trade magazines. And she wrote a column with the title, Even Good Jews Masturbate. And she included enough specific details about our conversation that everyone knew who she was talking about. And I found it humiliating. But uh, she was giving it right back to me after all the, the pain and aggravation that I'd caused her. Uh, I guess I, I brought that on myself. And it was just such a human moment, right? I, I had more than deserved this. And it sprang from an opportunity for her to work the ninth step and to make amends. And I felt, you know, I just felt 
humiliated and mad. And uh, uh, one time I took her to, she wanted to go to a Shavuot service. She wanted to go to a Jewish religious service. So I took her to Beth Arm, which is a conservative synagogue. And the Jewish tradition on Erev Shavuot, so the night of Shavuot, is to study Torah all night. So I took her to a couple of sessions. So we were at Beth Arm, say, from 9, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. And then between the various uh, Torah learning sessions, there would be breaks where people could fuel up on caffeine, uh, have, have snacks. And so when we go out for, for a break, uh, someone <laughs> runs into her who's a subscriber, I think, to her website. Ah, this is my rabbi have a grimy beard. <laughs> Maybe, but <sighs> look, once you've experienced the warmth of your rabbi's smile, right, no other life is possible for you. I mean, when you see your rabbi every morning at prayers, when you, when you see your rabbi every morning at uh, Talmud study, when you see your rabbi every evening at, at prayers and Torah study, when you, you form intense bond with your rabbi, when you confide in your rabbi, when your rabbi provides you counsel and direction, when your rabbi sticks his neck out for you, when other people in the community say, hey, this is, you know, this is a lousy person, uh, and uh, he, he sticks his neck out for you, then, then you just develop a bond. And, and when, when he smiles at you, when he sees you, when... You're, you're connected to him. Like when you have a Rebbe, like it just feels like no other life is, is possible for you. So, so I caused my, my rabbi's great pain because I'm an outspoken individual and people would, you know, complain about things I, I wrote to, to various rabbis who were important to me. So when Dennis Prager was really important to me, Whenever people had objection or took offense at something I wrote, they'd go to Dennis Prager and say, you know, this guy is a big fan of yours. What do you think about him writing on the pornography industry? Or you know, this person is a devotee of yours. You know, what do you think about this particular blog post he wrote? So what I learned to do is to develop my rabbinic attachments often out of sight to spread them out so that I wasn't just vulnerable to one rabbinic attachment. So I wasn't just vulnerable to one uh, synagogue attachment. I learned to participate and play an important role in various synagogues. So it wasn't like, you know, one synagogue or one Rebbe was taking responsibility for me. And I learned to back off the intensity of my relationship with, with a rabbi so that, uh, there was less importance writing on it, and so I became less vulnerable. So if, if I had just have one powerful attachment to a spiritual leader, to a rabbi, right, to a mentor, then whenever I do something that's edgy, people will go to that person because people just instinctively know how to hurt you. And so if it's one relationship that's most important to you, you know, people will just go there, and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll dig the knife in. And... Uh, People enjoy you know, using whatever opportunities they have to shape us and to change us. And people, if we offer them a sword, they will, they will use that. Did I change Holly's name here? No, I'm talking about Holly Randall. She's been uh, very open on various podcasts about me. And so I am equally open about uh, our relationship right here. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. The only things that I want to do, though, is I want to make sure that, like, I don't want to be thought of as a liar. That irritates me. Um, I don't like the idea that I, the impression is that like I'm an abusive person. And I want to give like a very broad accounting of like things that have happened because I don't like the impressions that exist of me, like relating to a lot of the stuff. But what I have to like be careful about is I don't want it to. Be wow, Curious Gazelle says you can discuss me publicly, obviously without uh, naming or identifying her. Uh, Curious Gazelle. I mean, she's from a Pakistani Muslim background and lives in the United Kingdom. And, and yet we have the same sense of humor. We've had many of the same sort of struggles in life. And we, we just resonate with each other, even though we seem to have completely different genetics, completely different uh, imprinting, completely different cultural and religious experiences. So I've had clean shaven modern Orthodox rabbis but uh, generally speaking, a traditional Jew has a beard, right? 
And a beard is a masculine thing, right? I had a beard for three years. It made me look fiercer, made me appear more masculine. It made me appear older. I felt more connected to my Judaism. And this will sound superficial and shallow and showy and performative. I I developed a beard as, as a way of signaling and I think beginning in 2008, that, hey, I no longer write on the porn industry. So I'd quit writing on the porn industry 18 months, two years, three years previous. But then growing the beard helped to like separate, you know, bearded Luke from, from the Luke who became infamous for writing about the pornography industry. So I did not shave for about three years and then I needed money. And so I managed to get a $500 loan uh, by agreeing to shave off my beard. So th- that's my beard. I think about halfway down uh, the, the length that it eventually got. It, it was itchy for a few months in the beginning, and it was heavy, right? I did feel that extra weight on my head, but it did feel enable me to feel stronger, fiercer, uh, more masculine. It's the traditional Jewish approach is that men don't cut their beards. They let their beards run. And uh, the, the clean-shaven Jew is a modern Jew who is, in, uh, who, is in, who is out of step with the Jewish tradition. And it was an essay by a modern Orthodox rabbi, right, Mer Soloveitchik, in Commentary Magazine, who, who made the case for why Judaism uh, proposes beard. So, yeah, I read this essay in the February 1, 2008 edition of uh, Commentary Magazine, Why Beards? And uh, this was now five months after I'd stopped writing on the pornography industry, and that's when I started growing a beard. So men in particular, I think they can hear an idea, they can hear an argument, they, they hear a phrase that can change their life. They can hear an, an argument that could just change their life, and I adopted it, and that's the way I rolled. So from February 2008 until December of 2011, I did not cut my beard. Be like, I hate Melina, uh, which I do, by the way. F- that bitch. Uh, she has everything that's coming to her. Uh, thank God. Um, but I don't want it to be like, because I hate her, now we're leaking six hours of like our private life to make her look bad. That's not like my goal. And that's not even for her. F- I don't really care about it. It's just, it reflects poorly on me. And it's not like the character that, uh, I don't think it's becoming of like high character. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that. Becoming of high character. Hey, discussing, we've got uh, Stephen, you know, your... Stephen J. James joining us. Stephen, what's going on, bro? Hey, Luke, how are you? Two, I am two days blessed. on the trot. Thank you so much oh, for stopping God. by. Yeah, look, Luke, I don't have long, but I did want to issue an apology to your audience with all sincerity. May I do that? Please. Okay, so, look... I realized that many of you must come here because what you really want is to hear Luke uh, listen to a couple of English cooks dissect people on the internet who they feel are beneath them and ridicule them or even perhaps interrogate Luke about his masturbatory habits. And then I come along and I just insert myself into the discourse here. And truly, I have nothing to add. I'm boring. Uh, I, I have working class vibe and like, well, it's just the boringness really, Luke. I, I mean, I hate to inflict this upon the audience, particularly it must be so grating, especially to any single upper class ladies out there who, who have to put up with this. So I do feel uh, a, a deep shame and regret for just like coming in here and gate crashing. Bro, bro, don't don't buy into that criticism. But uh, but but seriously, I have been extrinsically motivated for much of my life. Like you know, depending on feedback from other people to tell me who I am, which is very common for people with ADHD. So you also seem to suffer from ADHD. So to what extent have you depended upon other people to tell you who you are? No, I think I've admitted to you. In a, in a way, actually, I do get external verification. Uh, I admit that. I, I do rely upon it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you know, we all do that. I think those people who say that they don't 
and they can just like sail above it are, are lying. What do you think to that? Do you think they're lying? Well, I think you took the easy way out because you said that you you know get benefit from external validation, but that that that's not really the point. We we all you know appreciate a compliment. It is to what extent have you depended upon other people telling you who you are? For me, I've depended way mm. too much, like to a maladaptive extent. I had a, mm. saw a psychiatrist for three hours in year 2000 because my family is so worried about me. They paid for me to fly back to Australia to see the doctors of their choice. One of them was a psychiatrist who said Luke okay. Ford depends upon other people to tell him who he is. That was not a good thing. It wasn't a normal, you know, appreciating other people's uh, perspective and feedback this was a maladaptive role that one i was out of touch with reality and two i consistently depended upon other people to tell me who i am and the big danger with that is that 95 percent of the time people aren't going to bother so for every time someone yeah. gave me a criticism there are at least 20 other people who had the same criticism but they just weren't going to bother to share it with me so to what extent do you think you have depended on other people to tell you who you are so not so much, to be honest. Uh, um, I, I kind of took my own path in life early on, got my head down and focused upon... Uh, I could, what I'm trying to say is I really could have taken like the ADHD diagnosis to heart. People always say this uh, when they're criticising the idea of an ADHD diagnosis itself and the fact that I actually admit it and I believe it and I think that it is it is the correct diagnosis. They always come and say, no, don't allow yourself to be defined by that. You're you're wrong. ADHD, and then they'll say like things like ADHD doesn't exist. Um, you hear this all the time. People who say mental illness, full stop, doesn't exist. But specifically, the danger that they say is allowing yourself to be defined by it. But I never was. Um, in fact... Uh, yes, at school, uh, I had to have like the adult come and sit next to me and tell me to stop shaking my knee and to stop looking out the window and all this kind of stuff at school. But I like forged my own way in life and it was by knuckling down at sports. I've told the story many times um, at, at that. Yeah, you can, tell, you can tell in someone's voice when they've, they've said something many times when, when it turns into a, a yeah. rote story. Yeah. Well, I don't need to go over it, but yeah, that's what I did. I don't know if that explains if that was like the answer that you were looking for. Well, that's the familiar story that you've used, but I'm wondering if there mm. is more to okay. the familiar story that you've used. And what I'm going to assume here is that like yeah. me, there are parts in your life where you do tend to read reality fairly accurately. And then mm -hmm. there are other parts but of life where you consistently make bad decisions and need other people to mm -hmm. give you guidance yeah i mean yeah you certainly have a point you know the the danger in life is if you alienate people luke uh, people will not tell you when you're yeah. failing then um yeah. the worst place is you know everybody hates it when they have people around them criticizing them it can be awful it can be awful when somebody's coming along and saying you're doing a bad job or or I you know I'm sick of you I'm sick of you and all your faults and all the things that you're doing and our relationship sucks and all this kind of stuff that can be horrible to hear but at times you have to think about it and realize wow I'm lucky enough to have somebody who cares enough to tell me when I'm fucking up okay and the worst place in the world to be is when nobody around you is telling you that because that means you, everybody's given up on you. Yeah, because often people just prefer to cut ties. Then it, it yes. takes a lot of energy and strength yeah, to relay does. a serious criticism to someone. And so 19 times out of 20, people don't even bother. It does, especially because when you give a criticism to somebody that's a personal one, like you, you come along and you tell somebody something that they really need to hear. <clears throat> I know that they, they have bad breath. They're always late. You know, they, you know, they're always rude and interrupting any of these kind of things that somebody really could do to hear about, <laughs> about themselves. You are in danger of really inflaming them. And so most people, like you say, especially in the modern age, Lou, they just, choose to distance themselves cut ties and that is the most 
That, that is the worst place to be. If, if you find yourself just coasting along and you find that nobody is coming to you and ever picking you up on your behavior, I think that that's when the alarm bell should, should go off. That there's nobody there. Like, there's nobody who cares anymore about you. Yeah, that's, that's the problem with the individualist ethos and our increasingly fragmented lives is that mm. there's less of, of like, support or, or something that, that, like, holds people. So when, when I moved to Los Angeles in 1994, it was relatively easy for me to tumble into an incredibly degenerate life. Right, yeah, I, I can imagine. <laughs> like I'd been in bed for six years, and so yeah. I was I was a good-looking, charming guy, and yeah. I felt like I was owed a lot of sex that I'd missed out on because I'd been sick <laughs> the previous year. So I just started sleeping with every woman that I could. Uh, I started, you know, doing yeah. things sexually that you know I'd always dreamed about and that I'd seen in in porn movies. And then mm. I, I started reading books on the pornography industry and I was in Hollywood and there was just this tremendous you know, sexual tension and, and just raw animal, you know, sexual predatory energy around, you know, every aspect of, of Hollywood that I went to. And there were, there were porn stars mm. who, would, who would go to like acting events and with their tits hanging out, they'd complain about being yeah. you know, sexually harassed and... And so it was really easy for me to just tumble into a, a sexually degenerate life because while I was very active and going to synagogues, I spread myself around. So I didn't have yeah. those powerful relationships with one particular community that would normally put a halt to somebody's descent into degeneracy. And, and that's the, the downside of freedom and anonymity that we have today, particularly when you live in a, a big city, is that it's just there's nothing stopping you from descending deeper and deeper into the sewer. Yeah. So I seem to believe, Luke, and I'll be honest here, I believe that you like pursued Orthodox Judaism sincerely. So what I'd love to know, I don't think I've ever heard you explain is what was then the way that you excused it in your own mind, how at the same time you were pursuing like the Orthodox Judaism and, and, and I, you know, the commitments to it and even perhaps earnestly the spiritual side of it at the same time as also pursuing like the, the, the vice of Los Angeles. How did you excuse the excuse it? Okay. So here, here are the ways I excused it. Uh, number one, I felt convinced that I was saving lives. So for example, in, in, uh, April of 1998, I named the person who was the likely patient zero of this widespread HIV oh, outbreak yes. in the heterosexual industry that uh, at least 12 yeah. people had become infected, but in all likelihood, many, many more had been infected. And I stopped it. Yeah. Like the, the way the industry was working, this guy was getting away with it. And I felt like I stopped it. I felt like I was, I was you know, pulling the cover off you know, a bunch of foul behavior all throughout the industry, not just with regard to HIV infection. And so I felt on, on strong journalistic, uh, academic, <laughs> and, and moral grounds that I was saving lives and benefiting right. society yeah, and doing, doing, the, doing the right thing that even though it came at a tremendous cost to my own happiness and reputation, that, uh, that the value of what I was conveying outweighed other considerations. Second thing, so you, yeah, go ahead. I'll go. Oh, so, okay. so just on that point then, you mm -hmm. thought that you were like, basically like the real life Columbo. You had to go undercover and bang these porn stars in order to get to the truth, to, to uncover this, this real like scandal. Yeah, in, in the Bible, if people are familiar with the book of Hosea, God tells Hosea to go marry a prostitute and, and wow. to do that because God feels like the people of Israel have essentially prostituted themselves and abandoned him. And God wanted the prophet Hosea to go marry a hoe to become a captain, save a hoe, and then experience the pain <laughs> when you're trying to save a hoe and she keeps sucking and fucking other dudes. And so, so um, women would, would mock me that I date, they say, oh, so, you know, God told you to go right on the pornography industry. And I realized that was a, 
that wasn't quite it. But uh, no. I, I did fall back on the solid value that I believe my work conveyed. Mm -hmm. And then another another yeah. factor, which was not inconsiderable, yes. is that I was still quite ill. I, I still was hampered by overwhelming fatigue. And, to be, and it wasn't so easy to have a work-from-home job at that time. And this was the only topic on which I could make a living and write. And so I was okay, hoping yeah. that I would... I, my number one hope... So here's what prefigured writing on the porn industry. I was casting around for a book to write on. And my first yeah. topic was I wanted to write a book on how to be a good person. And Dennis Prager had given a six-part lecture series on how to be a good person. And I sent him a letter saying, hey, I'd like to build on your six-part lecture series on how to be a good person and, and r develop a book. And uh, yeah. Dennis Prager wrote back, please hold back. You know, please, please don't do that. And so I, I go to this bookstore and I, I'm, I pick up a book called How to Become Famous. And it recommended yes. two avenues. One is to give something away. And the second avenue was to write a book. And I became convinced that I needed to become famous by, by writing a book. And it wasn't just for the normal benefits of being famous. I had this bewildering disease that I had been to dozens of doctors who, who weren't able to help mm. me with it. But I, I was absolutely convinced that there was help for me out there. I just had to become famous enough that enough people yeah. heard about what I was struggling with that I would get advice on something that would help me because I knew that something would help me. I'd already received some benefit because I'd met a woman through a singles ad. So previously I was just meeting as many women as possible, not just to have sex, but primarily to find a way out of bed, out of my exhaustion and fatigue and disease. And I'd previously gotten some help with one woman who took me to her psychiatrist who got me on a medication called Nardil, which restored me to about two thirds of normal life. So I knew there was a solution out there. I just had to reach enough people that someone who had a solution would contact me. So this is what I was thinking. And so then I thought, okay, how can I become famous? How can I write a book? And so one of the ideas that went through my head was I'll write a book on a history of sex and film. I went through Barnes and Noble and saw that uh, there'd been no book on that topic for many, many years. So I saw an opportunity to make a contribution uh, to become famous and to try to leverage that fame to regain my health. Wow. That's quite a story. I wonder to what extent, and I don't mean to belittle the physiological nature of your condition, but I wonder to what extent it is perhaps like an LA syndrome that you kind of experienced this and how many other people may have moved to LA. I mean, I imagine so many people move to LA believing that they are going to make it either in the film industry and in music in Hollywood, particularly, of course, or even in the porn industry. And then like the reality hits in that, you know, you're not, you're nobody special. And to, and to, to get that success uh, probably is not going to happen. And somebody like you puts lots of time, effort, energy in it. You see it all around you. You s literally w can walk around and see people's names in stars below your feet. And the sign on the Hollywood Hills beaming down that this is the land that makes people a star. And and you're walking around a commoner. And, and I imagine this can, may, maybe it is an L.A. syndrome. What do you think about that? Yes, it definitely. It's just like there's Jerusalem syndrome. People, people move to Jerusalem and they have spiritual revelations even while they're receiving a handjob. I mean, there are people in... <laughs> in Jerusalem are religiously <laughs> wow. and spiritually intoxicated in a way that is, you know, way above average. So people move to Jerusalem and they start feeling like they have a messianic mission. And I, I sense that yeah. in my last uh, two and a half weeks in Israel in, in 2000, that's when I be decided Orthodox Judaism was the path for me. Prior to that, I would equally mm. participate in Orthodox and non-Orthodox Judaism. So yeah, people come to LA to fulfill their dreams. And LA is a really open city. People often castigate Hollywood as being closed, but people yeah. in Hollywood are incredibly open considering the, the dangers of allowing you know, strangers into your life. And uh, overall, it is, it is a place where people move to to make their dreams come true. And you know, most of us who move to LA to make our dreams come true are considerably deluded. We have a vast overestimation of our own abilities and particularly being young in your 20s, right? Up until about age 25, 
from your teens to your early 20s, most people have a vast overestimation of their own abilities. So yeah, I thought I was much more talented and much more brilliant and much more special than I really was. It just turned out that in one grubby area where people with something to lose would not deign to immerse themselves for very long, I was able to yeah. become a, a big deal in the sewer because most smart people don't like swimming in a sewer. Yeah, I mean, it was also perfect timing, wasn't it, for the porn industry? Were you, when you wrote your book and you did that scandal, how, how close was that to the start of the internet? Was the internet just starting or was it just before? So I started work on my book in the fall of 1995. So just before I started work on my book, I, started, I did a documentary on what women want. So I, I interviewed like <laughs> over a hundred, uh, attractive young women who are, you know, want to be actresses about what they look for in a man. And then unfortunately one, the audio quality sucked. Uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Right. I was trying yeah. to become a producer <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, two, I, I realized that what people say they want, bears no necessary resemblance to what they really do want. So. After I saw that this was not going to work, I said, okay, I need to write a book. I need to write a book in the history of, of uh, sex in film. Mm -hmm. And I started work on it and I sent off a proposal to one publishing house that was pretty, no, to one agent who largely worked on scams. So I got taken in by a lot of scams when I, I yes. moved to Hollywood. Yeah. And the reason I got taken in by scams, the reason why I, I say often when people lie to us, it's a consensual act, is that each scam... Uh, spoke to me and met my needs because it fulfilled my dreams of becoming great. And so this agent yeah. says, oh, you know, I can sell your book. Uh, there's this publisher here from New York and he wants to, you know, sign a contract with you for this book. And uh, it, it did happen. But uh, the, the agent was a very dubious agent. So I got an agent for my acting and modeling as well, uh, who was also yeah. very shaky and who was drummed out of the agency business. But uh, that experience was enough for me to keep pursuing acting and modeling. And then I got a very shady literary agent and that experience who landed me a publishing deal for $500 for my first book. Again, it gave, it gave some foundation to my dreams, even though the, the foundations were built on scams. But I was so eager to embrace that there was some reality that I could become awesome that uh, I was an easy mark. Yeah, I wouldn't be too hard on yourself. This was before the internet, so before really anybody, like I'd read all the stories about these kinds of scams and exploiting people. I imagine that back in that time, in that period, before the internet, before you can go online and just read about this stuff, like you can go on the internet now and read about people's experiences yeah. of <clears throat> going somewhere. We're much more informed then. It was a much more idealistic time and lack of access to information, so you can only take people at face value at that time but if that was 95 you were just at the emergence of the internet really which was like what about 1992 from yeah i understand so, i mean i think yeah, they that. first talked about it famously on the today show something called the World Wide web in something like 1994 um i tried to i got on the internet like the equivalent of a uh, aol i think in something like 19 oh 1993 i i I was talking to, yeah. to an Orthodox rabbi in Los Angeles, and he said, well, if you really you know, want to learn more about Judaism and you're housebound by your illness, you get on the internet. And so mm -hmm. I, I did get onto an early version of AOL and found other converts to Judaism and uh, people who are interested in that. So that was kind of wow. exciting. 1995, yeah. my roommate and I tried to buy a computer with internet access, but our credit was too bad. <laughs> we weren't able to, <laughs> to buy one. And then the first time I bought a computer with internet access for my own, it was only like a 14 uh, dial-up dial speed. So <laughs> like it would just take forever. So I didn't, I didn't manage. I was, I was maxed out on my credit cards because I devoted fall of 95 to the summer of 96, just researching my history of sex and film. And yeah. I stayed maxed out on my credit cards until enough temp work uh, got me some money so I could buy my first real computer, July 3, 1997. And at that time, I'd been participating in a news group called REC, Rec, mm -hmm. Arts, Movies, Erotica. And so R-A-M-E, I'd been <laughs> participating on that for like nine months previous and developed something of a reputation because I'd posted many of, many of my notes from the book. 
And then I bought my first real computer for like $1,200, July 3, 1997. And I came home and within an hour, I'd set up my first blog on uh, an, an AOL user site. Wow, 1997. That's when I started blogging. Wow. I bet you remember how much your first computer cost, don't you? How much? Was yeah, it? it was around eleven hundred dollars, and wow. uh, and and I I got uh, you know high speed internet access very quickly. Mm -hmm. I no longer had to depend on on dial up, so that was fantastic. I enjoyed blogging, but also at, at the same time there was a voice inside me that got very loud, particularly at like two a.m. that I'm on a very bad path. So there was this kind of soul crushing <clears throat> depression in me that would be momentarily mm. distracted by sex and by fame, but was, was there underneath everything that the people would often read. I, I, and many other people in and around the porn industry, we talked about going mainstream. You know, we talked about getting out, like we were <laughs> you know, working in, in salt mines and it sounded bizarre to people outside of the industry, or but like drug uh, addicts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go going straight. mainstream. We're going to go mainstream. <laughs> we're going to go straight. We're going to break out of, the salt mines of the pornography industry. And uh, I initially did it in 2001. I sold my website, lukeford.com, and I stayed out of the porn industry for a year as I wrote a book on uh, Hollywood movie producers. But then I ran out of money, mm -hmm. went back to blogging on the porn industry, and I knew it was bad for me. I knew it was heading in a bad direction. And uh, there was this mm -hmm. one porn agent, Reagan Center, and I'd used him to book the talent for the one porn movie that I directed, What Women Want. And uh, I think I had to pay him like $250 in 1996. And uh, my first check bounced, right? That's how desperate I was. And then mm. the second time he tried to deposit my check, it was going to bounce again. I mean, I managed to borrow $20 from a friend to quickly deposit into my account. And uh, I interviewed Reagan Center circa 2005. And he was someone who came from a banking background and became an agent in the porn industry and he would make all his talent do compliance videos to have sex you know, with him on a video that he would then show oh, to wow. producers and directors. But, but he was a very smart guy. And he said to me- Casting you know, no, couch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's, it was very explicit and out there. It wasn't yes. uh, underhanded. And he said to me, no one who has anything to do with this industry can hope to have you know, a conventional marriage. It's just yeah. not possible. And he was just so clear about it. And it, like, it hit me between the eyes that there was no way I could have a normal life. And, and women would tell me, like, you've got to get rid of that website. You, know, you can't have anything to do with the pornography industry if you're going to have any yeah. hope of dating a respectable woman. Like, I would go out on a date, uh, such as to, to Jerry's Deli at, at midnight, and when I'm there at Jerry's Deli, like, Ron Jeremy would go, hey, Luke, what's going on? And, you know, want to talk to me about his latest <laughs> exploits. And here I'm, I'm, wow. I'm dating the woman who led my recent uh, jury singles trip to Israel, and yeah, it didn't oh work boy. so well. No, no, no. Wow. Now, to what extent, Luke, was the early internet proliferated with pornography? You must have remembered that. If, if you were you getting on the internet in 1997, one of the first things I imagine that you did was search for pornography. Was it already on there? Yeah, it was all over. It wasn't. Oh, okay. It was funny. The one another reason for me writing on the pornography industry is that it killed my porn addiction, at least temporarily. Like I had very right. little desire okay. to look at pornography as long as I was writing about pornography. It's like something about seeing how yeah. the sausage is made just killed the erotic yes. power over me. Absolutely. So porn yeah. had always had tremendous erotic power over me. It, it kind of frightened me to death the amount of power that it had over me because my life just seemed so much more intense when I was looking at pornography. But when I was writing on the industry, that erotic power was just killed. And so it was a way for me to kind of hold, ironically, hold my addiction at bay. Yeah, and at some point, I, I understand the porn industry moved over from videotapes and magazines to exclusively pretty much the internet. Were you around covering it for that Yes, period. because the, the economics of the porn industry essentially mirrored the economics of the journalism industry. So it was starting in eighth grade mm. that I decided I wanted to be a journalist. And being right. a journalist is just an awesome job. Like you can tell anyone, uh, you know, a, a senator from California, I interviewed Alan Cranston, who was then a sitting United States senator, like, you know, that answer's not good enough, right? You, you, I got to interview Bill yeah. Walsh and Joe Montana and Larry Bird and 
I got access to all these, you know, famous people as, as a journalist. It was absolutely enthralling work. But the economics of the porn industry essentially reflected the economics of the news industry. There's not inherently a viable basis for news, except news was tethered with classified advertising. And so by combining those two things, news was a mechanism for, for selling advertising that made it a viable business until the rise of the internet. Mm. And so with the rise of the okay. internet, uh, the, the s selling of DVDs and videos became increasingly uh, not viable along with the, the, uh, the rise of, uh, yeah, rise of porn, rise of uh, the news publishing industry were increasingly non-viable. And so you got the economic destruction of the porn industry at the same time you got in the, you got the, economic disrupt destruction of the pornography industry. So th by the time I'd left, it, it wasn't even possible for me to really make a living uh, blogging about the porn industry anymore. So that was one of the less honorable reasons that made it easy for me to, to leave. So you saw all these journalist layoffs through the late 90s into the 2000s. And at the same time, the economic basis of the porn industry was destroyed, in particular by the rise of all the free sites. So you porn and yes, the equivalent, yeah. like what kind of pervert would, would pay for pornography? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't even understand it as a concept today. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, why, why do you, how do they even make money anymore? Do you, do you actually know? Yeah, uh, like the, 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 you, you give something the special studios. the same way, the same way that I assume the New Yorker or certain journalistic outlets, the New York Times, I believe, makes money. So... If you offer a premium product that people have to pay for, then you can you can make money. So that's true for the pornography industry, and it's true for the journalism industry. So overall, there's not a viable economic basis. But you see in you see with the rise of Substack and the rise of OnlyFans. All right. So so many yeah, women yeah, have created an OnlyFans empire where you you develop a relationship with the with the woman who you are financially supporting through OnlyFans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you have a, you support someone via Patreon or Substack, right, you usually tend to develop a relationship with that person and you can send in suggestions. And it's so people will pay to support that, that connection, whether it's OnlyFans or Patreon. It's the, the same type of model. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? It is fasc and a fascinating aspect of it that even in the CD world of pornography and stuff, that what people are looking for, Luke, and we can bring this full circle here, is looking for that human connection. Are they there with the... That's what OnlyFans shows, how it's become so, so huge. And there's, you see all these stories of guys who, like, they've spent, <laughs> spent their kids' inheritance on, like, one OnlyFan whore basically to put it bluntly and they they I doubt they would have done that to a port with a subscription to a porn studio They'll, it's because they have this woman at the other end who they believe is like personally responding to them they're looking for that human connection aren't they yeah but I, I mean I did the same thing like when when my life fell apart due to what's called chronic fatigue syndrome I desperately needed to find meaning and purpose in my life so what I ended up doing, I had about $15,000 in savings at the time. And I spent like $12,000, like 90% of my savings, sending Dennis Prager materials to everybody I knew. And most people I knew had, had no interest in Dennis Prager materials. Like it was just a complete waste That's of money. Wild. But I developed a sense of importance from for a few years being Dennis Prager's number one customer. And there, yes, there was one occasion okay. where Dennis Prager personally called me and encouraged me and invited me to sit in on his radio shows if he was ever in Los Angeles. And so I developed a sense of meaning and purpose and, and importance from being Dennis Prager's number one mm. fan and number one customer. So it, yeah. it's kind of the same with, with, the, with the people who spend copious amounts of money on OnlyFans. We're, we're looking for something to provide meaning and purpose in our lives because conventional methods have just not not worked yeah and we have a term for this now it's parasocial isn't it we're yeah. building this parasocial relationship with somebody yeah do you have any other parasocial relationships or did you leave it with dennis prager 
Well, th- there was there was a, a rabbi, um, Yitzhak Adlerstein, who w- would appear on Dennis Prager's uh, radio show, Religion on the Line, mm-hmm. on KABC. And he was incredibly mm-hmm. eloquent. And so when I was alone and, and isolated, I, I would uh, be ins- tremendously inspired by his performances on Religion on the Line. And so I started writing to people, <laughs> uh, just trying to form some sort of connection and he was very kind he would he would call me back every time I, I sent him a letter and so he mm-hmm. he was he was inspiring I would you know, call into uh, some other radio st- shows but none of them had the same meaning that the Dennis Prager like that that Dennis Prager you know substitute father figure parasocial well I also got to meet him and become acquainted with him in real life but there's a large parasocial element to it uh, that provided you know, enough meaning and purpose for me to, you know, get through very difficult years. And at what, at what point did you realize you'd taken that relationship too far? Because it all blew up in your face, didn't it? Oh, God, this with is Dennis, so embarrassing. Prager. Yeah, this is so embarrassing. I, I've oh, you don't have to go into it if you don't no, want. No, no, I, I want to now. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, tell us. <clears throat> this is... Dum, dum, dum. Um... I realized at like, some point, like uh, 1992, that I was jealous of, of uh, someone else who was good friends with Dennis Prager. Like, I was jealous of that friendship. And, and then okay. I thought, that's really sick that you're jealous of this, this Dennis Prager friendship because you believe that Dennis Prager should be friends with you. That's more important than friends with this other person. And th- that's when I realized that by... My yeah. fixation with Dennis Prager had become pathological. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that is such a hot... I've, been, I've actually been in a similar situation with a relationship. It wasn't with a public figure, though. It's like a, a relationship with a girl. And, uh, yeah, so that is a heartbreaking moment, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I still feel something like that when... Uh, with 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 a friend uh sometimes uh he'll be mm. you know fully engaged in a conversation with other people and uh, th- that that annoying insecurity will start to start to come out I- inside of me and start to rear its ugly head oh yeah i think jealousy is pro- perhaps the most soul gutting emotion to experience because it comes with humiliation, Luke. We all know this. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, tough one. Wow. Yeah, jealousy has been a really intense... It's probably like the, the yeah. consistently the most shameful emotion, I think, that, that I've, I've felt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I, can, I can appreciate it. I can appreciate it. Before I go, Luke, I have... <clears throat> I, have a, I need a bit of spiritual advice. Uh, could, could, could you... Give Absolutely. Me spiritual <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, look, it was uh, recently Lent, okay, and I did agree to give up. F- um, I, I I decided to go no fat for Lent, okay. Yeah. However, during that period of time, uh, and please don't tell anybody. Okay. But I did. I did lay with a woman. And so now I'm worried about my eternal soul. Does it count? Am I going to hell? W- what's going on, Luke? P- please, um, please advise so me for my soul. W- was this consensual, legal sex? Yes, it was, yeah. And have you developed a relationship with her? Oh, briefly, I th- briefly, but it's over, it's over already. Uh, so, aside from any spiritual or religious connotations, how do you feel about the interaction? Did you compromise who you were? Did you compromise, you know, other values aside from you know, religious, spiritual ones? Was no, she fat? No, no, was no. she really fat? No, actually, no. She's uh, actually really skinny. She um, she works at the play, uh, works at the sports center that I work at. So, um, did it damage your life? Yeah, no. Did it no, did it ruin your other relations? So. No, um, I mean it was just another mess. Basically, it turned out she had uh, another 
she just broke it, had a long term break, had a long term boyfriend, a breakup, um, and he's basically a stalker of her. And uh, anyway, uh, and another damaged woman. Luke. Right, because um, only a damaged woman is going to go to bed with a damaged person like you and me. Is that fair? You might be on to something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So did this did the, did did these interactions damage you in in a concrete fashion? Um no. No, I'm fine. Absolutely fine. I was mainly um yeah, it's funny because it was a period where I, I, li- I, I, I'm being serious about the fact that I, I was going no fat for Lent, mm-hmm. and part of, so, um, yeah, and then and then it suddenly happened. So, um. well, if it didn't damage your life, I don't, I don't think there's anything to uh, be be concerned anything about. But about. did she no. make you do sexual things that you didn't want to do? No. No. Because I, <laughs> I remember I went to interview uh, Kitten Natividad, who was uh, who was uh, appeared in a lot of Russ Meyer movies. So she was a, a, a B grade star in, in Hollywood. But uh, at the time, I was about 20, 28, 29 years of age, and she was about fifty two. And uh, wow, wow! After Oof. I interviewed her, I hugged her goodbye because you know I'm. A, old-fashioned Victorian gentleman. and Gentleman, yes. One thing led to another, and soon, you know, we were humping on her floor. And she was imploring me to place... Uh, She's a dirty bitch, is what you're saying. <laughs> uh, no judgment here. She was imploring me to place certain digits into a certain part of her anatomy, which I have always refused. I have never yeah. engaged in this practice, and I had the, the self-respect to not do that. So yes. uh, on the one hand, this sounds ridiculous, but as long as you don't do things that you don't want to do, as long as you're not transgressing your own boundaries, as long as you're not engaging in something that's going to diminish your self-respect or is just simply outside of your, your mm-hmm. comfort level, then I think you're okay. But for, for many of us, the power of sex is so intoxicating that we – we compromise or, or throw away our other values. So, for example, with my sexual promiscuity, I have damaged my standing in the community. I've damaged, you know, all mm, sorts of other yeah. re- relationships, and it, it it's you know had had some negative effects. And also, I've gone to bed with a lot of fat women because while I normally wow. did not find them attractive in certain yeah. states of extreme erotic need in, in sexual emergencies. I would turn to fat women, <laughs> but then I didn't want to be seen with them publicly. But then no. somehow word would get out and my friends yeah. would go, oh, look, I, I mean, I can't respect <laughs> you now knowing that you, you know, did wow. this chick and that chick. So, I, I mean. Yeah. How I, fat are we talking? I mean, I, not Walmart, I, Walmart whale standards, surely. No one over 200 pounds. So it wasn't, <laughs> oh, okay. it wasn't obscene <laughs> levels of, of fat, but. They would like, they would sometimes play on, on my vulnerability and they'd like just, you know, offer me a massage. And I, there was no way I was going to have sex, but then they'd start massaging my stomach. And suddenly I just went into a, an erotic frenzy. And so one of the, the key parts of my recovery so was I would never have sex with anyone I'd be ashamed to be seen with in public. And, and many of yeah. these fat and yeah. disturbed and, and damaged women, I would have been ashamed to see them in public. And, and often I was forced to. Like uh, one woman I had absolutely no intentions of, of hooking up with, and she successfully seduced me. And then the next day she gets into a car accident. She calls on me to you know, give her a ride to the hospital and pick her up from the hospital and you know, take <laughs> care of her. And you, you do engender all sorts of other obligations you know, once you do the deed. So, yes, of course, yeah, that absolutely. was. So, would you uh, would you be ashamed to be seen with this woman publicly? No, I wouldn't. No, um, I wouldn't be ashamed to be seen with her publicly. Of course, um, I'm ashamed for getting involved with somebody who's basically like you know a deranged BPD bitch, 
uh, at the end of the day um, with like a huge amount of baggage and for not seeing this coming again um, because uh, and it's like this, the story of my last few relationships to be honest I don't know what it is with like Zoom and girls Luke but they're all basically well not all come on I'm just I, yeah I, I'm I'm making I'm <sighs> I'm tarring them all with the same brush, but there are so many, uh, like, uh, Zuma girls who are on drugs, basically borderline personality, uh, have had, have a, have a body count that is, you know, toilet roll length long, uh, and just an array of, like, ex-boyfriends who are constantly in their DMs, constantly following them around. It's quite a bizarre, and... You know, on certainly, it's, I just don't want anything to do with any of that shit. How long does it take women that you get to know or, or date or court till they recognize that you're incredibly messed up? Um, well, that's a, bag a baggage question. That I don't think I'm incredibly messed up. This is the thing. So, um, I mean. I do put on a good face of the ADHD, um, actually, so, and, and then people get to know me, like, people who, I think it comes across, obviously, on my streams and stuff like that, and through my YouTube, but nowhere near, no, but pe people who, like, get the sense, wow, this kid's got ADHD on YouTube, they would have no idea the extent to which I, I really, like, do have it be behind the scenes, um, <laughs> That's the only messed up thing. thing. Apart from that, I'm pretty conventional. Like, I'm pretty... I think I hold it together pretty well. And, and I don't have the autism that it, uh, it often comes with these things. Like, you say that you struggle with, uh, you know, reading social cues, which is would be described as, like, on the spectrum of Asperger's. Like, you know, reading social cues, that type of thing. Yes. Social... So, yeah, you know, social anxiety and all stuff like that. I don't have that. I think I'm in, I'm very empathetic, so I'm lucky in that respect. I'm just I don't know, really. So, how long does it yeah. take women to get an accurate read of you? Um. <clears throat> well, I don't know. Uh, I know uh, a couple of weeks, I suppose. Uh, have you, what, what's the longest amount of time you've managed to sustain a relationship with a woman who wasn't broken? Four months. Actually, four months. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the most common feedback that you've gotten from women that you've been intimate with? So, for example, for me, women often say, uh, we just don't want. We just want different things. And so I, I tend to date women who are much more financially su successful than I am. So she's you know, typically earning $200,000 a year and more, and uh, I'm earning considerably less than that. And so the way they phrase things is uh, we just want different things. What is it that women say to you when they decide to end things? Hmm. I, I actually, I can't think of anything in particular there yeah i can't think of it that's the honest truth i can't think of anything in particular um maybe that's just my naivety luke um what's the, what's the most painful feedback that you've consistently received in life so for me it's that i'm not good enough that i'm not good yeah. enough that will be it. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. i mean that's and and what are they referring to there is that primarily in terms of making money in terms of social status yeah, that I, you know, that I'm just going nowhere. The, you know, that I'm uh, a, a, a waste of space. You know, that that in that, I've heard that phrase before. A waste of space. That would be. A, yeah. So you know, low income, low income. Yeah. Not, you know, not gonna pursuing the wrong things. You know, you're never gonna make it as a, you know, it, never mind. Even if you had the talent to. Uh, pursue like a sporting career. Yeah, I'm even in the wrong sport. I couldn't even, you know, it's even the wrong sport to make it successfully in terms of money. <laughs> you know, it's just, just totally fucked up in terms of, 
career direction. Like, there's no money to be made in Mai Tai, and for whatever reason, that's what I pursued. Mainly, I think, you know, forgive me here for just being brutal, but I've pursued that sport because, uh, you know, I was into combat sports, into boxing, and in Asian sports, uh, there's l- there's less of a, cer- a certain other group of people involved in it. And, I, and and that's why I pursued that. But it ended up being that I was pursuing basically a dead end in terms of ever really becoming monetarily successful at it. So, so the, the most painful feedback I received over the course of my life is commenting yeah. on my general weirdness. Is, is that the type of feedback that you have received? Yeah, you're, you know, you're, yeah. Yeah, weird. Weird would do it. Um, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't. I'm. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna run actually. <laughs> okay, bro. <laughs> All right. I I, pre- I appreciate. I appreciate letting me on. Okay. Good to good to talk to you, mate. Cheers. All right. Maybe we'll pursue that the next time. All right. Sounds See you good, later, man. Luke. Cheers. Bye bye. Yeah. marriage counseling therapist sessions and referring to your ex-wife as an effing satanic bitch or whatever like i don't know i think that ship is sealed about taking the high ground at that point but but, but- okay the chat says uh, shouldn't you guys be negging your woman instead of being negged so negging is an effective tactic uh particularly in the courtship push-pull attraction stage but i don't think it's a solid foundation for an ongoing relationship so i tend to make a i have often made a great first impression so i remember sandra singh low is a professor of i think creative writing and performance at the university of southern california she was hosting a dinner party in her backyard one day approximately 15 years ago, and it turned out that uh, out of the half dozen women at her you know, backyard social gathering, every single one had dated me. They'd all had pretty much the same experience. They were initially excited by my intelligence and charm, and then they'd all become disgusted by my websites and you know, my, my lack of uh, financial and social success in life. So they'd all suffered a similar trajectory. And the, on the other hand, they were all still single. And they were all there with their Tupperware. They were all, you know, professionally successful single Jewish women, you know, getting close to forty. And they'd all had the Luke Ford experience and found it disappointing. This is this is what I was referring to about that authenticity. And it's not like a just a, a simple compliment. It's maybe not even a compliment at all because the brand, someone like Destiny is living their life out in the open, so to speak. Oh, there doesn't yeah. seem to be any kind <laughs> of filter and no boundaries. You you and I don't often talk about our, our wives, for instance, <laughs> on this podcast. Chris. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, no. But, you know, th- and I think this is the bit that will sort of bend Normie's brains. So because family life is so important in traditional Judaism, uh, I noticed my, my male friends in particular have you know, great fear and, and respect and consideration for their wives. So Jewish men generally have an excellent reputation as husbands. And the, my, my Jewish friends, particularly Orthodox Jewish friends, just don't want to do things that shatter shalom bias, right? Peace in the home. And this gives you know, their wives tremendous leverage over them a bit which is that this is part of the appeal i think this is part of of the draw that destiny presents himself i think quite genuinely as right people come to live streams not just for information not just for raw talk not just for shocking talk not just for community right but for drama and spectacle someone who lays it all out there the audience is invited to get involved and and to be a part of this as well warts and all and yeah, it's just a very different, uh, um, a very different thing than what most of us are used to. We'll return to the absolute dissolution of boundaries <laughs> in uh, Destiny's content and community in a bit. But let's go back. So when I started regular psychotherapy, you know, two sessions a week, like two back-to-back sessions on Friday morning, 
one of the first things that came up is uh, boundaries and my lack of them, right? I would invariably violate other people's boundaries. So there were women that I would date and sometimes I just show up at their apartment and you know, knock on their door late at night for a booty call. And then I would allow other people to violate my boundaries. Uh, I, I would be at someone's home and I'd just go into the refrigerator and you know take food and drink. And th that was one of the first things that uh, I had to learn. On the other hand, most of these virtues, like having good boundaries, they're not primarily viable as a direct pursuit, right? When you develop self-respect, then boundaries flow from that, right? Until you have self-respect, uh, boundaries are confusing and, and bewildering. So most virtues are not really amenable to a, a direct approach. So for example, this, I, I got this from David Gorman of Le Learning Method. Let's say you're trying to develop the virtue of patience. And so you're stuck in traffic and it's infuriating the traffic's going to make you late to some important appointment. But on the other hand, you are working on developing the virtue of patience. That does absolutely no good. Right? Until you accept the reality that things will take as long as they take, right? Putting your effort into developing the virtue of patience will get you nowhere, right? Until you have that change of mindset that uh, much of life is outside your control, that traffic is largely outside of your control, and that things are going to take the amount of time that they take, and you can't change that. And so if something's really important to you, then then you need to leave early and have you know, a backup plan in case you arrive at an event too early so that you can read a book or listen to a podcast or go, to a, go for a walk. But until you accept reality, and the reality is that things will take as long as they take, all right, developing the virtue of the patience would do you no good. Stephen J. James says, I forgot my dinner in the oven during our fascinating conversation. Thanks, ADHD. Well, how bad, seriously, Stephen J. James, how bad is your ADHD going to have to get before you go see a doctor about it? Like, how much of normal human growth and development are you going to forego until you address the issue? Because the damage that ADHD does to your life will become more and more apparent with each month that goes by. So in my 20s into my early 30s, my life looked pretty much like the lives of my peers. But by my late 30s, that gap between me and my peers became bigger and bigger. And so ADHD is a disease primarily of our prefrontal cortex. It's a disease of an inability to sustain attention where you need to sustain attention. And the problems that come with an inability to sustain attention to areas of your life where you need to sustain attention will become more and more obvious the older you get. And so you can be like me and wait till you're age 57 before you finally address this debilitating problem. But like how much of normal human connection, normal human growth, economic, social, communal, interpersonal, psychological, romantic opportunities have you lost due to your ADHD? Intellectual growth, educational growth, right? How vast are your losses due to ADHD and how big will you allow them to grow before you address it? Because ADHD is the single most studied area of psychiatry and it's the single most successfully addressed area of psychiatry. So psychiatry very quickly and overwhelmingly helps people get immediate help for their ADHD and the emotional volatility that goes with ADHD and the loneliness that comes from ADHD because all your maladaptive impulses, no matter how strict your self-discipline, will create a general weirdness and an off-putting nature to your decisions that will separate you from other people. And so when the loneliness gets bad enough, and when the emotional volatility causes you to make uh, poor decisions, when you, when you come to terms with this amount of loss and knowing it is so easily and effectively addressed, and for me, once I got on ADHD medication, like 90% of those impulses that, that led me to a reputation of general weirdness, 
just went away, right? The, the emotional calm, the ability to sustain focus on things that are important to me, the quality of the, the work that I do so dramatically improved. It's the, the most successful area of psychiatry. It's the most studied area of psychiatry. The, the solutions are, are very quickly effective. So if you're depressed or anxious, right, you go to a psychiatrist, right, the, the medication and, and the program that they put you on is not nearly as successful as what people with ADHD get when they go to a psychiatrist, right? There's no other area of psychiatry that is as deeply studied and effectively dealt with as ADHD. Back after that little sojourn into personal matters to Destiny staking out his kind of philosophy and stuff again. And just to mention there, Matt, I do think there's a through line because the frustration that Destiny mentioned was... So the number one book for adult ADHD is a book authored by Russell Barkley. He's got a channel on YouTube and he talks about the largely unknown emotional component of ADHD, which is so devastating, such as rejection-sensitive dysphoria. Right? I remember one time I was at, at work and I didn't get a work email for, for two hours and I thought, uh, I'm being fired. Right? So the, the dysphoria that you plunge into when you're, when you're being rejected, the intensity of the emotions that are not adaptive to reality and to your own best interests are uh, probably the, the biggest problem with ADHD. But due to the needs of the pharmacology industry and of the, the DSM, right, they had to come up with you know, concrete, observable symptoms on, on the basis to which uh, diagnose ADHD. But the way that ADHD is diagnosed is not aligned with the individual's best interests and it's not aligned with the clinician's best interests. It's, uh, it's aligned, not, not necessarily aligned with the researcher's best interests, right? It's aligned with the best interests of the psychiatric profession and of the pharmacology industry. But the, the most devastating part of ADHD for many people is the emotional component. And uh, Russell Barkley has, has superb explanatory videos about this and, his book was, was named the best book for dealing with adult ADHD by the New York Times in, in a recent article they had listing off uh, seven, seven books on ADHD. Being misrepresented, right? Like feeling that he isn't being accurately portrayed. So is the smartphone making ADHD effectively worse? No. ADHD is primary, primarily a prefrontal cortex problem. It's primarily a physiological problem. So loneliness does not cause ADHD. Smartphones and gaming do not cause ADHD. And they do not really make uh, ADHD significantly worse. It's just that someone with ADHD is going to be uh, particularly prone to distraction. And people with ADHD are not able to sustain their attention like a normal person and and to live up to their adult responsibilities. But uh, it's not external factors that are primarily causing ADHD. When you've got a biological problem, when you've got a physiological problem, there is primarily a biological and physiological solution, right? ADHD is overwhelmingly a biological, physiological solution for which there is primarily a biological, physiological solution called medication. And without medication, other approaches to ADHD do not succeed, right? You can do everything else that you're supposed to do if you have ADHD, but if you don't get medicated, you're not going to get any traction. So when I talk to therapists who specialize in sex addiction, they note every single client they have has ADHD, right? If sex addiction, porn addiction, uh, spending addiction, internet addiction, uh, dating addiction, shopping addiction, if, if uh, alcohol and drug addiction is ruining your life, in all likelihood, you have ADHD. And for many addicts with ADHD, they don't get significant traction and recovery in their life until they address ADHD. It's like if you are not able to get a normal amount of sleep, it will be verging on the impossible for you to get substantial traction in your recovery. All right. So for spiritual problems, there are spiritual solutions. For religious problems, there are religious solutions. For biological problems, there are biological solutions, right? To look to the realm of the spirit and the realm of religion and the realm of 
ethical exhortation and the realm of self-help to get a solution to a problem that is overwhelmingly biological and physiological is not a good idea. I remember I put tremendous effort into working out and to studying hard when I was, say, age 21. So for the first time, I got straight A's. I took 21 units at Sierra Community College. I got straight A's. And every other day, I would do this workout. It would be like 12 sets of 10 pull-ups. And then it would be uh, about uh, 10 sets of uh, 60 push-ups each. And I was muscular, right? I, I was strong, right? And uh, I thought this would help me uh, uh, get a girlfriend. <laughs> I thought, you know, when, when they see how disciplined I am, right, when, when they see how, how strong I am, right, that uh, they, they're going to fall in love with me. But I didn't want to address what was, what was uh, primarily going on with me, and, and that was a lack of ease with myself, right? We, we all get tempted to externalize these big internal problems that we have, and, and we have this delusion that by addressing them, Right, uh, we we will then you know fix our relationships and and get get our you know life going on, on the right track, but it doesn't turn out that way, right? We say, oh, if I just work out, right? If I just run marathons. So for a long time, I you know ran marathons, and I thought if I'm just a successful runner, but I didn't have any particular talent for running marathons. That didn't get me anywhere. So <laughs> for a long time, I was like working out and you know becoming strong. And tough, and you know, straight A student got admitted into UCLA, but that didn't change my problems because what was my biggest problem, what was at the core of my problems, was my lack of ease and comfort with myself that I didn't have the ability to simply be a uh, good friend to myself. By Melina or the discourse. That's why he needs to set the record straight, right? And I think that does fit with his kind of position about politics. Is like he doesn't seem to care so much as long as people accurately represent what he's saying. Like he seems to get most annoyed by people misrepresenting what he's trying to argue for or say. So, anyway, returning to the more philosophical side of destiny. I noticed that a lot of people seem to get off on accusing me of grifting. And something that's very frustrating to me is that when I talk to people, I find that I spend half the conversation trying to figure out what is it that you actually even believe. Um, people have a really hard time owning difficult positions. Um, they won't bite the bullet on the logical conclusions of some crazy position they might hold. Um, for instance, when I ask Hassan if a woman getting raped in an alleyway is within her right to call the cops, Hassan, instead of giving a straight answer, will instead pussy out like a coward and say, well, I wouldn't call the cops, instead of actually owning that position and saying, well, sometimes maybe you do need to call the cops. Um, <clears throat> when I ask people about whether or not, you know, they own a position related to um, any... So I've never had a bill that naturally was uh, easy to develop an impressive set of, of muff muscles on. So many of my, my peers growing up were much more muscularly developed than me. And it, it was in the, the back of my head for years and years and years that women want a guy with a very impressive muscular build. But when, when I finally did get girlfriends, right, when I finally did start getting to bed with women regularly, that wasn't a primary factor for them, right? It was just a delusion that I had built up in my head. But we'll go into more of this later on. But basically, like, I noticed that a lot of people have a lot of trouble owning, like, all of the uh, extensions of, like, whatever political system they believe in. Um, I don't. I'll own every opinion I have, whether it's related to um, the fucking incest discussions we've had, whether it's related to foreign policy, whatever. Um, I'll own every position that I have, whether it's the abolishment of capitalism or li or, or liberal values or whatever. Um, yeah. Um, you might not like what I say. Um, I think there are valid challenges to a lot of what I say. Um, I don't think I'm correct on everything. My views have continued to evolve over time. I wouldn't expect that process to stop. I'm sure there's positions that I hold today that I probably won't hold five years from now. I would hope so. I would hope I continue to grow and change. Um, all I ever do is present to you what I believe at any given point in time. And what you're getting is basically like always a work in, pro in, in progress. Authenticity, as you yeah. say. Yeah. Reasonable philosophical destiny is uh, quite appealing to me. Like, I, I think 
what he's saying there is true and he's pointing to something real obviously you know when, when people have a, a rhetorical position or a political position they'll often refuse to engage with the consequences like the logical consequences of that position so he was referring there to the defund the police it's always wrong to call the police even if there's a crime going on that kind of thing and he says and you know i think he's right in saying that a lot of people who would hold that position for example will refuse to talk or, or grapple with the logical consequences of that. One thing I'll say for Destiny is that what it, whether his positions are good or bad, I don't think he would do that. I don't think he would obfuscate and sidestep it and change the topic. I think if you said, hey, explain to me why you think it's okay to do a, a genocide on the Palestinians or ethnic cleansing, you know, explain that to me. I don't think he's going to avoid the question. No, and uh, here's a clip speaking to that. With relation to the trihex stuff, I know that there is no world where a person as white as me has an argument with somebody that is almost crying about whether or not they can or cannot use the N-word. That's never going to turn out well for me. I know that. I know that in the public eye, no one is ever coming out saying like, yeah, Destiny crushed him in that debate. That's never going to happen. Uh, but I'm okay with that. Um, I'm okay with that because... Part of what I sell as part of my brand, and I sell this in a business sense, as in you watch me and subscribe to me, and I sell this in a personal sense, as in if you're going to have a romantic, a sexual, a friend relationship, a video game relationship with me, um, authenticity is a really big selling point of my character. You hopefully should never, ever, ever have to guess what I'm thinking, ever. You don't, like... I don't know what Destiny would think about that. I don't know what Steven would want about this. Like, you never have to guess. I'll tell you. Um, you know, if if you think that <clears throat> you're really hot and, and that I'm just, like, faking an enjoyment for sushi to, to, to get in bed with you, it's not going to happen. I fucking hate sushi. It's never going to happen, and I'm not going to fake that, okay? I'm true as fuck, okay? Steak boys for life, okay? I eat shit that comes from the ground, not from the fucking sea. Fuck that shit out of here, okay? Or <laughs> if you're a black person, and you talk to me and you say, Destiny, what do you feel about the N-word? Destiny, how do you feel about reparations? Um, Destiny, why do you think black people have the problems they do in the U.S.? The answer that I give you is going to be the same as I give anybody, any time, on any platform, and in any environment. It's always going to be the same. Um, nothing I do is performative. Uh, <laughs> uh, I feel you, baby, slightly. Right. The idea that nothing anyone does is performative is absurd, right? We all have to perform, you know, all the world's a stage and we all should take care with how we present ourselves because our own vital best interests are riding on that. They always did things like that because he does give different answers depending on, you know, the audience and, and how much the people can handle and that. But I, but I think the sentiment is correct which is like he he does say what he thinks and he tries to make it consistent across different contexts like he doesn't try to obfuscate his positions that much all seems true even if the position is you should use the n-word you should be free to use the n-word in private with other people that are not racist that is his position on that by the way just out of interest because i heard the debate about it but i didn't hear the like I, I couldn't get any sense out of it mainly because the people he was talking to were so terrible um what what is his position is it like a kid who's listening to nwa who's singing along to the lyrics and any he, and yeah it's his position is in one sense the context matters right that like if you're using the n-word in the, the context of reciting the song say rap song that matters right it's not the same as saying it as a slur but the second point is going to pick the more controversial one is that he wants to argue it's fine to use privately with other people not just the n-word but any nick slur or whatever where people know that you are not a racist so you're using it as like an edgy joke yeah. right but his position also is you shouldn't do that in public because it can encourage you know, like he understands audience dynamics and normalizing bigotry and that kind of thing. So he's saying, but in private, mm -hmm. like amongst friends who know that you're not racist, it should be okay to use the N word, you know, even if you're white, if you don't mean it in a racist sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, 
you and I are not from the United States, so this this is not the cultural touchstone or third rail um, here. It didn't come up there. much in Belfast. No. <laughs> so that had, that had to be yeah, a but, way. A lot of people did say it in rap songs and what that. But, you know, I mean, transferring that to the context that I know about, I mean, I do agree that we shouldn't treat words like magical talismans with, with superpowers. Like some heuristics around not using certain words are certainly good. But, you know, I can, like I follow an account called Eat Wog, right? And it's a, a Australian of Greek or Italian descent. And, you know, Wog food is great. You know what I mean? Like that, that word has, What's has a wog? lost. Oh, it's a, it's a slur. It's a derogatory term for, say, a Greek or a Lebanese or an Italian person. Oh, right. I was thinking yeah. gollywog. So yeah. I was like, God damn that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I, can't, I can't remember doing it, but I'm sure I, I would have, might have used that, that word in, in a similar tone in a similar context in a friendly joshing where, where everyone involved knows that there is no sting in it and it, it is just sort of absurd like it's, it's just absurd at the moment to be racist towards um greeks or italians say in australia these days and, and similarly with my brother who happens to be gay um you know he, he, he and i have used the phrase oh that's so gay talking about something between ourselves knowing exactly what we mean so well, um yeah his his position is also, Matt, that there was a guy called Trihex that he did a podcast with a black guy. And Trihex had a discussion with Destiny where he got very upset with him over this position. And I think they ended up, I don't know when they stopped doing the podcast or whatever. But in any case, you know, the relationship was materially damaged by the stance that he took on this. But Destiny, in some sense, he's a lot more extreme than I think a lot of people would be because a lot of people might just be like, you know, it's not that big of a deal. I don't want to hurt my friend and I don't want to be known as the N-word guy. But Destiny is like, no, <laughs> there's yeah. a, you know, the, yeah. this point matters. And he's annoyed because he heard Trihex in another conversation give his justification, right? And he's like, well, that's inconsistent. So you're saying that if you use the N-word with a hard R, there's, there's no context here. It's automatically bad. No, no, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm, and you critique me a point for asking for context there. However, the intention of how that word is used can give you more than just a binary good or bad judgment over the usage of the inner with a hard okay, R. Okay, a gamer. Now we have Zerka saying hard R is always dehumanizing, and Trihex, this is just a few weeks ago, says that contextually. Like Mitch example, using example, it? When is it the right finish. context? Let him when finish. Right let him finish, John. The example was he using it with a hard R to be edgy humorous and, a, and not a direct uh, negative connotation tone, or was he using it to assault someone? There is no know. humor in that word. It's dehumanizing. That's, that's what are you talking about? Here we literally have my argument platformed verbatim that contextually, even a hard R with a white person might not be dehumanizing, like Zerka is saying. And and he also is annoyed that Hassan will agree with him in some other... So who, who the heck is speaking? My name's Luke Ford. I've been blogging and vlogging since 1997. I am playing excerpts from Decoding the Gurus, where they are decoding the work of Destiny, a.k.a. Stephen Bennell conversation that there are circumstances where it's okay and then when he's in the presence of you know black people that he'll he'll say something different or i'm sorry what does hassan say when it's just me when it's whitey to whitey when it's cracker to cracker okay when it's fucking pale friend to pale friend when it's two people that can walk into a room with a single flashlight and light the whole motherfucking place up whether it's from my pale skin or the growing baldness on his fucking head okay what does hassan say at this point but if someone else is doing it in the mm -hmm. privacy of their own conversation with another person, there are specific contexts in which you could probably say the N-word. Cool. That is that now, this is poorly clipped because he gives more context in the, fir in the first, like, 10 seconds back, but it actually is all context that helps me. Hassan unironically makes my private public language argument. Now... I don't know why he's not brave enough to make it in front of black people. Maybe he feels like black people are too stupid or emotionally immature to handle this position. Um, maybe he's scared. Uh, maybe he's worried that his audience will think it looks bad. Maybe he's more concerned with optics than with principles. I don't know. It's not really for me to say. I'll use Hassan as an example. I'm not going to talk to a black person like Trihex and say, hey, the N-word, it's always bad, brother.
Brothers for life, dude. ESL, man. I'm Turkish, dog. Yeah, I totally get you, man. The N-word is horrible. I'm not going to go into a podcast with other upset black people and then perform, you know, like a circus animal for them and go like, yeah, yeah, you guys are right, man. I know why you guys are triggered. Like, amen, guys. Like, the N-word is always wrong. It's dehuman. So if you're Jewish or Christian, white, black, brown, yellow, everyone can find a reason to feel victimized. And the stronger your in-group identity, the more intense will be your sense of victimization. Right, the more you will buy into a victimization narrative, you cannot be a strongly identifying, highly committed, intensely in-group living person without simultaneously developing an incredibly intense victimhood complex. And for everybody, they can develop a sense of victimhood. Right? White male Christians can develop a sense of victimhood. They can come up with logical, factual reasons and then construct a narrative about how they are the real victims. Right. Armenians have plenty of reason to feel victimized. Palestinians have plenty of reasons to feel victimized. Jews have plenty of reasons to feel victimized. Nazis have plenty of reasons to feel victimized. Communists have plenty of reasons to feel victimized. So whatever your in-group, right, there is a ready-made narrative and it is filled with empirical evidence sustaining your, your sense of victimhood. And there is no intense in-group identity without an accompanying equally intense sense of victimhood. Humanizing, right guys? But then when I'm in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a white person later, like me, um, yeah, dude, like we can say the N-word sometimes. Like it's cool, as long as it's like appropriate. Like in the joke is really funny. Like, yeah, it's cool. I'm never gonna do that shit. Whatever I say, I'll say it to every single motherfucker that I talk to, full stop. You never have to guess where I stand on any issue, okay? Yeah, so mm. the, I mean- So I don't say the N-word but I, I don't uh, castigate people who do. So it's only very occasionally that anyone in my life might use the N-word. And I don't lecture people in my life. I don't tell people, oh, you shouldn't say that word. You shouldn't say that. I also don't stick up for people, generally speaking, because it's just not worth uh, trying to make a, make a case for somebody who say being maligned. Because if someone's telling you bad things about someone, they really don't want to hear contrary points of view. So some people find it uh, discouraging that I you know, don't stick up for them when other people are, are trashing them. I, I just don't think it's usually an effective use of my energy. The, the topic at hand, like the contentious issue is frankly a stupid one, right? <laughs> is, 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 right? So, is South Park style bad language okay sometimes, right? You know, who cares? Yeah. Um, but I Americans mean, I think, care. I, Americans, Americans care, care. Like this a lot. They, they do. Sorry, 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 Americans. Um, but I mean, I think it speaks to his motivations and his character. Like he is aggressively upset about people just saying things because it sounds good. It's going to make Convenient. people happy in this situation, and he's completely fine. So I've lived in the United States since 1977. The N words played very little significance in my life. It's very rarely been used. In fact, I have never. I don't think I've ever seen it being used disparagingly to try to reduce the, the dignity of African Americans. So until what? Until approximately year 2000, 2004, uh, people in, in public life would, would say the, the full word out loud. All right, Dennis Prager didn't want to just say the N word. He was about the last person in public life, about the last talk radio host to who uh, stopped saying the full word out loud when, when that was relevant. Not that uh, Dennis used it as a slur, but if the, the word came up in the news. So I don't think it's a good sign that uh, many people think that there are these magical properties to the N-word that uh, make it necessary that we should just say the N-word instead of the, the full word. On the other hand, I mean, Judaism is pretty clear and many traditional ways of life are pretty clear that we should not use language and words to demean and hurt people unnecessarily and with people thinking he's an asshole or a degenerate yes. <laughs> or whatever <laughs> and that's what uh, but but he hates but he hates people misrepresenting him like you said or or thinking he saying something which he isn't yes yes and and he's very clear about this like just 
another example do i want to change how people reacted um you know am i happy that some people were upset do i care to change myself enough to make some people not upset um do i how much am i invested in a particular thing do i enjoy the freedom i have to be um you know very bombastic and, and very aggressive and abrasive is that worth the trade-off where i lose some friends i lose some sponsorships uh some people are turned off by my messaging because i'm too aggressive you know Right, there are side effects to everything, right? Not just medication, right? Destiny has become an incredibly successful live streamer who, even after paying his editor approximately $30,000 a month, uh, Destiny is, you know, raking in in excess of $50,000 a month. And that kind of success comes at, uh, at a price, right? So I'm sure he has ticked off uh, people from his real life. He's damaged all sorts of relationships. So anytime you get out of the behavior and language and outlook that is expected of you. Anytime you get out of balance with people in your life, you, you start placing a strain on those relationships. And it's probably one of the most powerful reasons why people don't change. Because once you start changing, the people who know you will usually push back. They, they won't like it because we get these pictures of people. We get this sense of who someone is and we then interpret everyone favorably according to our own favorable picture of someone, but we very likely only know someone from one particular area of life. And then when they change in a way that we cannot ignore, it's destabilizing. So in a synagogue, one person gets divorced, it often kicks off a whole series of people getting divorced. On the other hand, if uh, most of your friends are staying married, right, you're much more likely to stay married. If most of your friends are having adulterous affairs, you're much more likely to carry on an adulterous affair. If most of your friends are gambling, all right, you're more likely to gamble. If most of your friends are smoking marijuana, you're more likely to smoke marijuana. If most of your friends are gaming, right, you're, you're more likely to game. These are all things that I'm weighing at the end of the day. Uh, and big, like, big situations like this uh, give me a really good chance. to. It's a lot of data, right? I can step back and I can think about a lot of different things. You know, like, did I approach my conversation with Trihex correctly? You know, should I have been on some principles? Should I have been kinder in public? Um, should I phrase things differently? Should I have been more argumentative? Should I have been less argumentative? Should I have I reached out privately? Um, should I have avoided this forum altogether? Maybe these aren't the right places to discuss things. Um, there's a multitude of, like, different... Uh, dimensions that i can kind of look at to see um so curious gazelle responds on twitter 40 i was talking about intellectual masturbation so what is intellectual masturbation it's a phrase that's thrown around a lot and uh, i think it means uh, intellectual conversation and, and thought that is pleasing is easy is amenable to one but it completely lacks value All right so not, not uh, every thought that pops into your head should be shared with the, the world. Uh, reflexive partisan reactions right, tend to lack, lack value. Right? Things that uh, have value usually require hard work and considerable amount of uh, pain and self-sacrifice. How, how could I have approached this thing differently? What would the different results have been? You know, is it good, is it bad, or whatever? And, and I apply this to a lot of the different things that have happened over the past few days. So, okay. So I go through, um, I got, so understanding that all of that exists in my mind. So this is like a pretty, uh, there's a pretty personal view that I have of the world, right? I'm going through a very personal way that I evaluate and audit my own behavior um, to make sure that I'm bringing it in line with how other people see me. I like to think that I have a very, very, very good idea of how other people see me. I, I like to think that I understand why people like me. So the higher your intelligence, right, the greater your ability to put yourself in the shoes of other people, right? You just have a much wider palette that you can paint with in life, right? The more accurately you'll see the future, right? The, the more accurately you will likely see the repercussions of your words and deeds on other people. And destiny has, has all these possibilities, you know, because the guy is uh, pretty damn smart. Why people fucking hate me. Um, parts of the personalities that I, part of my personality people enjoy, part of my personality people fucking hate. And I think for the most part, I think I have a pretty good grasp on most of that. Like <clears throat> sometimes it seems like I get a lot of feedback that's negative and I do. Generally, I'm aware that it's coming and generally I just don't care. <laughs> like I, I like the the final, you know, he goes through quite a lot. He's clear, you know, I do have all these thoughts. I do ref so my general sense is the more loudly and emphatically people talk about how they don't care, uh, the more they, they care, 
right? When we're good at something, when we've got something dealt with and solved, we don't tend to talk about it. So I've been talking to friends recently at, at great length. And that, that's because what I'm talking about is troubling me. It, it bothers me. It, uh, it shatters me. It uh, confronts me. It's painful to me. It's aggravating to me. It's annoying to me. It's frustrating to me. Right? It's not something that I've fully dealt with. Right? If I start to stutter, if I get uh, you know, weird interfering tension patterns rolling across my face, it, it's because we're, we're dealing with something that I haven't dealt with yet. Right? When, you, when you deal with something and it's dealt with, you've resolved it, you've got clarity on it, you just don't feel much emotional need to talk about it. Right? We talk about things that we haven't worked through. Reflect on things and actually he outlines like a quite detailed, you know, reflective process. But his conclusion at the end is like, I do think about all that. And then I decide that I don't care in most cases. <laughs> it's, it's, it's refreshing. Such a, it's such an interesting character. Um, yeah. Oh yeah I, I think we're building up the picture of what makes Destiny tick and also what is his. So what's uh, obsessing Fox News right now is uh, anti-Israel protests sweeping U.S. college campuses. But couldn't you just as accurately say pro-Palestinian? pro-Arab, pro-Muslim protests, or anti-American foreign policy protests are sweeping America, right? If the United States was not as deeply involved with Israel, if the United States was not sending so many billions of dollars worth of weapons and military aid to Israel, you wouldn't see anti-Israel protests sweeping U.S. college campuses, all right? U.S. college campuses are the least nationalist, the least friendly places in the United States to ethno-nationalism, and they are most similar to the situation in Europe. So the American news media is unique in the world for its uh, general pro, pro-Israel pro perspective. Uh, coverage of Israel tends to be much more critical in Australia and in, in Europe and uh, Latin America and uh, Asia compared to what, uh, what dominates the United States. I, it, it's hard to think of any prominent pundit over the last 50 years, who has not been pro-Israel. Appeal to his audience. And one thing I don't think we have made clear, we've hinted at it a few times, but how would you describe his political uh, location, Chris? He's a mid-moderate liberal left-wing progressive, but not on the bleeding edge of it. Yeah? Yeah, he's a, like, he's a liberal person with that leans progressive but is definitely not a leftist um and i i do think like i can and uh, comment in the chat i do envy destiny somewhat but he's in that messed up headspace right so is that a verse from the new testament what does it benefit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul so there are going to be levels of publicity levels of success levels of attention that uh, many people simply cannot sustain with equanimity and that they would have been better off being less successful. And, uh, and Destiny does seem to be, be troubled, right? He, he gives a very powerful presentation of himself, but underneath of that, there seems to be you know, a boiling stew of dysfunction. I played two clips that basically illustrate where he is politically, like, here's him talking a bit about Biden. I mean, legislatively, like, I think in the first year or two, I think people would have said that Biden accomplished more than anybody thought he'd ever be able to do. So legislatively, the administration is very strong. I would argue that foreign... So th that's a weakness in almost all news media and academic analyses of a governing administration is that they give great credit to people who are able to get things done. But in life, frequently, not doing something is far more important than doing something, right? You're often far better off not doing the wrong thing. And yeah, the, the Biden administration got a lot of legislation passed, and uh, that probably played a role in the explosion of inflation. And it definitely played a role in making the world a much more dangerous place, right? The United States and Russia are much closer to a direct confrontation, much closer to a nuclear confrontation that the Middle East is a more dangerous place. Europe is a more dangerous place. The world is a more dangerous place, be in part due to the legislation that the Biden administration has passed. So simply passing 
legislation is not inherently good or bad. Like taking action in your life is not inherently good or bad. So I, I got friends with whom I talk about intimate things and we discuss areas of our life where we're frustrated and almost all my friends go, well, the key is action. And if I think the person's open to it, I say, no, the key is contemplation. Like once you get quiet from, from your ego and from the maladaptive drives that are pushing you in useless directions, once you get quiet and contemplate, right, the consequences of a course of action, right, the consequences of giving up something that you are habitually doing, right, then you will develop the mental armory and the inner strength to make an effective change in your life. So for, for painful parts of our life where we're continually engaged in self-destruction, I don't think the primary solution is to take action. I think the, the primary thing to do is to engage in contemplation. Policy-wise, I think it's fairly strong. Uh, some people were unhappy that uh, the Afghanistan pullout wasn't as nice as it could have gone, yeah. but at least we're out. Um, and I'll give a major props to that. Trump said he would get us out. He pushed it off until the next election. Uh, so, I mean, at least we're out of Afghanistan. And I think the United States has done a really good job at taking leadership on the Ukraine hmm. issue with Russia. Uh, but then that's contentious among people on the very far left and then a lot of people on the right. So, yeah. Uh, and then also there were like early day successes as well. Like, I think we avoided the economy pretty well for COVID. We got the 100 million vaccinations in like half the time he said he would. Uh, even though maybe that's not 100%, you know, Biden to Biden's credit. But, um in terms of like on leadership, I think that he has the demeanor of a president, which is nice to not have to look at Twitter to see what my fucking leader is saying every day in the world stage. Uh, foreign policy wise, he has a respectful foreign policy. He's not like doing crazy stuff all the time. No photo ops with insane people. Um, yeah. In terms of cons, uh, I mean, the age is going to be a big one. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you watch him talking about Bosnia 20, 30 years ago and you compare that to today. It definitely is, is slowing down a bit. Uh, sometimes I wonder if he's a little bit too milk toast. Mm -hmm. Like I kind of wonder, I look at Biden, in my opinion, I feel like Biden is, is, he's pretty hard to hate because he's not like that polarizing, yeah. but he's also really hard to like get behind because he's not like that exciting, you know, whereas Obama was a person that the Republicans love to hate and the Democrats love to love. Uh, Biden is just kind of there. I think he does a good job. So 95% of the time for 95% of people, it doesn't make any difference whether it's George W. Bush, Barack Obama. Donald Trump or Joe Biden in the White House, but the bungling foreign policy of the Biden administration is, is something that we're in all likelihood going to be paying painful costs for for many, many years to come. All right, the Ukraine war is completely unnecessary if the United States has simply restrained itself from backing and training and arming Ukraine, Russia would not have felt incentivized to wreck Ukraine. Right. The wrecking of Ukraine is overwhelmingly the fault of the United States of America, because just like the United States has a, a policy that uh, it will not put up the Monroe Doctrine, it will not put up with foreign powers interfering in its zone of influence, meaning the Americas, right? so too the other superpowers, Russia and China, have their own equivalents of the Monroe Doctrine, and they're not going to be pleased with foreign powers interfering with their zones of interest. So the disaster of our policy with regard to Ukraine and with regard to Israel has enormous possibility for absolute catastrophe, including the end of life on Earth as we know it. But in all overwhelming likelihood, it's going to be a disaster for many, many years going forward. John Mearsheimer says in all likelihood, it's going to be 20 times the disaster of the pointless and useless and disastrous invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, but in kind of a boring way, so people don't care as much. Yeah, I think that's a good, um, a good clip to play because you can basically locate an American on the political spectrum by finding out what they think of Biden. If they hate Biden, they could be hard left or on the right. But if they, yeah. they think Biden is basically fine but aren't terribly excited about him, then yeah, that, that's where you are on the spectrum. Yeah, and we we do have some clips that highlight the difference from leftists, so I'll play one of them. The political distribution of people in the United States right now is very strange. If you go online, progressives basically run everything. Yeah. Uh, but in the real world, progressives are a minority of the Democratic voting. That is a very important point, right? Our institutions, the exception of perhaps uh, much of the military, 
and part of the business world, almost all our other institutions are run by progressives. They occupy the high ground of culture and of the academy, of the news media, right? They, they basically run all of our institutions. They, they essentially determine the, the, much of the publicly discussed moral fabric of society. They set the, the terms of debate. And uh, it's, it's interesting that half the country votes Republican, and yet almost all our institutions are run by the, the liberal left end of the political spectrum. Black, yeah. and they have almost no political power, but they seem to be very active culturally and in like schools and everything. The progressives kind of like have the reins on all the social issues, but I feel like they're running farther and farther away from where people are at organically in the conversation. Like if you talk to a progressive, they would tell you that like the debate today needs to be whether or not like a four-year-old can be considered trans. And in the United States, I don't even know if the normal voter has completely bought into anybody being trans yet. Mm -hmm. Like my guess is probably 30 to 40% of Americans don't even believe that transness is like a real thing at all. The Republicans have made like trans issues the focal point, I guess, of the past like year and a half of all of their policies, of all of their talking points. Of like, I feel like every single day I go on Twitter, there's like seven guys from the Daily Wire talking about Leah Thomas or some trans issue or some culture wars thing related to trans stuff or another book in the school. Yeah, um, I feel like. More specifically, just I guess I feel like progressives when they go to argue about a lot of these niche social issues, yeah. there's very little understanding, very little. Yeah, why do conservatives talk about trans issues so much? Because it is politically effective, right? The trans debate perhaps is the first time that uh, trads have successfully pushed back against the liberal left consensus, right? For, for the first time, the liberal left is not winning every single social issue. So the reason that uh, conservatives suddenly discovered abortion as a major issue is because it was a useful tactic for uniting the disparate and otherwise unrelated parts of a potential you know, Republican coalition. It was something that would unite uh, evangelical Christians, it would unite Catholics, it would unite uh, secular people who did not like the degenerate tendency of American life. It uh, united people who didn't like black people very much and who had had disgust for, for for black culture, right? That's obviously not a socially acceptable thing to say, but you could be part of the anti-abortion coalition as a way of, of channeling your disgust with black life. And it also worked together with the anti-communist wing of a potential Republican coalition. So abortion was a successful organizing tactic in American politics until it ceased being successful organizing tactic after the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Now it seems to be very much a detriment to Republican chances. And as a result, Republicans are playing down abortion. So people who didn't think very deeply took Republican talking points about abortion, took them seriously, that abortion was murder. And there were these uh, killings of abortion doctors and all sorts of historic, hysterical reactions to, to abortion. But people who developed a hysterical reaction to abortion weren't thinking deeply. They were simply taking cues of cynical organizational tactics by Republicans and seeing, seeing these organizational political tactics as the real deal, as, as real moral outrage. And there is no precedent in the Christian tradition and the conservative tradition for making abortion a preeminent moral issue. It's just not something that is traditionally uh, organized and energized either Christianity or conservatism. And the only reason it has in the United States over the past uh, 45 years is because it's been an effective organizational tactic for assembling a Republican coalition. Now, it's maladaptive. Compassion, very little empathy. If they run into somebody that disagrees with them, they basically immediately write them off as like a racist, a bigot, a sexist, a fascist. Right. And then they don't really have the ability to even engage in that conversation. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think um, that's not an unreasonable comment on the American political scene at the moment um, where... It's, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think... No, I don't need to sell merch. Like selling merch is low class, right? This is a classy show. 
and uh, the chat says, thou shalt not kill, right? The Hebrew does not say thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not murder, right? So there is moral sex and immoral sex. There is moral killing and immoral killing. The word for immoral killing is murder, right? The Hebrew is very specific. It's not the word for killing. It's the word for immoral killing, which is murder. And the commandment to put to death people who commit murder, I think, is the only commandment that is repeated through each of the five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So if you believe God gave the Torah, if you believe in the profundity of the Torah, right, you have ample evidence for being pro-capital punishment for murder. It's fair to say he's not a fan. So, you know, like if you identify Destiny as a progressive, you have to take into consideration that this is his... Uh, stance on the general progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And, um, well, sorry, I'll just interject there. I thought his main point there was that the, I guess, hyper progressive issues that the edge of the progressive party in the United States likes to talk about is also something that the right wing and MAGA likes to endlessly um, go on about so oh yeah yeah I, I, th I think he's talking about a more of a pragmatic risk you have yeah i don't think he's agreeing with like all the criticisms that he raises there but i think he does hold a whole bunch of progressive things but i just mean that like if you describe destiny as a progressive you have to at least describe him as a hypercritical progressive because he's essentially saying most progressives are counterproductive for, yeah. for <laughs> what, the politics that they want to instantiate. Well, okay, so you're using progressive to describe not all Biden voters. No, 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 no. no. Liberals. I'm using liberals like I'm distinguishing liberals and progressives. And I think he is too. I think that culturally the progressives have put the Democratic Party in a really weird spot. Like, for instance, in... Um, in, in 2022, um, we did really good in the elections. I think a lot of it had to do with abortion and, um, and, and Trump's bad leadership. But Okay, there's a comment in the chat, thou shalt not spill thy seed. And that is a commandment in the Torah about uh, not, not spilling your seed on the dusty soil. And as, as part of my general research for my book on the history of sex in film, I was surprised to find that virtually every tradition of which I became aware condemns masturbation. So it, it's almost a universal communal response equivalent to the universal communal revulsion against incest. Like earlier than that, the BLM riots and the push for socialism and the all cops are bastards rhetoric from the progressives, even though they're a minority of the party, really hurt a lot of mainstream Democrats in their elections. Yeah, so politically, you know, he... So Trump almost won in 2020. And... The, the reason that he almost run, won is because there was a growing backlash against Black Lives Matter. So you saw when Trump first won in 2016, right, Black Lives Matter went quiet for several years because people on the left saw that as Black Lives Matter became more prominent, right, uh, conservatives and Republicans became more successful because there was growing revulsion against Black Lives Matter. So whenever you get one party in power, right, people in the parties usually tend to overestimate their own popularity and pursue their own agenda too far so that they alienate people in, in the middle. There was an explosion of Black Lives Matter after the death of George Floyd, but there was accompanying that explosion a tremendous pushback against Black Lives Matter that almost got Trump reelected. And so you, you would see in the weeks running up to the November 2020 presidential election in the United States, the news media deliberately choosing to play down Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter riots and the dramatic increase in, in crime as, as a result of uh, in large part corporate America and, and the news media subsidizing and valorizing Black Lives Matter. Like think about all the Fortune 500 companies that uh, sent, matter to Black, sent money to Black Lives Matter causes. He's like mainstream Democrat in the US, liberal, but with some more progressive takes. But no love for the, the progressive wing, and certainly not for the communist, tanky, bleeding edge of the yeah. left. He is yeah, not a so, fan. Yeah, I, I think the correct description is that while the, the center of his political opinions is, is center-left, milquetoast, boring, um, pretty standard, much like ours, but he's very much a heterodox 
edge lording on various issues. You know, like we heard about Israel oh, and yeah. Palestine. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there, my, you know, we've been highlighting some of the mainstream political positions that he holds and where does he fit, you know, in the landscape or whatnot. Let's go back <laughs> into the world of streaming, the controversies and stuff that generate there. So one particular piece of juicy Destiny lore might be that he had plotted on his stream to kill a child <laughs> that was interfering with his ability to stream by doing Yeah, I, I think we've all felt some very nasty and aggressive and violent tendency tendencies when someone is interfering with our ability to do what we want to do, what we're passionate about and what pays the bills, right? You you mess with someone's ability to feed their family and pay the bills and you're going to get a very strong reaction. Uh, Astro Hopper says, Cyber View, you need to be ashamed of your careless comments. You do not have the, uh, you do not deserve your, your moderator status. <laughs> so, I get energy from your comments, all right? It would be impossible for me to stand up here for hours and just uh, talk into a camera unless I was getting uh, pushback, feedback, uh, inspiration, something for me to to build upon. And so as long as you're not just a active, you know, antisocial jerk, all right, you, you, get, uh, you get moderator status. You're in DDoS, denial of service uh, attacks, right? Like hacker shit. And this was in the early days of streaming when um, you could do this through, I think, getting access to someone's IP address. And it interfered with Destiny's ability to earn money, right? And it's fair to say he took this badly. <laughs> he, mm -hmm. he, uh, he ended up, you know, like finding out details about the kid that was responsible or kids and like, you know, contacting them, feeling that the family were not responsive enough and threatening them in various different ways. And to be fair, he also contacted, I believe, the FBI and various law enforcement to try and get them to stop. But so this became well known because he talked about like wanting to kill them, the boy and his father. So, yeah, it's much better to report things to police and law enforcement than to start threatening to to kill people. So I'm one of the last people to re report my problems to persons in, in authority. But there are situations that are extreme enough where it, it's better that you try to deal with things through a legal process and try to solve them on your own. At least and kind of plotting about how you would go about doing that. And now that might get kind of shunted off to edgy Nebraska Steve when he's in his 20s or whatever, like, you know, being an edgelord. But in line with all the stuff that we've just been talking about, people have asked Destiny more recently how serious he, he was about that and how justified he thinks it is to, like, plot out to kill a hacker child who is interfering with your stream. Um, mm -hmm. And I've got two clips from him engaging with someone. So the reason I make almost everyone a moderator is because otherwise it's just easy to ban, block, and delete people. So if there is any chance that you're going to be more of a contributor than a detractor from the stream, I make you a moderator so that your comments don't get uh, deleted by other people's whims. What about that? One lawyer. Right. Like once you get banned, all right, it, it can be a real pain. I had someone... Uh, call me up from Australia and, and send me money so that I would un unban him. Um, and he told me that for lawsuits like this, that because all of it is uncharted territory, that one, mm -hmm. it would cost me tens of thousands of dollars because you'd need tons of expert witnesses to come in and explain things like TCP IP stacks to the fucking jury to even begin to talk about a DDoS thing. And that two, yeah. the likelihood of it even succeed. Right. So, as soon as you start taking action in the world or in your life, there's always pushback, right? We, we, seem to be much more predisposed to standing in place and not changing. And as soon as you start building something, accomplishing something, achieving prominence in something, there's always pushback. And uh, often the pushback is far more intense than people can handle. And so they go back into their hole, right? So a lot of people, they're afraid to be positively visible in the world because they don't want to take the chances of becoming more vulnerable 
and uh, receiving criticism. Meeting is going to rely almost completely on what, on how tech savvy the judges and if people even understand what's going on, and that like proving damages and stuff might be difficult too. That it, yeah, so yeah, now, you're looking at like a big ticket. So now, if the, yeah, go ahead. If, if your question is in that situation, with so the United States has been an incredibly litigious nation from the 17th century onward, but uh, being litigious in in you know a civil case or a a, a criminal case. Usually a better thing for society than trying to take justice into your own hands. The law is murky where it's expensive. Where it all, in that case, and when the police aren't, don't seem to be doing it because it's like uncharted waters or whatever, um, is, is the right solution. And uh, interesting comment here by Cyberview. Never do anything nice for anyone. They will always try to drag you down with them. So many uh, leading public figures, particularly in, in the moral religious sphere, have, have talked about how the biggest mistakes they've made have been to try to do the, the right thing and, and the kind thing. So one ideally wants to be balanced and when we help, to help moderately and judiciously. So I remember Dennis Prager was a leader in the Stephen S. Wise Mountaintop Minion when I went there between 1994 and 1998. And uh, one day he saw someone begging by the side of the road when he was driving to synagogue, and he picked the person up. It, it was a Jew, and he, Dennis Prager got up in front of the whole congregation, says, hey, we should all you know, help this Jew in need. And then the guy that we all put out, hands into our pocket. Well, I didn't. But uh, the person who Dennis Prager helped then started berating the female rabbi and just became a complete pain and, and had to be banned from, from the synagogue. And Dennis Prager like held his head and says, like, the, the biggest mistakes I make are when I try to do the right thing and the kind thing. Uh, usually worth asking before we embark on saving someone, rescuing someone, or attacking someone, like, what's driving me? Because if we don't get clarity about this, we're acting blind and uh, it's just way too easy to flatter ourselves. So it's not up to you to solve homelessness in Los Angeles. It's not up to you to solve crime in, in New York City. And in trying to solve these matters, you will very likely have a grandiose expectation of how much you can change. You will very likely do things that diminish the quality of your life and then the harm that you'll do to yourself and perhaps the people who love you in all likelihood will far outweigh whatever benefit that you think you might be creating through building, you know, various uh, anonymous Twitter accounts. So the urge to rescue and the urge to be rescued, I learned from one of my 12 step programs, uh, tends to come from the same sick place. Right. I have experienced like getting high from rescuing someone. I met this woman at the Los Angeles Press Club. At the time, she was living on her sister's couch and sleeping in her office. She was a, a, a member of the uh, board of the, not, not the board, but she had a, an official position with the Los Angeles Press Club. And she would sleep in her office at the Los Angeles Press Club. And she was cute. And I brought her home and moved her in with me. And it was absolutely intoxicating for the first uh, couple of months to rescue this woman. But then by about the third month, her level of dysfunction and her proclivity to insert herself into pointless and destructive and dangerous online feuds made her feel like a millstone around my neck. And I almost broke up with her then. And, and this dysfunction did like fairly early on, like just a few months in, just end our sex life. But we kept going for another six months because she got me into playing chess and that, that common hobby uh, doubled the length of our relationship. And then uh, name was uh, Christine. She, she's the first woman who I know, who I've dated, who, who was my girlfriend, who uh, ended up dying. She had like a, some brain hemorrhage a few years ago. She became set on uh, converting to Judaism. She did it all on her own, but she went through the conservative process to Judaism and as someone who lives an orthodox life, that's not going to get you anywhere. That's not going to make your life easier if you've got a conservative conversion because that's not accepted in orthodox life. And one time when she went to a conservative synagogue, uh, her, her car was filled with stuff because she was living out of a car. And a 
rabbi at that synagogue said, yeah, I will sponsor your conversion, but you have to agree to go to therapy because it was just so obvious that that woman is dysfunctional. And so I have often dated women with a much higher functioning level than myself. And very quickly, they, they became disgusted and discouraged with my low level of earning and functioning. And occasionally I've dated women with an even lower level of functioning than myself. And while it was into intoxicating initially to rescue them, by, by the third month, it started to feel like a millstone around my neck. Solution to kill someone. Do we want to live in a society where that's set up that way? Sure, okay. Answer so I said no. maybe it's not. Should that be murder if you had killed sure, Okay, what about beating the shit up? Okay, how did I kick her out of my apartment? Well, my landlord did it for me. Said, hey, uh, she, she, can't, she can't be living with you. Yeah, witnessing someone's dysfunction is infuriating if you've, particularly if you put a great deal of effort into rescuing them. And this woman had many positive qualities. She was attractive. She was fun. She was loyal. She was fit. She was smart. She was adept with uh, software and the internet, uh, building websites. She had, had a college degree. She had a minor in Latin. She was uh, easy to be around, and she was great at cuddling. I, it, would, it would soothe my anxiety to just wrap her in my arms and to cuddle with her and to just spoon with her. She was funny, so many wonderful qualities, but essentially dysfunctional. She would just get into these pointless feuds. And the, the way she would present the feuds would invariably be very self-justifying. Then the more and more I learned about the feuds, I would think, oh my God, like, why do I want this level of dysfunction in my life? You know, why could she not sustain a job? Like, why did she consistently make decisions that just made her more dependent on me? You know, why could she never turn up on time? So I tend to date two types of women, two types of women. Uh, one type of women, women who are on time, got their life organized, they got it together, and they're, they're moving forward to professional success. And then the other type of women I date are very loyal, very fun, very accommodating, uh, women who will let me do anything to them, very loving, very fun, but who are dysfunctional, chaotic, messy, and who just start to feel like a, a millstone around, around my neck. I remember Kathy Saip had that observation about uh, one of my, my beautiful girlfriends. He said, uh, now she's just got a manner and a face that, that says, you can do anything to me, Luke. Attacking them. I, I don't think that the law would cover that either. Okay, then tell me what it should be. Should. Tell me what you should do. It, you, you, what, what you should do is you should advocate for new prosecutors new, that, and, and new laws and new protections. That's what we do in this in This is this the society. gayest possible fucking what you So Elliot Blatt says, witnessing someone's dysfunction is even more infuriating when she has large breasts. I think Ed Dutton wrote a book about how someone's uh, body reflects personality tendencies. And he's, I think he said that uh, women with large breasts tend to be less mentally stable than women with smaller breasts. That women with larger breasts tend to be lovers more than mothers. That's the, the, the number one takeaway that I got from, from that book. And in my ex life experience, I, I've dated a lot of women with natural D and E cup breasts and that uh, generalization is true the women with the larger breasts were more chaotic uh, more dysfunctional more promiscuous more sexually adventurous and less marriage material than all the a cup women that i dated so i'm not, not proclaiming that this is a general law that's just my anecdotal experience and that's what ed dutton said in one of his books now let me be, ask you questions no wait you didn't even answer wait. okay yeah so the, again the, the kind of tone you might take it so there he did kind of imply well what if i beat the crap out of them instead with that and the, and the guy say no you, you you can't do that but um a bit more from that conversation i want to restate then your solution is so i was living a righteous life in, in regard to promiscuity back in 1993. So from 1991 to 1993, I'd gone no fap. I didn't even shake hands with women. I didn't touch the opposite sex. Instead, I'd spend a lot of my time 
uh, hugging trees because I was quite ill at the time. I was lonely. I was isolated. And then 1992, somebody doing a PhD at Loma Linda University said, I, I feel like your greatest need is community. So that's when I accelerated my conversion into Judaism. And I started accelerating my participation in uh, personal ads. And I started getting a stream of women who had come to visit me at my parents' home where I was staying in Newcastle, California. And with the more women who came to visit me, obviously the more temptation. It's a lot easier to stay sexually sober when you don't have access to women. And uh, then I, I met this uh, Jewish woman who was very much enthralled with me, who had natural e-cup breasts, and all my sexual discipline just uh, fell apart, got flushed down the toilet, and she was just the second woman I was with. So there's something special when you've only been with one woman in your life, but then after you have a taste of a different type of sexual experience, it was absolutely intoxicating for me. I was after the races of sexual promiscuity, I think the Talmud says that uh, the male sex organ is, is, the, is the one organ that the more you exercise it, the more it wants, the more insatiable it becomes. And that was, that was my experience. And even though I, I saw that uh, getting into a sexual relationship with this woman was not aligned with my best interests, I could not stop myself. And uh, when I left her, to go off to Florida with a woman with a cup breasts and who had a psychiatrist who was likely to help me and who did help me and who helped me regain uh, at least two thirds of a normal life with the prescription for, for Nardil. But when I broke up with the e cup woman, she wrote letters to my parents, just sharing the most devastating things that she could about me. She did absolutely everything she could to harm me. She destroyed my relationship with my parents. I got uh, written out of the will. It just caused my parents so much pain. She talked about you know every place in the house where we'd had sex. We'd had sex in my father's bathtub. And it was just devastating to my parents. It was devastating to our relationship. You know, I left home, moved, moved to Florida, and it did irreparable, irreparable damage. And I kind of sensed that, and I tried to hold myself back, and I couldn't. And so I was just greedy. Right, this, this poor voluptuous woman, she would come up on, on the weekend, stay with me. When she left, she'd be so exhausted because I was just so needy. I was just sexually needy, emotionally needy, physically needy. Uh, I would get her to read things that I had written and to give me feedback on. It was just all about me, me, me. She gave me a book called The Givers and the Takers because I was just all taking. And then after me, she dated nothing but felons. Like everyone she dated after me for years was far, far worse. She had to get the, the police involved. I mean, things became so desperate that she got a substantial breast reduction. Uh, I'm not sure that she ever married. So I'd hate to think that I was the start of a bad spiral or I was just, uh, if you lead a sexually promiscuous life, in all likelihood, you're hurting people, even if it's consensual because it's simply not aligned with the best interests of most women. Most women will tend to regret that sex that does not lead to marriage. Okay. That I should have advocated to Congress that they change the laws while I lose my job for five X plus years for, for them to figure out what to do. That, no, that's I, my... I, would, I would recommend that you get self-help. I would, I would recommend that you start a lawsuit. I would recommend you do exactly what you did, which is to find new ways to protect yourself. I, I which would is what I did do, yeah. Okay, yeah, per perfect. I wouldn't recommend, and anyone who would recommend that you kill someone would be wrong. Look at how much worse your life would have been if you had done that. If you're just looking at the particular case that you had. I mean, it depends on whether or not wait, I figured out wait, how to... Wait, wait. Okay. It is the case that your life... So why did I live this life of promiscuity in my late 20s, early 30s? Why did I do crazy things about, uh, you know, like uh, writing about the pornography industry? And the way at age 57 I've come to understand it, I was doing the best I could at the time with the tools that I had at my disposal. Now I'm older, wiser, I have better tools. I, I don't need to turn to promiscuity to soothe my anxiety, to give me a sense of self, to feel powerful. But for many of those years, I was in poor health and I was failing in pretty much every area of life but the sexual. And so I put more and more pressure on you know, my sexual gymnastics, my sexual performance, the, the romantic intensity of my relationships, uh, because that was like the only thing that was firing in my life. Would have been ruined if you did that. 
Uh, yeah, but, well, I don't know. If the alternative would have been that there was no solution for these types of attacks and people could infinitely grab your IP from a whole bunch of things, my life would have been ruined either f***ing way. I don't know which one would have been worse. I'm not sure. You're not sure what would be worse to be... Well, it depends on know, if you get caught rope. or not, right? <laughs> Isn't that the whole point of fucking killing somebody is if you get okay. caught? All right, now, look, did I answer all your... Wow, that's an astonishing level of nihilism. Your questions? Can I ask you some questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. If someone had done what you said that you were, whatever, that, that situation, should they have gone to jail? Uh, should they, no, I don't And they think were so. caught? No. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's just recap really briefly. Uh, to tell me if I'm... Now, that was a dispiriting display of nihilism. I mean, that's where destiny sounds like Jean-Francois Garopi. By the way, has anyone heard from Mama J.F. Garopi? whatever happened to her so let's uh bring curious gazelle back to the show curious what's going on so uh hope uh, curious unmutes at a certain point and we'll have a conversation but uh yeah M mama jf has has gone disappeared and uh jf was very prominent about his his nihilism and it reminds me of the Dostoevsky novel, Crime and Punishment, where the protagonist is a nihilist who, who kills, kills a woman who interferes with his pragmatic best interests. And uh, lost, lost a curious gazelle, but uh, hope to get her back on the show soon. I mean, would you like to be a neighbor to destiny, considering the, the nihilism that seems to be at his core? I've got this straight. So uh -huh. this this young troll hacker kid yeah. doing distributed denial of service attacks back in the day, back when that was a serious problem, there wasn't a, a, an easy solution. Destiny attempted to resolve it by, you know, contacting the kid. So please stop contacting or whatever. Contacting the kid then, contacting yeah, his parents. Yeah. Contacting his parents, um, you know, saying, hey, your kid is <laughs> it's, it's yeah. being a hacker. Going to the police and even the FBI who, Right, we want to believe that the world is individualist, but the world's incredibly much more corporate than our individualist rhetoric suggests, right? When you do things that hurt people, they're not just going to retaliate against you. They're also going to retaliate against that which you love, be it your community, be it your mentors, be it your favorite causes. Right? People are really good at exacting revenge. And the more intelligent the person is, right, the more deadly they're going to be with their revenge. You, I think you said just weren't interested because it's like they found out. They didn't okay, really so, understand, didn't take yeah, it seriously. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Destiny's position is a legal case, a civil legal action against the kid or his, or his family would be impractical, poor chance of success, et cetera. Yeah. Therefore, time consuming. Time consuming. <laughs> yep. All right. We affect other people. Right, we have a great deal to say about who becomes interested or obsessed with what we're doing. So let's uh, bring Curious Gazelle back to the show. Curious, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Sorry, I had some connection issues there. Um, so can you hear me, by the way? Yes, very clearly. Um, so I really enjoyed the show tonight. Um, what time is it where you are, by the way? The because time is 1 in the UK. 20, 1 23 p.m. So I assume it's 9 23 p.m. where you are. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the show today. Um, I mean, I've not watched it fully from start to finish, but I've been popping in and out, in and out. And um, it's just been, it's just been really, um, <sighs> there's been a lot of synchronicity that I've experienced. Um, I mean, you mentioning, uh, are you still there? Yes, yes, I'm listening. Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, yeah, so you, you um, mentioned your black shirt today, the Van Houston fitted uh, poplin solid whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and uh, so and then you made reference to this fat uh that your fat girl phase in your life um and then something about how big a 
breast, larger breasted women are less loyal, the A cups are more loyal. Um, so just a, sort of a reference to boobs. Um, and this is very synchronistic to my life. These, these three uh, things that you have raised, these three topics. Wow. Um, the, the, the black shirt, because, uh, so I call my um, ex-lover Morrison. Um, and, and I was in a 10 year relationship with him. It was a very on and off. Um, I basically wasted all of my 20s um, on this one man. And I just remember that I really wanted him to wear a black shirt. <laughs> 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 um, that, that was probably the most sort of climatic anticlimax, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I wanted him to wear a black shirt uh, because I just thought he'd look really good in a black shirt. Um, and I think he wore a black shirt once, but it wasn't necessarily for me. I don't think he wore one actually, no. Yeah, it's me probably uh, making up some memories that I wanted to happen. No, he didn't, he didn't wear a black shirt, but um, he used to always wear a striped shirt like nearly every single time I saw him, he wore this striped shirt with plain collars. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into these coincidences, but I just, I think it's just fascinating that I'm listening to you and everything is coming together. It's, it's an analogy to my life, not not a literal one, but you know, Glimpses. And how how receptive was he to accommodating your wishes for how he would dress? Um, I never really commented on the way that he dressed. I never made any sort of, oh, wow, you're so well-dressed or, oh, wow, you're so badly dressed comments. Um, so no value judgments, really. Um, I, I'm not too fussy about what men wear so long as they look like men. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but yeah, I, I mean, I did express my, I guess it, it's not really a fantasy fantasy, but a semi fantasy um, that he should wear a black shirt. Uh, so I, he just wasn't too responsive because um, I, I personally believe that he had a form of high functioning autism, um, Asperger's. Um, so he would find it quite um annoying if i ever told him to do anything so best to <clears throat> not really ask him again that i want him to wear a black shirt and um go ahead i mean uh, we, we can move on from the black shirt but I, I you look very good in your black shirt by the way um i agree with you that the black shirt is much better than the persian blue okay um, cool that, you, that your sister insisted um on you wearing um so you, you do have a persian blue one as well do you yes yes and, and it's the only shirt that i wear that gets compliments but how much I, is it? I like the the black one sorry what's the price oh they're all around uh 25 to 30 dollars so i buy the same type mm -hmm. of shirt it just comes in different colors right and why do you why do you wear the same shirt because personally me i i I nearly wear the same thing every day or the same sort of thing. You know, I also have like multiple trousers, which are exactly the same. And I'm just very comfortable in those brands, I guess. Um, so why is it that you wear the same thing really? Uh, perhaps because I got so many compliments about that one shirt that I keep going back to the well to get more of those compliments. Mm. Do you also think it's due to ADHD that it's sort of, calms your mind having to just buy one thing as opposed to having multiple options so that you can focus on your real um uh, passion which is live streaming and news and content and information yes i like i like diminishing choice and and the the time and effort mm. that goes with with making a lot of choices mm. so that i can focus on the things that are most important to me
Yeah, because there's already so much choice in in the live stream content that you uh, create. Um, so, I mean, regarding the fat woman thing, I, I was cheated on with a fat lady, I guess, kind of fat. And the response I got to that was, oh, she was just some chubby Bangladeshi girl. And then uh, one of my friends spoke to him as well about it to like kind of shame him because I was like no please please talk to him about it please talk to him about this this girl that he he cheated on me with please please and then he was like okay I'll do it um and then this friend of mine you know asked him like oh what did you see in her and uh Morrison was like oh well she just sort of was quite curvaceous to begin with and then she ballooned and then I was like well did you tell her that she ballooned and then Morrison was like yeah it was just a really weird story so i mean just because i am oh it just feels a bit cringe to expose this about myself but i am in the a cup league and i i am very loyal right <clears throat> so for borison to do that to me and and she cheat, cheat on me with a sort of fatty boom boom um it still hurts to this day what what your experience uh the the psychological loyalty discipline difference between a cups and the the more curvaceous women did you also have the ex- empirical experience of, of noticing that uh that the more curvy you know big breasted women tend to be built more for lovers than than mothers mm, i i never really thought of that i don't know if edward dustin is reading his own biases into that well then it's not just about being a crank um i I just i take him as infotainment anyway also i think he plays the role of the crank more than he is like yeah uh, people are always a bit sort of uh ironic or deceptive whatever you want to call them um and uh i always find myself digging deeper and uh i mean with regards to edward dutton i don't yeah yeah, I, 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 I get it. Uh, would you agree with me that uh, who we are in love is pretty much who we are because love st- strips us of our defenses more than anything else? Um, <laughs> ask me that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is love Strip, love strips us. By the way, are you are you tired? You sound no. a bit tired now. No, no. Uh, did no, you finish? No. Oh, well, did, um, did you finish your um, round two of this exact podcast episode? Uh, no. Or do you still have a it, bit left? No, I still got still got more left. But uh, I enjoy... how long does it take you on average to? How long does it take you on average to complete um, a, a, a reviewing a kind of podcast episode? Yeah, there, there's no average. I I build my live streaming around my life. I don't build my life around my live streaming. So the amount of time and attention and, and work that I, I put into a live stream is what's you know a good fit with the rest of my life. So I, I don't mm. uh, I don't first of all put the priority on the live stream and then build my life around that. I build my life and then. When there are openings, then I'll do a live stream, which will be of varying degrees of depth. Mm. I mean, regarding your live streams, we've still got some content to create. I remember I wanted to talk to you about satire. Um, obviously, procrastinated on that. I wanted to talk to you about analogy. Uh, that's been quite recent. Yes. Um, procrastinated when it came to that, but those topics are still in my head. Um, I mean, we're not going to do them now. Um, but I do, I do want to discuss them. And then there was that white flight, um, uh, movie, uh, documentary, uh, by, uh, that, uh, documentary filmmaker, Dia yes. Khan, uh, who is of Pakistani, uh, Afghan kind of origin. And, uh, she was interviewing, um, Jared Taylor in that documentary. And I wanted yes. to explore that with you, um, I mean, I was thinking why, maybe I've mentioned this in a podcast with you before, 
Um, and I was just thinking why I, I kind of fixate on your live streams. I mean, you are one of the best live streamers on the internet today. Um, and I, I, I resonate with your methodology. Um, so I'm increasingly finding myself uh, fixating on issues of methodology than just the content itself, if that makes sense. I mean, yes. my relationship with Morrison broke down, even though we were on the surface, we're both Pakistani. We both <clears throat> uh, come from good families. Um, we both are sort of lapsed Muslims, if that makes sense. Um, but there was a massive difference in Oh, and, and we're also quite sort of small C conservative when it comes to politics. Um, like we, we, we engage with political discourse. We know what's going on uh, in Parliament and, uh, you know, we're following Trump and all, you know, all this political new stuff. So, and yet, and yet we, we really could not get along. Um, and that was because methodologically we are very different. Um, for him uh, he, he is a high dependence of on an allergy actually which is what i wanted to tell you the day that, that i mentioned uh, an allergy on your live stream I, I said to you i do want to tell you about my more personal relationship to you know an allergy as a as a as a form of argument and um he was very dependent on an allergy and for somebody who comes at things from like the perspective of pure reason like i can literally go into extreme nihilism to explore a particular concept um whereas he just couldn't and then there's also the issue of um me being far less atheistic than he was um i think due to his asperger's he was very very atheistic like he didn't have any like moral issues with disbelief in god whereas i yeah I, I could be described as somebody who's living in a constant state of like existential panic at, at least relative to morrison so the there you know these nuances um made me realize how important um how you get to a certain conclusion is rather than what the conclusion is. I mean, sure, the conclusion does matter, but you know, how you get there is really important. Some somebody, a conservative and a liberal could both get along if say their approach to information was similar, right? Yes. <clears throat> um, um, but um, uh, two conservatives, right? Maybe they won't get along if they approach things very differently and they, they could even both be Trump supporters. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm not talking about like intra factionalism or something. I'm saying, well, two people who are alike on surface, they could be very different and not get along. These, these hidden frictions um, matter more than the overt frictions. And and I also noticed that you are a very precise thinker. You you use language in a very precise way. Um, I mean, you can divide things between you know intrinsic, extrinsic, covert, overt, implicit, explicit. Uh, I always use this example that you know if you if you describe an economy as having you know high imports. And then you accidentally say it was, it's a high export economy. You know, that makes a huge difference, right? You, you, <laughs> you've changed the entire description there. So you, I'm sorry to b bore you <laughs> and your audience no, here, I'm, but, I'm um, um, but, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think you have a similar methodological style to me. Um, uh, you're obviously uh, far superior than I am. Uh, you've been live streaming for a while. You've been 
uh, you know, putting your thoughts together, uh, analyzing information in a very kind of coherent way. Um, but yeah, I do, I do resonate with you uh, in that regard. Yeah, I think we um, both like to intellectualize our problems, like rather than than like uh, mm. regular people talking about our you know soft un emotional underbelly. Uh, mm. We would rather externalize and intellectualize our problems. Well, I, I don't know if, if we're any different to other people. I think a lot of people are intellectualizing. It's just they are failing to do so in, in a coherent manner. Um, like I am on one extreme. Um, I, I'm on two extremes, sorry. So I'm, most people, I'd say, they are a mix of like intellectualizing things and then also making like a lot of errors in their, in their analysis. Um, and then also not really caring about things too much. Whereas I am on the on the on both extremes where either I won't care about something at all or you've got to do the analysis properly so I mean, there, there is no point for me to just have a kind of midway approach neither here nor there um and this is my my sort of criticism of people like uh, Stephen J. James, if you, if you want to continue that kind of back and forth um between us uh, or, or, or yeah um, um so let, let, you me, could, let me yeah go ahead no 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 you you go ahead okay so uh i'm i've been moved by the the, the, the praise and appreciation that you've offered me and mm. that there are other people who you've praised and, and appreciated what are the typical ways that uh, men who produce content that you appreciate what are the typical ways that they respond to your praise and appreciation? And then how do you in turn respond to them? I don't really talk to, well, I do talk to men, but I mean, I don't really seek out male analysts and then comment on uh, their analysis and then kind of tell them whether they've done a good job or not um and then obviously if i'm not doing that i'm not going to get a response back from them um but like i mean you've spoken to my friend dixon yes. and he was a bit sort of uh aggressive um when he spoke to you it, it is it is a bit sort of uh, theatrical by the way so don't take it to heart but um he is a very intelligent uh character in my life um again um somebody who has the ability to think in a very precise manner he can distinguish between you know what is implicit what is explicit i mean he, he would come to the same kind of conclusion as i have about edward dutton uh with the same sort of methodology that oh, okay on the surface he may seem like a crank but is he really a crank um and you know he will extend this kind of ch charitable analysis or critical analysis whatever term you want to use here to other people um whether it be claire core whether it be you whether it be an Ed edward dutton whether it be um a donald trump or a boris johnson or i don't know some bollywood hollywood actor so he's he's got a very robust uh way of thinking um uh, and and so yeah, if, when I comp to to answer your question, when I uh, compliment on um, him on this, um, yeah, he's he's appreciative, and I guess um, it allows our relationship, our kind of back and forth, to grow more. Uh, what about say uh, fourth grade and, and fifth grade? So I remember fourth grade was about the first time in my life that uh, a girl would show her. Her appreciation of me that she would show mm. me in some way that she liked me and i found that mm -hmm. so threatening that i would respond by kicking her and and one time this this girl said to me one day yeah. you will find out what it's like to to be kicked by someone you love so mm. what was what was your trajectory in fourth grade fifth grade sixth grade like before you were had any sophistication with this when you showed mm. the boy that you liked him uh, mm. what was the dynamic that then developed? Well, um, my only relationship has really been with Morrison. Um, so I don't really have 
uh, experience with like having a boyfriend or anything beyond that. Um, however, yeah, I definitely had school crushes growing up. I, you know, if we want to talk about the fourth and fifth grade, um, so I, I guess I, I was, uh, so we call it primary school in the UK. Um, and instead of grades, we call them years. So like uh, in primary school, I was, I was massively bullied uh, for being the packy girl at school. Um, so no, no one really fancied me. But I remember I really fancied this um, guy whose name began with G, um, but we're just going to call him Boris, actually. Um, so I really fancied Boris. And um, even though I remember like once uh, I got to secondary school, so that's high school, I only really had crushes on, on South Asian men, um, on South Asian boys, rather. Um, but... Um, yeah, at primary school, it was this green-eyed, golden-haired, uh, Mediterranean-complexioned um, boy called Boris, and he really didn't care care about me at all. But I remember we were sitting in the school assembly in the morning, uh, and so <laughs> for the first time, like so this is this is in year five, like. No, this is more in year six when people had started noticing, well, they, they'd kind of got over the fact that I was this packy, but <laughs> also um, I, I became more confident um, uh, and and I became really funny, I guess. Like, a, like this was the beginning of me becoming a class clown. So I was not a class clown in primary school, but year six was that school year that I started showing signs of being a class clown um and so yeah my, my humor got me a bit of popularity and uh this this guy Boris was sitting in the assembly with me and I put in I'd, I'd worn um earrings to school like like a kind of conspicuous earrings to school for the first time and I, I just kind of heard Boris <laughs> say well oh she looks nice today <laughs> are you are you still there I yes you're i'm listening <laughs> yes yeah, so yeah he thought he thought i looked nice um but then he kind of got his friend to ask me out not for him but for like as in the friend the really like bad looking friend to ask me out he was called nick and uh yeah so boris was like oh nick why don't you go and ask her out because she looks kind of nice today uh, but it was it was, it was kind of humiliating because i wanted boris to like me do you understand yes so, so let, let, i mean yeah. let, let me ask you a question what is more scary to you some some male that you like moving away from you or moving mm. toward you Neither, right? I just, I just love Morrison. So Morrison, well, you, you have a pattern. Away from we him. all have a pattern. Like some, some people are more scared when the ob object of their fixation moves away from them. Other people are more scared when the object of their fixation moves towards them, because then they feel being overwhelmed or rendered increasingly vulnerable. So there's got to be a pattern. Um, okay, yeah, if the guy is walking away from me, that's far worse. Actually, yeah, so that, that's what happened with Boris. It, it's actually what happened. So the second time round, I had a crush on somebody. Um, so he was this uh, Pakistani Muslim guy, a uh, sort of family friend. And I used to, do you remember MSN Messenger? Yes. I used to send him nudges at like 2am yep. in the morning. So there was a yep. nudge thing. <laughs> And th so this is when I was in secondary school and I fancied the pants off this guy, um, but he, he, he literally did not care about me. Like he didn't even turn around to look at me and at, at sort of um, events I'd attend with my family because um, we had a lot of sort of Pakistani family friend kind of functions we'd go to. <clears throat> and um, yeah, he would not even look at me. So I'm sensing um, a, a, a pattern here that mm. um, men who 
mistreat you, you do not react in a normal adaptive way of getting rid of them from your life. So a normal person, when someone mistreats them, they just uh, reduce contact to the, to the bare minimum. But you yeah. tolerate and keep it because it must be you know, meeting some need in you, but it's clearly not something that serves you. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess. Um, may, maybe, perhaps, perhaps here's an analysis, maybe it's an ego thing where I think, oh, I, I am, I am good looking enough to get these, th this guy. Um, maybe he'll like me. Uh, maybe it's, maybe he's just playing hard to get, you know. <laughs> maybe if I nudge him at 2 a.m. on MSN Messenger, he will quite like me. <laughs> maybe if I show him or rub it in his face that I am alive, I, I am here. Hello, hello, it's me, Gazelle. Maybe if I do that, um, it's it's going to make them recognize my existence. Uh, and, and what if, if the, the man responds positively and you you two become close? Is that is that threatening? Is that frightening? Is it uh, suffocating? How do you experience the, the dance of intimacy? No, I, I love the dance of intimacy, but it's been grossly, um, it, it, it just malfunctioned completely in this relationship with Morrison. And you would say, well, no, that is what you you were destined to do based on your early experiences. But no, I, I mean, that, that, guy that I had a crush on during secondary school, the, the pa Pakistani guy, I, I think I would have been a very good girlfriend and I think we would have had a nice relationship. Um, but with Morrison, just because this, this was my first proper relationship and I can't really explain to you because it's just, there's just so much there, but uh, let's just call it unrequited love at least many instances of that happening uh, but i don't i don't think i know i know we're all quick to blame others but genuinely i i i'm not the kind of person to be a bad lover um i i was just pushed to become that way because of the nature of the relationship where you're not really getting anything in return. Um, uh, why did you stay for a relationship where you weren't getting anything in return? It must be because it reproduced the most important relationship of your early childhood. No, it's not that. It's to do with, um, okay, my, my loss of religion, fearing that I'm not going to be able to find another Pakistani agnostic atheist or critic of religion, right? I, it's also to do with social status. Morrison was from a very elite background, um, public school educated, um, public school meaning boarding school in this country. Um, and so, yeah, it was more to do with that, more to do with status, I guess. And that's the first time I'm admitting this Yeah. Um, yeah. to somebody. Uh, because we've had previous conversations regarding um, how people just don't want to uh, talk about the elephant in the room, which is social status, and and that's what it was. And and I don't just mean st status in in the dating terminology sense, where people are, are associating status and low state, high status, low status with you know body count and things like that. This this was a man who was re really had an elite upbringing and. I just, I feel that we also don't recognize how reflexive um, people's uh, adherence to their, their, the norms of their kind of uh, class background, status background actually is. Yeah. So uh, let anything. Me, uh, sorry, sorry. Let, let me just interrupt you. How do you think you benefit by being fixated to the extent that you are on Morrison? Like what need in you? What needs in you is this serving? Because for, for a normal objective perspective, they'd say you've got something maladaptive going on here. Curious, like why do you persist in this maladaptive pattern? 
but we persist in our maladaptive patterns because they're feeding us, that they're, they're giving us something that we need. What What's the benefit to you in sustaining this fixation with someone who's not good for you? Oh, that there is no benefit. Um, no, there, there's got to be maybe, something. Maybe. I mean, no, I'll maybe. give you the, the benefit. It gets you off the hook for your decisions about the rest of your life. Mm. You get to distract yourself from the challenges of reality. You get to distract no, I yourself. Think the other, I, think, I think it's the other way around that I'm, ma- I'm making these decisions in life because I'm so fixated and the, the fixation feels so overpowering. I don't want to go into a work environment where I'm just thinking about Morrison or something um, because, you know, things, things have happened uh, in the past uh, which have been very much related to him uh, and they've just caused me a lot of grief um, uh, and that's in the context of education and career um, and so I, I actually think um, yeah I, th- I, th- I think it's the other way around I, I don't I... think I'm escaping something just to think about him uh, think. Would you agree that most objective observers would regard your fixation what well, would regard number one that you do have a fixation with morrison mm. and it's a fixation with someone who's bad for you and that you're engaging in self-destructive behavior by not escaping this yeah i i recognize that that is the that is one such observation i mean that is the objective observation but what so-called objective observers are not going to get right is the kind of reasons for why this fixation um has uh, oh, what, what is it about place. you forget morrison what is about you that is getting fed by this fixation it's meeting a, a vital need in you mm-hmm, but it's a I, distraction I, my, one of my vi- yeah one one of my yeah one of my fantasies so he's talking about distraction from reality the opposite of reality is fantasy and one of my fantasies is to just have a man do everything i'm not talking about cooking and cleaning by the way but what i mean is no but like, protect and provide I, yeah protect provide i want to outsource thinking to the man as well like i lost my ability to read and write coherently so i, I full out lost the ability to read when i was with morrison and i'm still recovering from from that um and i also lost the ability to write um as in write essays write coherent um chunks of text um and for somebody who's who was good at that to go through that um it's just been very debilitating um so yeah and and the reason for that has been I, i completely outsourced all of my thoughts to him so even though my brain was completely fried when I was with him because I'm right. thinking constantly but at the same time I'm, I'm fully submitting to anything he's saying but right. I'm yeah at the same time my mind is questioning what he's saying but then I'm not really supposed to fully question right. because so, I mean on the one hand he's quite he was not okay with being questioning okay uh, forget, forget about him hand, well, let's let's talk yeah. talk about you what need did it does it meet in you to um, outsource these things to your ideal man. It's obviously meeting a, a very deep need. We all have a love map mm-hmm. that goes back to childhood of you know our romantic sexual fantasies. You know, talk, tell mm-hmm. us who, who we are because we have this particular groove in our mind and, and it has to do with our earliest wounds and this is the way that we meet our earliest wounds by, by constructing a, a fantasy that uh, restores us to wholeness but at the same time we recognize that we're in a fantasy so we can participate in the fantasy but we also know that we're in a fantasy but it's it's our fantastic scenario to staunch our, our deepest wounds so what what was what were the benefits to you in in the fantasy of a strong powerful man uh, taking care of you and uh, solving all your problems. Well, it's just nice. 
it's just it it just feels good but because it i was never placated in that regard um i can never get those positive vibes but but why does it feel good so uh, for example my um my sexual fantasies are that i'm dominant and and i have those fantasies fairly clearly because so much of my the, of my life i have felt the, the opposite of dominant i felt weak and vulnerable and so I have developed these erotic scenarios where I get to be the, the strong dominant man to compensate for, for the wounds for my weakness and vulnerability. What, what are the wounds in you that this scenario soothes? Okay, so you are, just like you are compensating for uh, a relative lack of masculinity with a desire for hypermasculinity. Yes. I am, I am, perhaps I'm overcompensating for a relative masculinity that's within me as a woman mm -hmm. for, um, with the desire for like a hyper, uh, you know, like a hyper uh, feminine persona on my part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, relative to my, relative to my um, bow, so to speak. Yeah, I mean that that makes sense because powerful people frequently have the erotic uh, fantasy of being powerless in in the bedroom, and and because they they feel the burden of the amount of responsibility that they carry in real life, and so in their erotic scenarios. They, they imagine themselves free of, of the burden of responsibility. On the other hand, people who lack success and responsibility in real life will tend to have erotic scenarios where they're, they're powerful and in charge to compensate for the, for the pain of being vulnerable. And uh, there's, there's a, a great... Uh, great book about love maps and it's by the the person who came up with the the title the book's called love maps sexual erotic health and pathology paraphilia and gender transposition in childhood adolescence and maturity by john money so he's known as the duke of dysfunction man who writes about unspeakable human sexual problems with such dignity and care that his case histories make me feel almost normal so uh dr dr john money famous psychiatrist who, who developed this whole theory of love maps. And he says that we develop our sexual and romantic inclinations and fantasies, you know, in response to our, our childhood wounds. And that love map, that term represents the brain traces that determine what arouses us sexually and romantically and enables us to fall in love. So a love map will depict an idealized lover, a love scenario and a program of erotic activities any any resonance with that that theme of love maps curious okay uh not not getting hmm. a yeah any any thoughts yeah, i don't know because i just don't um Uh, therefore, um, yeah, you know, a beating or a, a murder is is the right thing to. Okay, nothing. Oh, lost, uh, lost. Uh, curious to do. Um, yeah, potentially will avoid punishment because mm. the other person asked them. You know, if you were caught doing that, do you think the person yeah. should be punished? And in other parts of the conversation, he is saying, you know, well, if someone was threatening your livelihood and you weren't able to provide for your family, they were coming every day and stopping you feeding your family, wouldn't you be justified in taking, you know, action? And I, I kind of feel still fundamentally missing the point that, you no, know, you cannot, you, you cannot murder people, even when they're behaving extremely unreasonably and damaging your ability to earn a livelihood. Like murder, no, it's not like, it, yeah. it, if they are threatening your life in terms of they are attacking you then there are some occasions where that's justified but destiny seems to be are advocating that but it was really annoying and costing them a lot of money and therefore 
what's he supposed to do? Yeah, and but the point is that he is upfront arguing for that, right? Yeah. I think it's so, very- so, I mean, so this is the interesting thing, apart from the extremely edgy aspects of his point of view there, is that he he said this years ago. And, Many and, years ago, like back in yeah, the early days. Yeah. And it would have been entirely possible to say, hey, I was really upset at the time. I was extremely emotional. My, exactly, my, yeah. it, my entire livelihood was being threatened. I was blowing off some steam. I don't think that, but no, he, he, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. Will, he will die on that, on that hill. Yeah. 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 So he's like, wouldn't, well, and he, to be clear, he didn't kill the boy. Right. So he found a way, good, good, good. Find a way to hear that. And he apparently, I don't know how much this is true, but I, I did hear it in a, one of the various destiny lore videos. I watched that he made a website detailing, you know, the various technical steps he made to, immunize himself from this kind of attack and it became a standard that many other streamers followed to avoid this so he actually did a public good in some respect as opposed to a murder (laughs) but it's the fact that he feels a murder morally and logically would have been justified and he's prepared to explain like in the past couple of years that that is still the case like that's a reasonable position to hold now he's wrong matt just to be clear i like mm-hmm. i mean you can agree with him if you want but i think <laughs> a large amount of people would see the problems inherent in that argument but the fact that he is making that in public is quite remarkable to me yes like uh, yeah yeah it's remarkable yeah I, i'm not going to debate him about it but i'll just say that i also think it's wrong <laughs> there's no circumstances if we speak to him i'm gonna i am gonna raise this because <laughs> i just i i just want to understand the process a bit more but but the thing is the thing is Chris, i think if you asked him he would be exactly the same as in that other interview where he would steamroll you with a bunch of very logical very coherent arguments why it's he, the case right i don't think i can out to be destiny but i don't know that his logic is going to hold very firm <laughs> this position right like i i think this is a very this is the first time that i've heard the hosts of decoding the gurus talk about how they couldn't uh they they couldn't out out debate someone but uh i think two most obvious reactions to what destiny was just saying about committing murder someone was interfering with his livelihood is either one destiny was just in an extreme situation that turned an otherwise stable decent person crazy or two there is a deep amount of uh, nihilism at, at the core of destiny so those are my two immediate reactions hope to get uh, curious gazelle back on the show momentarily this is like one of these tasks that they give you at the be it school about defend this position which is almost indefensible right so that that would be an interesting challenge but a similar thing Matt just to mention this I feel this is a little bit similar it's kind of getting into the edgy tendency but also the express your opinion directly so there's a stupid red pill podcast called fresh and fit it's manosphere you know high quality meal alpha man shit it's stupid misogynistic like Andrew Tate level crap. And one of them is currently going for a controversy because he had sex with a Instagram influencer woman and she is now claiming that she is pregnant with his child and wants him to materially support, right? So, so I had someone close to me used to say that, uh, you know, God gave women breasts so that men would speak to them. It's uh, kind of scary talking to the opposite sex because the opposite sex has all sorts of gifts that uh, our own sex does not have. And so in many ways, people who go gay are taking the easy way out because the the opposite sex will always remain somewhat of a a stranger to us because they will have strengths and and, uh, tendencies and, and needs that are just so radically different from our own. So that which is strange to us is also... To varying degrees frightening it's kind of it's all the things that those idiots spend their time warning about that there's these gold diggers that are trying to get your money and whatever and you need to avoid these these traps but setting that part of the dynamics aside the woman in question was on some other stream discussing her situation and destiny jumped in to be in destiny's position 
is he is sort of condemning of the fresh and fit guy, but he wants to also condemn. So there are a lot of perverse incentives in creating an online persona, the opposite of what's good for your, for your real life. So let's get uh, Curious Gazelle back onto the stream. All right, during all your connection issues, any thoughts that came to mind, Curious? Yeah, I, I just think this kind of relationship conversation is going to go nowhere uh, with me. So I, I think we should change the topic. Okay. Um, Un unless unless you were enjoying it, because uh, I, I can't tell whether you wanted to dig deeper or whether you kind of just wanted to discuss something else. Okay, so I, I would I would love to dig deeper if we can keep the focus on you. Uh, on, on the other hand, I don't want you to say anything that's going to damage your, your real life, but I'm not interested mm -hmm. in Morrison. I'm interested in you. And so oh, when yeah, we uh, have yeah. these intense relationships all right we we learn a great deal about ourselves i i think that uh love removes our defenses and it reduces yeah, us I... to our embarrassed essence so i'm curious like what you learned about yourself from this relationship i, I, I learned i learned that i'm um, obsessed with status that's what i learned mm -hmm. i never thought i was uh because again i've been raised in a very middle class environment my, my parents are professionals but they never push me to really become a millionaire or something or you know they they just they were just quite normal um and i i was i mean i've been a weirdo in many ways i get it but uh in terms of upbringing very normal um and that's what i realized um in my relationship with him that um i i am obsessed with status and i really wanted to make it work because i thought oh wow it'd be so nice to be in a relationship to, to be married to someone uh who to the outside world would be uh very elite and stuff but in my own inside world i, I know what he's like i know he's my um my <laughs> atheistic <laughs> husband <laughs> um so I, I guess i guess i wanted to check all of the boxes and yeah i also learned that yeah check, i want to check all the boxes like i i am i don't want to compromise on anything i want a person who can give me social status but is also going to be a great conversationalist he's going to give me you know there's going to be a back and forth between us in terms of um arguments about you know intellectual topics uh I, I, yeah i i just wanted everything in in one i guess and i'm not somebody who's too obsessed with looks so i can kind of though i you know morrison was attractive um but yeah, I can. Yeah, I, I can date someone who's not that handsome. And so long as the other boxes are, are ticked. And, and what's the most uh, painful type of uh, feedback that you've received over the course of your adult life? So for me, for example, it's comments to the effect of uh, I manifest a general weirdness. But uh, how about for you? What what are the what are the type of cutting types of feedback that you've received during your adult life? Do you know what it is? Um, my issue hasn't been people calling me weird. It's just people around me not understanding what this relationship has done to me. So never being able to convey what is going on inside my head and, and never kind of having anybody on my side um when it comes to this relationship because my parents never approved of it um my siblings were always telling me to just stop doing this myself stop talking to them blah 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 but they never could understand why it's so important to me and why it's consuming so much energy what forget him forget morrison 
What is the most common type of feedback that you have received about yourself and your choices during your adult life? Um, that I've um, made a made a major made a major mistake by. Um, I mean, it's it always will go back to him, so I don't know how to avoid that. Well, you can you can talk about yourself. So, um, what's the, the it, most common type of feedback you received about yourself? Oh. Um, that um i'm funny is that what you mean like what do you yeah, mean that, by that's 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 easy right uh, i i've also received that feedback that, that i'm funny but what's the what's the more painful type of feedback that you've received about yourself but i don't know if it's painful because if it's just an observation that's true then it's just True. Okay, give me some observations about you that aren't easy that to are, toss yeah. off, such as that you're funny, you're wonderful, yeah. you're attractive, you're yeah, charming. Yeah, yeah. You're, like, what, what are the um, more? That you procrastinate a lot. Um, okay. You, you, you kind of completely fixate on yourself. I mean, I know I'm not meant to mention Morrison, but this is just it's serving a purpose that you know i'm I, I was completely consumed by this relationship and then i didn't look at anything else in my life yep. so that is a major um downside when it comes to me um uh, i am uh, i guess um i'm quite lazy Uh, what what I'm hearing um, kind of underneath that that commentary is that people are saying that you are not taking on your adult responsibilities, but you're mm. deflecting them through a fixation. I'm not saying they're right. I'm saying that that's what I'm they're, hearing. They're right, but it's the other way around, I feel. Right. I know you feel that, but pretty much everyone who knows you has the opposite perspective. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying they're right. I'm just saying that's what I'm sensing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I can only say yes. I can't. I mean, if you if you push me to answer other things, then I will. But you're right that that is the case. That um, I'm not taking on these on those um, uh, adult responsibilities that I should be. Um, and do you know what I'll, I'll come to a compromise so when it comes to the direction as in what is impacting what um i'll say like initially yes the, the i was i was fixated and then that caused me to run away from responsibilities but now it's become the other way around because it is basically unrequited love he doesn't want me i'm just kind of still linger lingering on <sighs> and, and those things. I'm, I'm gonna guess almost all your friends and family have lost patience hearing about morrison yeah they have i mean I, I didn't really discuss morrison with my parents um but they don't have any patience for me to get back in a relationship with him go meet up with him and blah 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 blah, blah. they just they don't want to hear about it um, I mean, you'd have to pay someone to listen to you talk about Morrison because everybody else gets tired of hearing about Morrison from you very quickly. I, I'm going to bet that. So I know that's that's I, my I know, own I, reaction. I, I have a, I have a, I have a few friends. Well, I have one really good friend of mine. To be honest, he's he, it's Dixon. <laughs> I talk to Morrison about a lot. Um, and I know, I sense that he is also just had enough. Right. Um, but he still, he still makes room for that. Right, because I he mean, likes the I, rest of you. Maybe I should you. pay him. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> he likes the rest of you so much, he's willing to put up with with talk about Morrison, even though that, that talk for him is like uh, a root canal. Like I, I think for almost everyone in your life, hearing about Morrison it's like having a dentist drill on a sensitive tooth. Mm. 
No, I, th I think it'd be quite interesting if you, if I contextualize the stories a bit. Right, but I'm just curious why it, it's so much more easy for you and more alluring for you to talk about Morrison rather than yourself. Yeah, well, I don't, my, my stories are not interesting. Yeah, I, I beg to differ. So I just don't think people usually have a very keen sense of what's interesting because certainly hearing about Morrison's not interesting, but learning about you is interesting. Because mm. the, the tale about Morrison is a very familiar one that almost everyone's heard that this, that, that my romantic partner or the object of my fixation or the object of my limerence, which is a, a relationship that's primarily a fantasy rather than a, a real the, rather than the real thing that, that everybody finds that it, it infuriating, uh, boring, uh, off-putting, uh, disturbing, distasteful, and nobody wants to hear about it. But people do want to hear when others share something that's genuine. So I, I'm going to bet that when you start talking about Morrison, that for, for most people that, that is experienced as emotional dumping, but when you confide something about yourself... Uh, apart from Morrison, that uh, that that then becomes a basis for intimacy. So we've had conversations offline, and when you've confided about yourself, it's it's been part of the the rubric of bearing, uh, uh, developing a, a friendship between us. But I just find myself when the conversation turns to Morrison, I just want to tune out, and it sure feels like everybody else in your life wants to tune out, and they only put up with it and to the extent that I've, I've put up with it is because the rest of you is so valuable, but nobody really wants to hear about Morrison. People would like to know about you and what, what you might start doing to get your life on track. Well, the, the information is far too personal for me to reveal. Yeah, yeah, good. I mean, you shouldn't. I, I really like your your good sense of uh, uh, boundaries. Like, don't reveal I, things. But I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think I have a good sense of boundaries because I am revealing a lot about Morrison. Yeah, but that that doesn't matter. It's just cliched stuff. I mean, there are there are ten thousand Morrisons that we all uh, have heard about. So. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the reason I don't talk too much about myself is. Um, it's actually not that I can't. It's just I fear being uh, doxxed or something. And right. Well, then, that's good. That's you know, a legitimate I'm, fear. I'm, and, and then I don't. I'm. I'd, and then on top of that, I don't fear being doxxed because oh, I'm so special, or that you know something could happen to me work-wise. Uh, it's it's more that I don't want people stalking me. Right. That's and that's an absolutely healthy fear. I, I I don't think most men understand that women pretty much every day have some moments when they have concern for their physical safety and it's not something that most men experience daily is is, mm. is that fair well i i mean i i don't really get public transport anymore because i'm really creeped out by the thoughts of people um on on british trains and buses what and have been be, your that... experiences on public transport in britain I mean, it can be misconstrued as elitism, right? But it, it's not because I used to travel by train a lot, used to catch the bus a lot. Um, just with this kind of migrant crisis that's unfolding, just some really kind of weird people are on trains. And then, of course, the native white British population isn't really um, up to scratch either. Uh, so you get a lot of like, old white men who look kind of pedo-ish uh if you, if you get the train at the wrong time um like if you get the train um at a sort of off peak hour um so yeah i i get creeped out by that i hate it actually uh one experience i've had is um there was this um there's this old white man who was in the same, um, what do you call um, the compartments in trains? A compartment, yeah, get it. Um, yeah, so he was in the same compartment as me, and the train was basically empty, and that compartment was definitely empty. 
um, except for me and him. And he was just staring for ages, um, making like weird grunting sounds. And then I got off three stops before my main stop. Yeah. Because I got so creeped out by him. Um, and this was during the day. This is not nighttime. Everything's well lit. Um, it's kind of springtime. So, you know, it doesn't get dark too quickly either. Um, and then I, I just I just stopped off at three stops before mine. And the entire place was derelict like this stop i thought would be decent mm-hmm. right because it's a decent area but it was completely derelict no like i saw one or two people walking and they looked a bit kind of scruffy as well and um and then the the train station itself was really confusing where it wasn't clear where the exit was wasn't you know you had to climb up the stairs, cross a bridge, then go down, then go down another bridge. And there was no actual office, right? So there were no kind of professionals working there. And I I was like, oh my God, like this place is damn creepy. And then, (laughs) and then I just, I just got a taxi after that. Um, But I had like 4% battery on my phone. And this, this town, uh, this area, which was near my, my area was a bit, it uh, was like, it's like 15 minutes away, but I can't exactly walk to my house from this place because I've got no idea. Plus if, if I do want to walk, I'm going to need a map. And if I, if I, I need a map, I'm going to need some battery on my phone. So I didn't have it quickly um, called, uh, quickly booked an Uber. And then, th- then <laughs> the Uber, the Uber driver just couldn't work out where this place was. So I'm having a heart attack thinking, oh, my phone's going to just turn off anytime. Yep. And this guy is not going to be able to contact me. He's not going to be able to tell me where, uh, where he's parked. And uh, thankfully, you know, God saved me. Um, he, he came in time, just, just like my battery was on 1%. And, wow. and, and, then, he, and then he was there. Um, otherwise, I don't know what I would have done. Because this, this area was like outside of the, so I said the train station was quite empty and derelict. But even when I walked outside of the train station, um, the area was quite rough. Like it was a residential area, but nobody was outside. Um, I don't think I could have knocked on any door. Like people just seemed really creepy and cold. So yeah, that's that. But I I did get back home and that experience on the train has really, um, really reshaped the way I see public transport today. And people just think I'm paranoid about this. But I've just I've just noticed it. I mean, uh, recently travelled uh, by train to get to London, and um, and so that journey is obviously longer than the one that I was talking about. Um, and I was travelling by a, a quite a good service. I, I wasn't travelling first class, but you know, just it, it's it's meant to be a good train service to London, and just the sorts of people it never used to be that way and the there's this other train service um so I saw, I saw that train kind of just go past me and I just thought to myself thank god I didn't book this one because it was full like chocker block with just new migrants and I would not be comfortable sitting on that train unless so- I was a guy what what sort of people do you feel comfortable sitting with or near on a train? Um, probably um, young people in, in, in crowds and they just look like they're kind of okay dressed. They don't, they don't have any kind of threatening look about them. Those sorts of people. Um, uh, or like maybe a professional uh, in, in a suit or something going off to work, um, or, or like a like an old couple, you know. Yeah, if 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 the old man is completely on his own and just staring at people in the train, or he's he's on his own at a time when no one's really traveling, right? Then that that would creep me out. Yeah, and uh, do you think that this problem would be improved or? Uh, made worse by an increase in immigration? 
oh, it's it's going to get way worse, way worse. And they keep using buzzwords like increased capacity, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, um, I mean, if, if we have to do politics through buzzwords, then, uh, you know, you really need to focus on the quality as well of, of the transport. Because just focusing on capacity, like, oh, can this train get, you know, 4,000 people on it in one compartment? I don't think that's a good way to approach it. And if everyone on the train was wearing a business suit, would do you, do you think you'd feel more comfortable? Um, so, but that is is that on the assumption that they're all going to work, or are they just doing it to be frauds? No, they have genuine reason for for dressing up. Yeah, I, I would feel much more comfortable. Um, but yeah. I am a bit, a bit of a hypocrite because I've I've travelled by a train and I've not being dressed perfectly i mean when i'm when i'm out i do try to make some kind of a, an effort like say if i just need to go and get the groceries right so i'm not going to go out in in my pajamas which is what a lot of teenagers and stuff do now but i just find that really abhorrent And what type of uh, social or political or cultural or religious policies do you think might diminish these problems? Uh, the death penalty? Yeah. If you had a death penalty, look, realistically, uh, the Western countries, um, UK, USA, these places are not going to be able to tell the leaders of POC countries uh, global South countries to get their act together, right? They're not. They're not going to be able to stop uh, the, the populations, uh, swathes of people from the global South uh, countries coming over to the West. Then they're just not going to do that. They they haven't actually updated their way of cutting deals with foreign nations, and they're not going to update that anytime soon. Like. Given how given how many Pakistanis there are in Britain, one would have expected um, the prime minister to be, uh, you know, negotiating serious contracts with the state of Pakistan and kind of saying, well, you know, we'll we'll give X, Y, Z amount of money to you if you can retain your population where it is and focus on developing your own country so that they don't all have to come over here or we're gonna we're gonna arrange a serious deportation policy with you uh, the problem with deportation policies is that um like for example these some of these grooming gang members they went to park they were deported to pakistan and then they just came back so, so you just said a policy stopping that would you coming work. back you just said yeah, that so, trying to... Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, these are just examples of of just one thing, which is that, um, so realistically, there is, there, there's, there are, there's not going to be any kind of deal, uh, uh, deal negotiated with um, third world countries to control this. So then can we control this within our own borders? Can we um, improve policing? Can we, um, Im can we get the army? involved can we can we can we can we get the death penalty like can we do it like this that okay fine you're coming over however you get two chances right if you commit a crime for uh, um first time round then you'll be put into jail and if you commit a crime second time round then i'm sorry death penalty uh, depending on what that crime exactly is but um you know people talk about getting tough on crime but they never get tough on crime and they just keep repeating buzzwords. And I also think um, there's been a kind of um, dematerialization of the economy whereby you've got two um, you've got two uh, trends within that dematerialization process. One is uh, you know the typical one that people talk about, but it's financialization. Um, and then the other one is everything just becoming comms like communications based like you could join the police never actually um have have prosecuted anybody but you could be just like collecting 
swathe and swathes of swathes of data and just kind of talking in buzzwords for the next 15 years of your life and working up the um the ladder in the police service through that so that that is like you are literally dematerializing an entity that is meant to be material right if you're if you're going to stop crime then it's you know you're going to do it through fine i mean collecting data statistics all these things are important i'm not i'm not so cynical of these things but when it gets to the stage where these things are interfering with actually combating crime that's just insane and you also have a kind of dematerialization of crime itself so yeah harassment is bad uh you, you shouldn't go around you know um harassing people on social media or something but the concept of like social media hate crime that's just gone through the roof and like how can it be that a police force is prosecuting people for hate crimes um at like this exponential level and that when it comes to actual stabbings they don't care so everything has just become dematerialized and i don't i don't think that there is any solution therefore okay so i'll i'll propose one and you can give me reasons why it won't work so my my primary by the solution... way yes by the way i don't know if uh, i don't know if dixon is here and if you want to accept him but, oh, um, yeah, uh, let me look. Um, I'd be happy to have him on the show, so feel free to forward him the link. He's not here, but uh, if he okay. shows up, I'll definitely br bring him on the show. But uh, here's, here's one thing that I would do if I had any power and influence. I would focus on the most disruptive people to public transport, and I would prosecute them. I would focus on the most disruptive people who are homeless. I would focus on the most disruptive uh, drug addicts and alcoholics who are making uh, the use of public transport unpleasant and dangerous. So I mm -hmm. would suspect that there's a relatively tiny number of people who are ruining the experience for everyone else. And if we focused on getting those people off the streets, whether into prison or drug rehab or some sort of rehabilitation program, that we could dramatically, with relatively little cost, we could dramatically improve the quality of life on public transport. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I agree with you, but I'm, I was just presenting to you the constraints, the kind of economic constraints on having any kind of actionable policy. Right. Okay. I recognize the constraints, but what can we do? What are, what are some things we can do? So I think it's obvious that you need to target the tiny number of people who are causing the most disruption. Like one person, can ruin the vibe, ruin the happiness, ruin the feeling of, of safety in a train. So we need to target those people who are most disruptive. Yeah, but they'll, 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 the constraints of this situation, this, this um, solution um, are that they will get lost in just collecting data about um, who those bad actors are. And then they'll, they'll just leave it at that. It'll take them, I'm telling you, it'll take them six years to collect the full data on this. And then once, you know, lots of people's lives have been harmed because of these bad actors, oh, then, then, then they'll kind of try and do something. I'm telling you, there's just no point of even thinking about this. Um, I mean, I've worked it out now that why, why are we not getting any material progress in, in, in Western countries? And the reason is the complete kind of dematerialization of the economy and of course the internet is also a major part of that people sitting online having their kind of careers no one wants to actually go out and work um physical jobs um so yeah you then you will get an uptick in crime uh because actually crime will pay better for a lot of kind of low status people because they'll think well oh if i can make money selling drugs or being a hitman for some xyz person um than than doing a minimum wage job even though that's what the migrants are officially supposed to be here to do um then you're gonna have a problem like crime okay, so... pays better 
than okay, minimum got wage. It. Got it. So you are very attached to things are hopeless and there's nothing that can be done. You're very attached to that narrative with regard no, you're, to you're, your own you're life. You're very it. attached to that with regard to the, the wider world. What's the payoff for you in believing so strongly in narratives that uh, everything is hopeless, all effort is hopeless? No, I'm, I'm just telling the truth. Why, why should I lie? Why should I make up like, oh, yeah, we need to have this and we need to have that, but it's never going to happen. Why should I waste my time campaigning for, say, something like the death penalty? And by the way, NGOs in Britain do exist to campaign for that. Um, and, you know, what is the point of me doing that when I know that that's not going to happen there are two, I, I don't it's not that i'm hopeless it's that i see major constraints that just cannot be changed no you're I'm, hopeless I'm because my question no my question was what can be done to improve the situation and all you can talk about are reasons that nothing can be done to improve the situation nothing can, so I, I already said very... i i said no i said i agreed with your policy i 100 percent would want that to happen i i 100 would want the re uh, introduction of the death penalty in Britain. Um, yeah, I, I would want these things, but I know they can't happen. So I don't believe in giving people false hopes. Uh, Which is why, I mean, if one gets their hopefulness or hope from religion, that, that is far more rational to me than, than kind of getting one's hope from uh, politics. So you, you rationally see that it's absolutely hopeless to improve the quality of life on public transportation in Great Britain. Yes. And, and, no one, I, I've, I've, I've analyzed this a lot. I have followed politicians. I've looked into where exactly the constraints lie. And I've kind of just given up on, on any hope of things changing in this country. And of course, anyone who tries to implement any kind of change. So like when it comes to Suella Braverman, she's, you know, taken a stand uh, against uh, these, what she terms hate marches in Britain, the sort of anti Israel pro Palestine marches. And she's, oh, and I mean, that's only a minor aspect of her political career. Her, the major aspect was the kind of Rwanda policy where uh, refugees would be uh, deported to some detention centre in Rwanda and she had to um, negotiate a contract with the Rwandan government. And she was completely cancelled by her own party. By her own party. Forget about the Labour Party or the left criticizing her. She was cancelled from within. Okay. And it's like here's, that poses here's, another good strength. Here, mm -hmm. Here's my theory. Uh, people, including myself and including you, we don't tend to see the outside world as it is. We see the world as we are. So people who are depressed, that no matter what happens in the news, it, all it will do will reinforce their belief that uh, progress is not possible and that we're doomed and all is hopeless. On the other hand, people who are happy, and I'm usually a pretty happy guy, we will look at the news and we will constantly find reasons to be happy and optimistic and we can turn this around and we can turn that around. So how accurate do you think I am that we tend to see the world not as it is but as we are? Yeah, that, that is quite accurate, but it doesn't uh, apply to me, especially in this particular case. So you've transcended just, the human I'm, condition. Yeah, I'm just seeing reality as it is, because uh, I, 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 uh, when it comes to political analysis, I don't I don't feed my own biases into it. Like the, the only bias I really have is I wish there was a death penalty. Like, I wish crime was actually um, seriously dealt with. That's my bias there. But as for like, oh, I'm so depressed because of Morrison, and that's why I think um, there is no hope for change um, in in British politics. I I just think that's bullshit. I don't. So agree you with notice that. no connection between your own self efficacy mm. and the way you view the wider society mm. and what can be done with its its problems. No connection between what's going on inside of you well, and how you understand well, wider society. Look, there, there may be a connection. Maybe if I was in the police and I had to believe 
in the police force actually you know being capable of solving problems because my job depends on it then yeah there is a connection there but you know i'm not in the police and i'm just a kind of objective um objective observer of what's going on i'm an objective outside observer and therefore i don't think um it's i don't think it's my, my psychological condition and my view on um society is correlating here so you've noticed no association between what's going on inside of you and how you understand the wider world Well, it might be the other way around. I'm looking at the wider world and then getting depressed. Maybe that that is the real root of the depression. Right. I'm looking at how genuinely um, you cannot implement anything. Um, I'm looking at how many people are just enduring uh, this cancel culture stuff. And I, and I, don't, I don't just mean the sort of right wing... Um, infotainment icon types like serious politicians like suella braverman are going through cancellation right so she, she was fired from her job for opposing um these anti-israel marches right she she is she is just the first person that people start kind of um directing all their anger towards when it comes to politics so am, am i the kind of hateful hopeless one or is it is it the people who um are using her as a kind of scapegoat because i'm not doing that i'm trying to see beyond uh, well i left, would right i'm trying to see yeah. i'm trying to transcend a lot of right, right. um well, tribal analysis of politics yeah. in favor of truth and you know, yet, yet i am the one um who gets accused of uh, just being depressed or something if i if i just express um political like genuine political observations yeah i mean i would propose that you are the true hero here because you see through the bullshit like everyone else is filled with delusions but you see through the oh, bullshit so were you were you just uh testing me was it or did you really think that um, I am a hopeless person because I don't see that the death penalty could ever be reintroduced? I don't think you're a hopeless person. I think from the, the little I, I know about you that you're in a hopeless mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. So I think that you see the outside world as you are. And right now you, you get uh, an emotional payoff from passivity and hopelessness. And and depression, and if if uh, your yeah, your how, inner how circumstances am I a hero, change, then? how am I a hero? Then surely those yeah that was that was being true. sarcastic, I, right? Most people oh. who who <laughs> have the I hope that wasn't too cruel, but mm. most people who have the inclination to participate in live streams um, mm. tend to be socially marginalized, and. Mm -hmm no matter where we are in life, we have to shore up our sense of self. And so I know that when I get socially marginalized, when I'm failing at life, one of the first things that I cling to is, well, at least I see through the bullshit. You know, all these happy, successful people, you know, they believe in a whole bunch of delusions, but at least I see through the bullshit. At least I have the courage to state things no, as they I'm, are. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, oh, at least I see through the bullshit. I'm not playing hero to anybody. Like I would never ever go up to somebody, say I had a family member who was in the British police. I would never go up to that person and just, um, and just burst their bubble and say, well, you know, you just do a bullshit job and you're not actually solving crime. And like you uh, are a useless person, blah, blah, blah. And feed them all kinds of hopelessness i'm i'm just the reason i come online is because um i think free expression yeah. really helps me personally so but, but i i don't i don't try and enforce that on other people I'm, and I, I do have social skills and, and enough social awareness to not be 
somebody's anti-hero in real life, you know? But you don't feel like you see through the bullshit? I do feel like I see through the bullshit. That, I think that's you just do too. For me. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, and I will continue to be this way. Um, I think it's I think it's very possible to see through the bullshit and still, um, you know, progress in one's career and stuff. Um, one, once I get over this kind of Morrison related stuff, um, I'm, I'm not I'm not hopeless about my future. Do you think I, it's possible for some to make reason, progress in your life as long as you believe that society around you is hopeless? No, but it's not hopeless. It's just I think it's very possible to make progress in your own life if you have an objective sense of reality. Okay, so if your objective sense of reality tells you that uh, meaningful political and cultural change in the wider society is hopeless, but you still believe that the individual who sees that clearly can still make uh, significant progress in their personal life. Yes, because, uh, you know, if people, you know, if somebody has a job that's basically a bullshit job, that bullshit job is still, by the way, that's David Graeber's uh, term. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, the, uh, the late anthropologist. Um, don't know if I pronounced the surname correctly, by the way. Um, so yeah, if somebody is in a bullshit job, then um, yeah, it's it's perfectly um, yeah, being happy and uh, earning money, etc., is perfectly doable for them. Do, do you? Think I, that... I'm not somebody who rejects the notion of bureaucracy, by the way, or bullshit jobs. Uh, but however, if you're going to have if you're going to have me on to have an objective discussion about crime, then I'm not going to always resort to like bureaucratic functionalism and say, oh, but you know, but we realistically, we need these sorts of things because the economy depends on the law. I won't do that kind of analysis. But uh, let's, let's get, uh, let's get uh, Dixon back onto the show. Dixon, uh, long time, no talk. I realize that you're, you're just uh, joining and uh, of course you have the right to remain silent if you so wish but uh, I, I value your perspective on things what sort of wider social issues whether cultural political have you been thinking about uh, of late Dixon um, I'd say roughly I agree with Gazelle uh, I think more specifically uh, I think people are becoming more and more disheveled uh, at least if you go around London if you go around where, where I live in Northampton um, there's a real sort of lack of uh, pub, like sort of etiquette. And what I mean by that is we have a lot of bins and waste bins around here. And you can just, you know, if you've got trash, you can just chuck it there easily. But people choose not to do that and they just throw it everywhere. And I think these little simple rules um, that aren't enforced, no one enforces it, but it's just a matter of good manners uh, that we used to follow for so long. I think in the last five, 10 years, it's just completely decayed. And I think, <clears throat> and that's, I think that's sort of, um, in, in a very small way symbolizes a lot of the problems we have, at least over here in the UK. And is there anything, Dixon, that you think could improve the quality of life, for example, in public transportation in the United Kingdom? Uh, the death penalty. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, I'd say uh, it's very tough because it's, it's very hard to enforce all these things because you, you have rules in place of how people should behave. <clears throat> that people choose not to and i think at least british society it's very like it's not strict on punishing anyone for this like you don't actually go to prison for doing something like this you don't actually get even you don't even get fined really um even though there's a fine in place no one actually enforces that fine um and even if they did i don't think it would change anything uh i think a lot of the times people are hesitant because the people <clears throat> who are overstepping the bounds are like minors uh, or at least they're, you know, 16, 17, borderline, that kind of thing. I think what the UK should do in a very sort of inverse uh, way is be very harsh if you're a minor and be less harsh if you're actually over 18, um, even though that's the opposite of how we apply the law typically. I think, honestly, a lot of these issues, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you imprisoned, I'd say, 5%, 10% more minors than you did before, 
uh, and I don't mean like a harsh prison sentence. I just mean maybe six months, whatever. The threat of going to prison was there. It would fix, at least from if where I see it, it, fix, it would fix a lot of problems. What about the idea of doubling the punishment for behavior that damages the comfort of people using public transportation? Do you think if we doubled the punishment arbitrarily across the board for any acts that uh, diminish the, the quality of life of people using public transportation, do you think that would make any effect? Do you know what? Maybe taking a black and white approach, and like you said, arbitrarily, like without looking at the degree of the violation, just saying automatically, just by committing a violation, you will have a harsh sentence against you and you'll be prosecuted. Yeah, I, I, I'd i be very interested to see how that works because I think it might actually be like good in the long run. Yeah, I, I think it would be excellent. I would like to see $5,000 fines for people driving and texting. So as I walk around Beverly Hills, I see that all the time and, and the fines are pathetic. There's something like $50 or $100. How do, you, how do you feel about, say, $5,000 fines, uh, three, well, whatever that is in pounds, for people driving and texting? I mean, I'm, I'm okay with it, to be fair. Uh, if I'm being honest with you, <clears throat> driving and texting, in a weird sort of way, doesn't bother me as much as it might bother you, even though it represents a clear danger to, to the public. Mm -hmm. And if things go, things go wrong, it can be a lot worse than just being a public nuisance. But in some weird way, I think a lot of people can balance driving and texting to a decent degree without without it being so over. Um, but I, I, I'm very interested in the idea of just, for example, let's say you're someone who, who is, I don't know, a first generation immigrant um, and you're using public transport. Uh, I, I like, I think Gazelle said it earlier on about first, like a two strike system of first strike is a prison sentence, second strike, you're out of it. Um, I think the threat of, of being deported is a lot more scary to a lot of people than just going to prison. Because if you're going to prison, you're still in the UK. Uh, but just being deported means there goes your chance to like <clears throat> make something out of yourself um, and because you, you're completely permanently off this country. I think people people will take their how they behave uh, driving or otherwise public transport a lot more seriously if the threat of deportation was there. And what about the use of corporate punishment? So, for example you're convicted of committing an act of graffiti, you get 40 swipes of a cane. Uh, yeah, why not? Make it public as well while you're yes. at it. Every, every, at once a year, you yes. pick maybe some of the worst offenders <clears throat> to do it publicly. Just whip them like Saudi Arabia. Why not? And uh, I would like to see more of a vouch system. So if you're going to exercise privileges, you should have to have a certain number of people who are adults and who don't have a criminal record vouch for you. And then if you abuse the privilege that you've been granted, such as riding public transportation, right, all those who vouch for you should have to pay a punishment. So if you want to get a driver's license in, in a big city like London, I think you should have to have 25 law-abiding adults willing to vouch for you. And then if you commit a serious driving offense and you're convicted for it, then each of those adults who vouch for you should have to pay, uh, say, a 1,000 pound fine. What do you think? I think the problem with something like that, even though I kind of like the vouching system, and a lot of Gulf, Gulf countries do operate in a very similar way, is that we are so isolated as a society that most people don't even have 25, most people don't even have five people who'd vouch for them, especially in these big cities. Uh, it'll well, be I don't see that as a problem. I see that as a good thing because people mm. who don't have 25 law-abiding adults to vouch for them should not be accorded all sorts of privileges. Okay, that's interesting, actually. So that alone is a, okay, I can see that. What do you, what do you think would, of Andrew Tate's idea? Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I just, uh, let me finish that thought. I think it would strongly incentivize people to develop relationships so that uh, others will, will vouch for them. So it would incentivize people to get out of living a, an isolated life and, and make them realize that if they want to participate fully in society, they, they need to have 25 law-abiding adults who will put their own well-being and financial status on the line for them. Uh, go ahead, Curious. Uh, oh, wait, let me just give a counter-argument to yeah. that really quickly. The problem is um, policies like that would, would vastly favor immigrant groups where they have large networks of people who would, who would be able to vouch for them, whether they know them or not, versus white people who actually might not have that much people that they know 
relative to these large groups of immigrants who come who, who might either chain migrate or who might have a large family so it, it in a weird sort of way disadvantages the local populace as opposed to foreigners um well, that's one of the unintended consequences it certainly incentivizes the local populace to change their individualist way of doing things in that a group strategy will always outcompete an individualist strategy uh curious you had a thought yeah um what do you guys think of um andrew tate's idea so he expressed this on his uh, second or maybe first interview with pierce morgan that uh and this is before we went to prison by the way that there should be um a, a you know the london or the, the uk government should cut a deal with uh one gulf state i mean he named qatar there um and there should be an, a, a detention center where these people should be sent these uh I, i'm all for it I, I think it's great i'm for s s much stronger punishment for people who degrade the quality of life sure but you're just talking at the level of abs abstraction here now i'm no I'm, I, i'm not it's, what do you think of this united particularity? States, no, the United States has had waves of increased enforcement of law and increased punishment for people who commit violent crime. And as a result of these waves of increased punishment for people to commit violent crime, we've had a significant decrease in the amount of violent crime committed. So it, I think the evidence is overwhelming that increasing punishment for bad behavior decreases the amount of, of bad behavior. I would like to see more punishment for bad behavior. What about you, Dixon? What do you think of that um, plan? I agree. More more bad behavior equals more punishment. I think that's fair. It's a linear relationship. No, but specifically, uh, you know, sending um, these people off to a foreign country. I think they should not deportations, but mm. uh, a specific no, detention I mean. center. Yeah. Not back to their country where they can either live comfortably or come back to this country what they should do is deport them to the middle of nowhere now you find your way home so some random desert in in morocco yeah drop them there now you find your way home <laughs> i'm not even being facetious i think that's actually a good idea because the because the scary thing right because if someone's just going to say we're going to deport you back to your country you're like okay fine i'm going to go back to the airport which I came, you know, which I used to come to the UK, blah, 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 all these systems in place. No, you're going to go to the middle of nowhere and now you're going to have to figure out, you have to just figure out how to get home. The punishments should be cruel. Punishments actually should be cruel. The problem is now we, we do, we punish people with, with an ounce of humanity and understanding, you know, if you, if you go to prison, like prisoners get what, three meals a day? Prison yeah. should be, prison should be one meal a day. You should be functionally on that borderline of being malnourished. <laughs> If you're a prisoner, because why would you give them food and energize them? You, it should be a work camp where you get one good meal a day, and then with good behavior, you don't get to come out if you've got good behavior. You get to, you just get two meals. Oh, and, and none of this therapy bullshit either. Like a little bit fine, but like fucking hell, they get so much counseling. And and chemical castration, like much of crime comes from the exuberance that, that comes with high testosterone levels. So once you start committing testosterone fueled crimes, I'm all in favor of chemical castration. You know, artificial yeah, blockers I, I, for your testosterone levels. Some, something has to give. You can't import the third world and then just not, you know, increase security, crime, uh, sorry, yeah, you can't increase security, can you? Uh, Dixon, what do you think about the general proposition that we don't tend to see the world as it is, we tend to see the world as we are, so that depressed people will find ways of understanding the world around them in, in a direction that uh, all effort is hopeless, while happy, optimistic people will have a tendency to view the news and find you know, opportunities for hope and progress? I agree with that overall viewpoint. I think, yeah, your overall internal state of being does affect your how you view the external world. I think that's that's almost a no brainer. Um, people who are who are very optimistic have they view everything as rose tinted glasses. That's absolutely a thing. I agree.
I had a, a therapist who said to me, I, I wonder if your politics are so radical because your life is so passive. And this is another direction. I notice people are incredibly passive with uh, pursuing their own self-efficacy and developing their life. They're often the ones who are most prone to the most radical political solutions. Dixon, any thoughts? Okay, not, not getting any thoughts there out of Dixon, but uh, curious, what do you think about the idea that people who are particularly passive in their own lives tend to be the most predisposed towards radical politics? No, no, I think it might work the, uh, the other way, that if, if society is so bad that, of course, you're going to have a chunk of, a big chunk of society that is sort of unemployed and passive and, and not doing anything. Like, I think it's just... Yeah, the life is quite depressing in the West right now. Let, let's be honest. I don't. I don't like this over psychologization of people with radical politics because I do think that they are right in many cases. However, yeah, they. You know, they or maybe we. Or maybe I'll include myself in there. We should be taking the uh, the kind of uh, Tatian um, uh, stand on this, which is that. You know, if you realize that you can't really change something, then you have to adapt. And I guess the most pragmatic thing is to change yourself. But that doesn't take away from the reality that um, many people are forced into depression because of the kind of societal circumstances t that we see today. And, and Dixon, what, what's your perspective on Andrew Tate? <clears throat> um, well, may, maybe Dixon could answer the first question that you, well, the prior question. If you just want I, I to missed that the again. last question. No, I just I missed it because my connection was poor. I, I don't remember my last question, so let's just go with um, uh, what do you think yeah, of Andrew yeah, Tate, yeah. and then then we can oh, come back to whatever my question was. Uh, Dixon, on any a, thoughts on, on Andrew Tate? On a temperamental level, that's how I always judge people. I'm not a fan. Uh, I I guess I. Find him entertaining, but I don't agree with most of what he says, and I don't. I don't think I like him very much. Um, that's my overall stance on him. Great. So you, and, you wouldn't get get along with him in real life, Dixon. I might do. Um, I think you I would. Him, but, uh, but I don't think that. Analysis. No, no, no. I think I might get along with him, but I might not. I, I could still, I could still not like someone I get along with. Oh, the prior question was: uh, Do you think people who are passive in their lives? Um, no, do you think people believe uh, bad things about society, blah, 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 uh, be, is, is because they are passive in their lives? No, let me, let me well, rephrase same, that. Since, my yeah, my that point was, was something. Rephrasing, sorry. Yeah, I got it. I got it. So uh, my therapist said to me about, uh, about uh, eight years ago or 10 years ago, he said, do you think you're so radical in your politics because you're so passive in your life? Any thoughts on that question, Dixon? Oh, that's very interesting. Actually, that might, there might be something to that where um, it, you know, your political stances act as a form of escapism. Yeah. If you live quite a passive life, yeah, fair enough. Not all, not all the time. No. I absolutely believe there are some people who've lived extraordinary lives, and because of that, they have they have very extraordinary political views. But you're absolutely right. You know, if you're if you have a very sedentary lifestyle, then might you might just use politics as a way to escape. Yeah, but don't you think it, it could be the other way around? Like, isn't that just like a trite? Everything's analysis? possible. I mean, you can have people who've lived ridiculous lives and they have really boring political views. Like they've they've seen so much or they've experienced. By so ridiculous, much. you mean good or like, bad? Like things that should radicalize them in one direction mm, or the other, mm, mm, and yeah. still come home and go, eh, you know, middle of the middle of the ground, sort of not even really that bothered about politics. Because it depends on how you use politics. Some people don't even care they don't even really have a political viewpoint they might even vote every now and again but they actually don't have a stance you know people people in real life at least most people i know they don't form into a circle where you can say they're on this the left end of the spectrum or the right end of the spectrum most people just have it depends on the policy or depends on what you're talking about but if there's enough apathy around then people regardless of their life experience regardless of how accomplished or not accomplished they are tend not to use politics as the avenue to take anything out. So what do you think is a useful level of politics 
for a person to have in his life. And I'm talking here about a professional, someone who's a doctor, a dentist, a, a CEO, a university well, professor. We, 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 do have a, we do have a doctor in the chat. Right. So that's why I'm directing my question towards Dixon. For your peers, Dixon, what is the useful level of politics in someone's life? What, what, what do you see as the range? Honestly, one that doesn't get you fired openly. I mean, ultimately, if you come out of there with some pretty strange views, these are professions that will punish you um, for it. Um, and if you're if you're self-interested in any level, you'd rather just not rock the boat too much. Um, unless unless that's genuinely how you feel, like you feel very strongly, um, such that to not speak about it is a betrayal of your own values, then yeah, fine. I'd say um, if you're a doctor or if you're a dentist or if you're a lawyer or whatever, understand that, you know, maybe understand what policies or what sorts of people benefit, you you know, your career or society in general. Because these are, these are jobs that the way society runs will affect how your work is. Uh, 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 sort of, for example, a much more socially degraded place will have a worse working environment for doctors because they have to deal with a much worse subset of patients. Same goes for things like lawyers. Same goes for things for a lot of, a lot of, a lot of public facing jobs. So understand that which policies and which people will represent a betterment of your environment or society, and then just support that openly or even covertly through elections or whatever, however you want, local or national. But that's how, But you should understand and recognize what the problem is. Most people don't, that's the issue. Most people will say, uh, most people are very reluctant, let's say, to blame the right sorts of people or the right sorts of incidents. Um, and they'll just take, take it one day at a time. And that's actually, that sort of short-term thinking is what fucks you in the long run, I think. Screws you in the long run, sorry. So, uh, Dixon, I would uh, propose to you that the adaptive amount of politics in a professional's life is, is pretty close to zero because the amount of difference that you can reasonably expect to make in politics is almost zero. Correct. I mean, unless, unless you are that one in a million person. Right. And you so for 99.9999% yes. of people, the amount of yeah. useful amount of politics in their life approaches zero unless they're that person who gets energy and enjoyment from, from politics. But on a purely pragmatic basis, there's virtually no reason why someone who's a professional to devote their resources or energy or to risk anything for politics because the chances of them making any difference are very tiny, while the chances of them messing up their life are quite large. Yeah, I think that's a fair, I mean, that's fair enough. Um, I'm, you know, I don't know what Gazelle yeah, has to say. Yeah, but, but doesn't that, that, doesn't that contradict um, your belief in the Schmittian political, that ultimately everything is political, or no? No, it, it doesn't, because <laughs> while ultimately everything uh, may, may well be political, what matters is the individual self-interest, and it's very rare that participation in, in politics aligns with someone's self-interest because it just makes them more vulnerable and it distracts them from those realms of life where they can make a difference. Yeah, but isn't, isn't that a methodological error on your part that you have dedicated lots of live streams to the philosophy of Carl Schmitt? You've talked about the political, this friend-enemy distinction and how it's very natural for many different realms of human existence to become politicized and yet you're resorting to a very kind of social science uh, or like functional approach to things. No, I'd say it's the opposite. I'd say that, that uh, my life bears testimony to how if you're pursuing your pragmatic self-interest, particularly as a, as a professional, that there's, there's virtually no reason that you should pay attention to politics. I get great joy. I get great energy. I get a great thrill. I get a great challenge. I get excited about talking about politics. And part of my joy, excitement, thrill, and challenge is that uh, I like getting down to the nub of clarity on these issues. And I think the, the clear answer is that for the overwhelming majority of people, uh, more than mm. a recreational amount of interest in politics is maladaptive. But don't you think that's changed um, in the last few years, maybe even in the last decade, because there's been so much activism in the West when it comes to free speech, and I'm going to use that really annoying word, the Overton window, because it's shifted. People can talk about politics in the workplace now. 
Uh, no, because it's still or like strongly against individuals' quite, best interests. Everything has everything has become quite inherently political. Like there there was a time when you could watch movies and there weren't like overt political references, but now you know everything is really politicized. When, what movies are you watching? Yeah, I kind of just made a generalization. I didn't even watch that many Hollywood yeah, movies. Yeah, if you see up, if all so, the people yeah. around you are engaged in maladaptive, self-destructive behavior, I don't see how it serves you to join them. Right? People who make a great emphasis on politics uh, usually do so at the cost of their own individual well-being, unless they have that particular type of personality, such as what I have, that gets great joy and intellectual challenge and excitement from investigating and discovering these things. Okay, so um, does anyone want to correct me on, on movies and whether they were politicized back in the day? Well, there have always been varying degrees, I would assume, of uh, politics in in movies like cultural, religious, and political taste changes, change, uh, hero systems adapt, like what society considers right and wrong is, is constantly changing. And uh, there, there are periods where emphasizing the political becomes a, a good uh, business policy, it becomes good social currency. And then there are other occasions where de-emphasizing the, the political uh, becomes more in your self-interest, business interest, and it, it's, it has more social cachet to not be political. So depending on circumstances, the, the amount of politics in entertainment is always going to wax and wane. So you don't think Hollywood has become particularly politically activated right now that everyone you know nearly every hollywood star is is laughing as a bit of a political activist especially with this israel palestine stuff i think that's probably true but i don't think there's almost any significance to it it doesn't change any minds like people did not evolve to be gullible and so all the hollywood stars could campaign on behalf of the palestinians and it'll do the palestinians almost no good I would, I would, I would propose to you that it doesn't matter okay, but it would, how political it would, it, it, it Hollywood impact, and movies and TVs become. Sorry, it would impact the political discourse in America, though. So even though it may not have any impact on, uh, you know, the Israel-Palestine location itself, it will impact, you know, the Democratic Party, the subsequent reaction from the Republican Party, or like, you know, anti-democrat activists. So. It would seemingly think, impact yeah. it, but people are not going to make their voting decisions in the United States overwhelmingly about what happens in Israel and Palestine. It's, it's completely irrelevant to the concerns of ordinary people. People aren't going to have their minds changed because celebrities or the entire entertainment industry came out as you know, pro-Hamas. It would make virtually no difference in the way that uh, people think, and it wouldn't change in a significant way, the direction of American politics, all it would change is the appearance. It would just change the shadows dancing on the wall. It would have no impact on the substance. Okay, but then you are resorting to the same so-called hopeless analysis that I, I gave um, regarding solving crime in no, the No, not at all. I, I'm pointing out there are things that, that make I'm a saying, difference. I'm saying that you know, just communicating about things doesn't actually make a difference um, when it comes to crime. Uh, enacting an actual policy would, um, but they're not going to do that. No, I That's think there, it, it is, there it are types exactly of discourse. The there are types of discourse that have an effect, and there are types of discourse that don't have an effect. What goes on in a foreign country has virtually no effect on indigenous people. Right? What goes on in England? Uh, Japan, Australia, it makes no difference overwhelmingly to Americans. On the other hand, a change in discourse, say, with regard to premarital sex or same-sex marriage or uh, what, what type of clothing is appropriate to wear in public, uh, I think that that may have uh, some, some impact on real-world quality of life. So you don't think 
that people in Minnesota are going to vote for Ilhan Omar because she's got, you know, pro-Palestine, um, pro-Muslim rights sort of views. People who already have pro-Muslim, pro-Palestine views are going to vote for Ilhan mm. Omar and people mm. who have the opposite are not going to vote for her. So to the extent that a politician meets the needs, concerns and priorities of voters, right, to that extent, the, the politician will benefit. But the, the most glib politician and the most uh, sexy Hollywood entertainment is not going to change a significant amount of lives because we did not evolve to be gullible. Everyone's got really good instincts that help them not be manipulated against their best interests. Mm. Okay. Dixon, any thoughts? Well, I my thought is, um, I don't think Gazelle buys that. I don't think she agrees with the gullibility analysis that you just did. I'm interested to see whether she, if she can expand on, on, on whether she agrees on that fully or not. What, that voters are not gullible? I, th I think they all are the, gullible. All the, all, the, all, the, all, the, yeah, all the general principle that people are involved I, I think they are not go against gullible. their own self-interest. And also, I don't think it's just about self-interest. It's also because, you know, you've got, like in the UK, you've got the first-past-the-post system, right? So you don't want to be, you can't really vote for the candidate that you really think is going to be the best. You're just going to vote to stop the other party from winning, that sort of thing. Hey, can like, you guys carry this conversation for two minutes while I fill up my water bottle? Sure, yeah. Great, thanks. Well, maybe sure, of course. we'll take a break. <laughs> we'll do it. You better not take a break. You've got to carry this show, the two of you. No, because, and now it's a heavy burden okay, on your shoulders. No, because we can't do it without the host. True, that for is two true, minutes. Host. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll count to 120. Seriously, I want to take a break. If you can't hold the show go for on, two yeah. minutes. Yeah, go on. Take, take okay. a break. Go on. Then hold yeah, yeah, the yeah. show for two minutes. Carry on this okay, conversation, yeah, please. Well, well, Dixon, how was your day? Mm -hmm. What have you been up to? Not much. What's, what's this? Um, the name of the stream is Decoding uh, Destiny, a.k.a. Stephen Burnell. Mm. Um, what, what did you did you guys discuss much of yeah. that? Yeah. Well, no, we didn't discuss much of that. But uh, this is the second part of Luke Ford's stream on this topic. So he did a four-hour stream on decoding Destiny yesterday, and uh, he hasn't managed to finish it today either. So he will carry on tomorrow or whenever he wishes to stream again. But this title, what it refers to, is a podcast called Decoding the Gurus. And it's um, run by an academic called Chris Kavanagh, who uh, sort of analyzes all of these Jordan Peterson type gurus and thought leaders that have emerged online. Mm. <clears throat> and he comes at it from a very academic perspective. And I think he's a kind of evolutionary uh, psychologist and anthropologist himself. Um, so he knows where people are going wrong and just saying BS things. Um, and so he's got loads of episodes. I'm not sure how many, but let's say he's got 200 episodes. Um, Luke Ford is working on decoding the decoders. Do you understand? So their last episode uh, was decoding Destiny, you know, the guy mm -hmm. with the blue hair. And yeah. Luke Ford is now decoding the decoders on decoding destiny. So it's an analysis of the analysis of the analysis. Brilliant. Luke is reviewing a podcast and that's his kind of recent endeavor. Fine, so this isn't this isn't like a roast or whatever of um of, <laughs> of, of, of des destiny of Steve <laughs> No, it's not a roast. He, uh, Luke Ford is a, quite a serious thinker. No, I, I, uh, I, I agree. And he'll incorporate stuff from his personal life. He likes to talk about his narcissistic personality disorder, his talks with different psychiatrists and therapists, his exes, um, and, and how you know some of his exes used to have really big boobs. And okay. he, he was talking about how uh, Edward Dutton is this so-called crank. He's not really a crank, but, you know, he kind of 
presents himself as a crank. He's a crank kind of uh, evolutionary psychologist, and he claims that um, women with um, bigger boobs they are <laughs> they are better lovers than they are mothers, and that it's the mm. women with the A cups that are better better lover uh, better. Well, mothers. I fucking hope so. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, no. <laughs> no, uh, and, and and Luke Ford agrees with that because in his life, um, he, he's had quite a few relationships, and the the women with the bigger boobs have been kind of more, de- you know, they've been more loving, but they've also been more demanding and less kind of motherly. Um, so yeah, he it's it's a kind of uh, recurring feature of his live streams that he'll you know he'll take a serious topic. So a serious topic in this case is decoding the decoders um and then he'll also talk about he'll incorporate stuff from his personal life um and and those those stories from his personal life are quite repetitive but not in a bad way he weaves them in in a very relevant manner so even though he'll repeat the same story but he'll make it highly relevant to the actual topic at hand okay of course um and uh what else oh and he's he's a um he's a practitioner of the uh alexander technique um which is this kind of i don't know if you've heard of it but it's this exercise program that works on your posture and luke ford has been kind of trained to be a kind of coach in the Mm. alexander technique so uh, he could perhaps give us some tips in a bit. There are some videos lurking online of uh, um, Luke Ford um, kind of practicing the Alexander technique with with um, a um, what clients. would you call it? I don't yeah, clients. clients. That's it. Yeah, Sorry. students. Yeah, thank you. Students. E- excellent job. Thank you for for providing the explanation. Thank you for summarizing I mean, what I, I'm attempting I, I, I to just... do wanted to add one more thing another yes. recurring feature of uh luke ford's uh live streams is him incorporating his 12 steps program uh because uh, he was a kind of recovering alcoholic at one point in his life if i if, I, if i'm correct uh, no never a substance or alcohol but a various oh, uh, disabling emotional addictions with regard to love romance sex uh, earning See, money, this is it. My, money, my, my mind can't, my mind can't handle repetition to such a great degree that I don't even remember what the repetition is properly. <laughs> so even though you've repeated this loads of times, I still think it's because you went to AA and you're a recovering alcoholic. Yeah, but sorry, a- you can ca- you can clarify again. Uh, yeah, AA saying. is the is the grandfather of twelve uh, step programs, but now there there are dozens of twelve step programs that just uh, focus on emotional addictions. You know, mal- maladaptive compulsive patterns of behavior as opposed to uh, substance addictions. So substance addictions are things like alcoholism, marijuana addiction, cocaine addiction, meth addiction, heroin addiction. And then process addictions are people who are addicted to shopping, to maladaptive relationships, to hoarding, to debting, to underrunning and the, the like. Uh, uh, Dixon, have you ever felt yourself in... in in the grip of some sort of uh, maladaptive emotional compulsion? Um, maybe, maybe, maybe. See, not, nothing to do with substances. I don't really consume anything like that. But maybe like the emotional, it can be very, certain emotions or certain people who bring out certain emotions in you can be quite addicting, for sure. Um, but I think those are pretty relatively easy to get over if, if you're because what's what it is is you're having too much fun in your addiction once it stops becoming a bit of fun you will just get tired of it and it becomes more easy for you to rationalize yourself out of it so when you say it's very easy to get over are you speaking for yourself or are you speaking for the rest of the population i have to assume for something like 90 percent of the population this should apply and yet millions of people are stuck in these compulsive uh, emotional addictions and they don't find it easier to overcome them. So they're how would you understand that? I think they're having too much fun in their compulsions and also they don't so have do you know people stuck in negative emotional compulsions and you look at them and think, wow, they're really having fun? 
Yeah, I do. I think there's a lot of fun people have in their own misery. Absolutely. Some people even romanticize their misery. Are, hmm. are you talking about me there? No, not uh, not you. Yeah, but I, I I want you to put me into that paradigm. Well, I mean, what else do you have if you don't have your own miseries, uh, Gazelle? You're otherwise, mm. otherwise your life is just sort of boring. Mm. Like, right, so people the, build the, a monument to their misery. I mean, what else well, do you have, though, other than that, realistically? Well, can, wait, 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 can I just add one more thing before um, I have a spaz attack? Um, there's one more thing that uh, Luke Ford incorporates into his live streams, and that is his conversion to orthodox judaism and mm. oh and of course his transition from the sort of pornography industry into uh more um clean and and uh, wait you, you were you in the pornography industry yeah i read a book about it i read a blog about it for a decade but you haven't really changed because you're still an observer you so you know what, how steve saylor has that? written a book called noticing that is you luke ford what? you notice things and then and then report them sorry but, but what exactly were you reporting on like were you watching porn and then just reporting on, on no i wasn't porn? reviewing yeah. pornography i was reporting on organized crime in the industry i was reporting on hiv transmission in the industry i was reporting mm. on you know murder and suicide in, in the industry i was reporting on technological trends that then translated to other parts of the economy for example, the, the business trajectory of the pornography industry and the business trajectory of the news industry are virtually identical. So both journalism as an economic model is essentially dead, and the traditional pornographic business model is also dead. But you are alive. I'm sorry? But you are alive. I am alive, thank God. Can you read us a passage from your, um, from your book? Oh, gosh. Please. Could, could you read us the introduction? Just like the introductory, you know, two, three paragraphs. Okay, you'll have to carry the show for another minute or two while I dig up my book. Okay. What do you think about Luke Ford, Dixon? What is your is right? character analysis uh, so far? <clears throat> I think they're pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty interesting. Um, character analysis of what exactly, though? Um, well, I, I don't know how to define that further. If you do, if you don't have a character analysis, then you just don't have one. Oh, you you mean what's my analysis of his character? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, like what kind of not character as in if he's a good or bad person. Although you could talk about that as well. But like, what mm. kind of person is he? What sort of personality does he have? Uh, does he remind you of anybody? Um, what do you think about this sort of? thing that he's doing um live streaming uh nearly sort of every day for three four hours uh it, would you say that that's eccentric or do you think it's actually quite rational within the context of his life i don't know does he get, i don't i don't know him enough to make this judgment but does he have some sort of meditative purpose for doing this like is it is it therapeutic for him to do it or is it just is there a well, goal yeah, I think, orientation i think it's it's to reach intellectual clarity and mm. it actually it actually helps him stay away from um, vices. So he will okay. spend, you know, I think he could potentially spend up to six hours in a stream on average. Oh. I'm not just talking about the the stream itself, but also like the lead up to the stream. So he'll like read things and uh, collect articles and then, you know, sh sh share his screen. Uh, show show us the articles, show us the content, the videos that he's uh, going to be evaluating. Um, yeah, so he's. Um, I, th I think this helps him um, use his time effectively, actually. And it, it's ironic because one was saying, "Oh, what a waste of time to live stream for such a long time," uh, which is why I don't categorize Luke Ford as. An eccentric necessarily because what he's doing is rational within the context of his own life okay i've uh, i can't find my my best known book which is called a history of x 100 years of sex and film i've got a copy somewhere but i can't find it but i've got a copy really of my... really what really you can't find a copy of your 
right. book. No, I, I don't keep it handy. I haven't referenced it in more than a decade. Uh, so oh, that's here, fascinating I'll, too. I'll, I'll read a, a description of me that was published by Matt Labash in the Weekly Standard, September 21, 1998. Luke is from Kurumbong, outside Sydney. He's a kind of shaggy-haired, acid-washed Brad Pitt, the 32-year-old son of a former Seventh-day Adventist evangelist. After a bout with atheism in his 20s, he converted to Judaism on hearing Dennis Prager, the Jewish radio theologian. Luke moved to Los Angeles and decided to write a book on either ethical living or pornography. He settled on porn, and his History of X will be published next year. In the meantime, he serves as the industry's Matt Drudge, operating a porn news website where profiles of Wendy Whoppers and Max Hardcore are garnished with Torah references and discussion of whether Jewish porners keep kosher. Loathed in the porn industry for aggressively reporting stories such as an HIV epidemic that has seen five stars test positive since January, Luke is forced to catch a Sydney Morning Herald press pass to gain admittance to the World Pornography Conference. I ask him why he stays on this beat, and after feeble protestations about being the only critical observer in a racket filled with industry shills, he finally shrugs. Good question. It's something I talk about weekly with my shrink. She's an Orthodox Jew. Wow, we lost well, Dixon. Not... Wow, I, I, I offended him. I don't think you offended him. Maybe he had connection issues. Yeah, I'm kidding. Not, not everything's personal. Mm. Well, I can't tell if you're when you're joking and when you're not joking. That's quite interesting about it. Luke, people people say that about me, um, right. but I think I have more of an indicator in my voice when I'm joking. Also, there's a lot of times where I just start laughing at my own jokes, and then people very obviously know that I'm joking. Um, but yeah, how do you, um, we'll, we'll we'll wait for Dixon. You might have to read that out again. Um, meanwhile, how are you coping with this live stream of yours? Because you haven't finished what you wanted to finish and we have been acting as filibusters haven't we no I, I like it i i enjoy talking with you i enjoy talking with dixon i respect the intellect of, of both of you and it's it's a pleasure to talk to you and to carry on conversations with smart people who come into the chat and throw in challenges so i'm, I'm having a good time so i don't feel constrained to the subject topic and I never have felt constrained to a mm. subject topic like I prefer to be in the moment. Are you sort of worn out a little bit because you have been live streaming for six hours and it's... five minutes. Wow. And so what's your longest live stream by the way? And you've gone past I, I did seven uh, hours? I did over eight hours for the twenty twenty American presidential election. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Okay, and anything beyond that? No. So we we might be your second wind. Yeah. Whoa. This 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 feels epic. I feel honored. I feel honored, Excellent. honestly, Luke. Because I uh, I also and I'm not just saying this because you said that to us, but um, I really do respect you as a person, uh, you know, as a human being, and also um, as an intellect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, it, for me, it's it's like some people like uh, digging in the dirt and creating a garden. Like other people like to work with wood. Uh, other people like to volunteer and help the homeless or deliver you know, meals on wheels to elderly shut ins. Uh, this is what I enjoy doing. Well, thank you for that analogy. Uh, as you know, analogies can be quite traumatic for me. But I don't want to bore you with any conversation about uh, the one who cannot be named anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Uh, okay. Uh, Dixon, welcome back Dixon, to the can, show. Um, Thank for, you. 40, 40, you can read that out again. Um, uh, I, I went... I won't read the same thing out again. I'll read uh, the prologue to no, my... That, that, did, you, did you hear it, Dixon? No, I was out. No, it was it was really good. Read read that one again. It was very yeah, but it won't be yeah, you... really good for the audience. So if Dixon's oh, interested, well, he can tune into the six hour mark and and hear it. But uh, uh, let me let me read okay. something. Oh, well, you the... you repeat everything anyway, forty, please. Well, then I, I need to move on from <laughs> that maladaptive habit. 
it's not maladaptive absolutely because you, you've, you've obviously adapted it you've adapted it to uh the topic at hand so what's like, that about uh, uh curious right now i have like 16 people hanging on my every word i know so, and they would love to listen to you repeat yourself once more <laughs> you're saying do it to me one more time once is never enough with a bloke like no. you no no, I'm not saying that. I just wanted to read Do out to um, the the. Time. Sorry. No, I, uh, please just just read. Please, can you just read out the uh, the article again? It was quite short. It wasn't. I mean, I know you 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 feel a bit shy now because you you probably feel like I'm a very ghosting, humble man. But... I hate to talk about myself. <laughs> yeah, go 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 on because then you know. We might be okay. ending this stream soon anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, as okay. it's, it's come to the six hour mark. Yeah. Cool. So let me read let me read the, the prologue. It's just one page from my memoir, Excommunicated a Rebel Without a Shawl. I published it in two thousand and four. So this is entry December twenty four, nineteen ninety nine. Friday afternoon I walk a mile from my ten by twenty foot hovel to the magnificent ten story headquarters of Larry Flint publications outside Beverly Hills. I slump down on a brick bench beside the entrance and wait for Hustler magazine features editor David Bookbinder. Suddenly, door flies open. Mike Albo, the fat, bored, heroin-addicted editor of Hustler Erotic Video Guide, charges out. Get the F off the property, he screams. I'm just here to meet David for lunch, I explain. He's not interested. Mike grabs my jacket, shakes me, knocks me down. From the ground, I see a burly LFP security guard looking on. I pick myself up and scurry over to the sidewalk, hoping Albo will leave me alone once I am on public property. He doesn't. I back down the street as David walks out of the building. Come here, you pussy, yells Albo, his round face contorted with rage. I can't help smiling. People stop to watch. Men in a car cheers for a fight, but I have no stomach for it. My last fight was in sixth grade. I lost. Although Albo is a tubby three-pack-a-day smoker, his homicidal anger scares me. He picks up a metal chain and swings it above his head. You want to die, or do you want to stop writing about me? I say yes, unable to stop grinning. What are you smiling about? You think this is funny? Do I amuse you? He lunges for my neck and smashes my head repeatedly into a light pole. My life flashes before my eyes. End of prologue. So can you read out the No, I'm not going to repeat there? what I just read uh, six minutes ago. But you, but you repeat everything anyway. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to repeat this time because you've inspired me to move in a more adaptive and progressive direction for my life. Surely, surely here, mimesis, right, uh, you know, repeating yourself would be more adaptive because Dixon would then have access to what I have access to. Yeah, that's okay. Um, Dixon, do you, do you uh, let, let's, let's move on. Dixon, do you see any signs of hope in the United Kingdom? Yeah, um, I'd like to think that, well... Um, I do, but that's purely because I'm more of an optimistic person myself. It's not so much I see signs of hope. I don't see anything changing, but I think fundamentally people in the UK are a pretty nice bunch of people. And um, wherever there's enough of them around, things could always turn around, I think. Absolutely. Why not? So in large part, it sounds like underneath your words, you feel hope in large part because you, you are helpful about the direction of your life. I mean, absolutely. That's that's where that's where all my thoughts and emotions come from. Is fundamentally internal. Um, I see the external world and I see it for what it is. But depending on what I'm doing and what I'm feeling, that changes. So things can be going really poorly outside, but if I'm feeling good inside, then I'm very hopeful, regardless of what I see. And what do you think about the notion that we did not evolve to be gullible? It depends. I think men were evolved. Men have evolved to be fooled by women on some level. I think we know it when it's happening. We like it anyways. Um, so I don't know. I don't. Des I don't necessarily buy on a social level that we've. Maybe thinking about it in the sense of evolution or change is, is wrong. But maybe it's just. I think people almost in some level like or want someone to trick them into something. And uh, curious, what's your perspective on the argument we did not evolve to be gullible? Um, I disagree. I think we evolved to be gu gullible, um, which is why uh, religion is still very important. 
And how much, for example, does the entertainment industry change the way people think and value different political directions? Uh, curious, any thoughts on that? How does the entertainment industry do what, sorry? How significantly does the entertainment industry change people's values and how they think about the world in political and cultural terms? Well, because most people don't think, so they are very prone to indoctrination from the entertainment industry. And so, Dixon? Sorry. No, that's all I, I have to say anyway. What was the Dixon? question again, sorry? How much does the entertainment industry change people's minds about uh, politics, about morality? Mm, morality, not so much, because what you are on the inside is what you'll remain forever. Um, but politics, maybe. I mean, it, you know, ultimately, if you think of politics as a series of trends, uh, and if the ent if you believe that the entertainment industry can affect that trend, then you absolutely think that it can affect people's politics. So yeah, I'd say the answer is yes. But how significantly? Uh, one percent? You think uh, it makes like a one no, percent difference in political voting patterns? A point one percent? A ten percent difference? No, no, no. I think I think that it's very it's it's a very real effect, but it can be very negligible. So let's say a five percent. Five percent? I mean, that's that's huge. Well, how is it huge? How is this? Oh yeah, how is five percent huge? Well, most most elections would go a different way if there were a five percent swing. Mm, yeah, but what what, what do what do you mean by five percent? Yeah, I, I didn't in terms of mean five percent. Yeah, so I mean, every American in, presidential 5 election increase in intensity of influence. That's what. Oh, you I was at a five percent change voting. in voting. No, oh, I sorry, don't think that's I, I didn't meant. realize you were asking about how it affects like electoral, like actual mm. votes. I thought it was just meant to be about how it affects an individual person's leaning one way or the other. Um, that may not necessarily translate to how they vote because if you know you could be someone who's already going to vote for one party, consume media, and that tilts you five percent further in the direction that you already were going in. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Okay. And how about the the educational system? How much do you think the educational system changes people's ways of thinking about politics? Probably has next to no effect. And curious? Oh yeah, I think it's got a big effect, but not educational system as in directly coming from your teachers. Like say if your teacher's left wing or something and she's talking about everything from a left wing perspective, that's not going to, going to imp uh, influence you, but your peers will. Right, so basically, if you're surrounded by a certain yeah. group of people, yeah, uh, you might, and you had to, you had to spend your formative years with them. Yeah, that would definitely affect how you think in your later life. Mm. But, and the so same with I the agree entertainment with industry there. I thought, I thought you meant more like how much just the education itself that you get affect. I don't think that has any effect, but mm. the environment. You know, if you're in school or in your college, that is an that is an environment. Depending on whether you go to a good one or not, that affects how you think. Well, what do you think, Luke? I don't believe that uh, the education system changes people's political preferences because we did not evolve to be gullible. Therefore, we cannot be propagandized in a way that contradicts our own sense of our interests. Well, you're, you're very sort of hell-bent on that point. That's very interesting. I am. It's a fundamental part of where I depart from the conventional wisdom because the conventional wisdom mm -hmm. is all about how disinformation and propaganda and savvy advertising techniques and manipulation techniques are constantly distracting people away from their own best interests. And I don't believe it's true. I don't believe that we would be here alive today as a species if we evolved to be gullible. I believe that even 90 IQ people have pretty good uh, ways of detecting when they're being manipulated against their best interests. I remember when I was a kid, there was a lunatic asylum near my friend's home. And when I'd be hanging out with my friend, these loonies would walk down the street to go to the corner store. And I'd try to trade them for their radio because they'd be listening to the radio. They'd be listening to music because they'd walk down the street. And I figured these are a bunch of loonies. And so I would offer them my underwear in exchange for their radio. And even these lunatics were hard to deceive. I couldn't manipulate them against their best interests.
Mm. Well, that's that's an interesting anecdote. Dixon, you... you've got a long history of uh, manipulating lunatics. What do you think? Oh, well, I don't know about that. But... Well, thanks <laughs> for that, Luke. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> um, but no, but you're, if you mean by, by, by my profession... I have not been manipulated by Dixon. Can I just tell you that? <laughs> oh, that's what you mean. Okay, fine. Um, no, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's more of a symbiotic relationship. Um, but I think... Um, no, you're right. You know, I actually kind of agree with you in that. Yeah, people who are, especially people who are dumber in a conventional sense, have really good instincts. Um, yeah. It can come from a level of paranoia, but realistically, it's very tough to fool someone um, who doesn't already want to be fooled. So, yeah, yeah, 145 kind of... IQ guy is going to have a heck of a time talking a 90 IQ woman into bed <laughs> if it's not aligned with their best interests. Mm. I agree. What, what kind of experience, Dixon, do you have trying to communicate with people who are more than 30 IQ points below you? Um, I, I, I find it very difficult to even assess someone's IQ, if I'm being honest with you. But speaking to some, I find it, it depends on which context. If it's on a personal sense, I don't mind. I, it can be fun. If it's on a professional sense and, and you're having to talk down to someone, um, it's very difficult because I, I don't like to... Um, I'm, I don't, I'm very conscious about coming across as very arrogant, so I tend to tone it down. So it can be very difficult in a professional capacity. Personally, not so much. Well, in your professional capacity, you're going to have a hell of a time trying to get someone to take a drug prescription as directed if they are less than 30 IQ points below you. Like someone with an 85 IQ is not going to have much fidelity sticking to a, a drug prescription. Well... I'm a little bit detached from my work in that I, I see my job as write the prescription, give someone the information needed. Beyond that, it's up to them. It's their health. I'm not their mum. I'm not their dad. Um, the thing about, so this is something that we discuss a lot in healthcare that a lot of the time, in order to actually follow a treatment regime, people never use IQ. The word IQ is never used because, you know, we don't like using that term. But people talk about things like, you know, oh, you're in a socially deprived area, which means something like, I mean, uh, the area I, I work in is pretty good. It's a, it's a relatively well-off area. It's actually, technically, it's one of the most conservative areas in the country, I was just told. Um, but realistically, and people are quite well off. A lot of them are white. Uh, people, you know, your, your patients can actually understand why they're getting a drug and why they need to follow that treatment blah, blah, blah. An area slightly north of me, it's called Leicester. Um, what we were discussing the other day, we were having a teaching session on this, and actually something like, I think like 8% or 12% of the adults there fundamentally are unable to retain information uh, when you give them healthcare information, are unable to actually use it to make a weight, weighted decisions, uh, and therefore that will affect their compliance with treatments because there's no there's no point prescribing something if the patient's not going to take it ultimately um the best the best drug is the one that the patient's most likely going to do and use uh, and something like one in 10 or one in one in 12 patients or something are actually unable to actually follow through with that because uh, they can't they can't even because to do that you need to have some basic understanding of mats you need to understand how dosing works you need to understand how why taking half a pill uh, is different from why taking two pills a lot of people actually don't understand that. Um, uh, no one actually says the word IQ. It's a, it's a term we don't like using, but realistically, it makes it makes my, my job harder on the one hand, but I also don't really care. I don't see it as my job to baby people. It's, it's, it's their responsibility at the end of the day. And uh, curious, what's your experience like talking, communicating with people who are more than 30 IQ points below you? I find it quite liberating because I'm, I'm quite up in my head. And it's quite nice to speak to people who are dumb. Well, I, I would I would propose to you, Curious, that it verges on the impossible. And the people that you may be thinking of right now who are more than 30 IQ points below you are actually less than 30 IQ points because uh, functionally it, it verges on the impossible for people to communicate when there's more than a 30 IQ point gap. Really? Yeah. Oh, you were, you were sort of testing us. 
I'm not testing you. I'm I'm relaying something that I've read to see how yeah, it yeah, fits yeah, the but... reality of your experience. Hmm. Mm. But yeah, that 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 I categorize that as a sort of test. Um, <laughs> I don't know if Dixon agrees. I don't know if he's still there. Um, that's really interesting. So I I've never spoken to somebody who's thirty IQ points below me. Then. Yeah, like someone who's so stupid they can't read a you know second grade children's book. Oh well, then what's my IQ? What are you assuming my IQ to be? Around one thirty. Hmm. Dixon Dixon's is higher than mine, though. I think Dixon is more one four five. Uh, Dixon, what what are the oh. most frustrating things for you in your personal life, considering that uh, ninety five percent of the people you interact with are less sharp than yourself? Um. Number one, I don't agree with that. Um, I don't see myself as having that high of an IQ because in real life, I'm not that frustrated talking to people. Mm, I'm quite personable, so ultimately I'm not so bothered. But if someone is like genuinely from a different world than I am, such that they don't even understand what I'm saying, I just don't bother speaking to them. I think speaking uh, to really high IQ people is really difficult. Right, I don't know, I'd more than speak 30 to a IQ disabled points. person. No, if, if they're more if they're, than, if go they ahead. Are, if they're below, uh, if they're 30 IQ points below me, so I'm imagining some kind of retarded person, right? Is that, is that? No, 30 IQ points below you is 100, which is average. Yeah, so there are loads of Pakistanis who are like that. And I can talk to them absolutely fine. I mean, I've worked in the restaurant industry with low IQ Pakistani men. And I've been completely cordial with them. The conversations have been fine. I've been able to get along with them. In fact, you can you can kind of control people if they're if they're a lower IQ. And probably whoever's listening so to the audience that may just come across as completely sadistic or something. But um, yeah, you you could kind of manage people who have lower IQs. Because That's they ideal. they are they are evolved to be gullible, and so you can yeah. use so your superior a, IQ to manipulate yeah. them. Well, not manipulate. I, I mean, maybe in strictly psychological terms, it'll st still be categorized as manipulation. But you know, you can kind of uh, boss them around, tell them what to do. Oh, the the sources have to be put like this. The customer needs this. Blah blah blah, and they will just comply so long as you don't deeply offend them. If I if I go up to them and I'm like, oh, you said the, the thing with lower IQ people, they also tend to have less uh, self restraint. They also tend to be um, more sort of um, if if you offend them, they will really get offended. Like all the Pakistanis who were protesting against Salman Rushdie's uh, satanic verses back in the what was it the 1970s and 80s. Um, Oh, was it was it after that? Sorry. Yeah, the the satanic versus protest was in the middle of nineteen eighty nine. Uh huh. Okay, nineteen eighty nine. So, the these individuals protesting must have been um, just mainly low IQ Pakistani men, you know. So they are going to get more offended. They are going to get out on the streets and start rioting. Um, so like, say if in a kind of restaurant industry context, if I am, if I just go up to these men and, I'm, and I start telling them, oh, like, let's have a really intellectual conversation about religion. And let me tell you about, you know, this X, Y, Z chapter of your holy book and how this is not correct. And, or like, if, it, even if it's not a religious debate, maybe that, that was a bad example because it's far too kind of esoteric a conversation that you would be having with you know somebody who's working with you um like i don't know maybe if i start asking them questions about their, their personal lives like oh so like where are you from what do you do maybe they'll take that in a different way maybe they'll get ang angry maybe they'll get flustered so so long as you don't so long as you if you're careful in your communication 
and you know where the boundary lies, yeah, these people will comply. Uh, and again, the language that I'm using sounds very mean and robotic and, and just evil, but I don't, I don't mean it. I'm just using it in a matter of fact way. And uh, Dixon, does that match your experience with people with dramatically lower IQ? Because I, my opinion would be that people with a dramatically lower IQ are going to be quite surly and suspicious of someone who's much smarter than them. Yeah, I think so. I think I agree with that. People who've got much, a dramatically lower IQ, i.e. if they're really like what you might consider close to being retarded or even several points below average, and they're quite paranoid. Uh, they think that if you're, they think you're trying to trick them into something or, yeah, that could absolutely be the case. And uh, are there any public policies, Dixon, aside from ones we've discussed already, do you think that could improve the quality of life in the United Kingdom? Mm. Oh, public policies. I don't know that you could have a public policy that fixes this issue. It needs to come from on a societal level. No, any public issue. Is there any pressing public issue in the United Kingdom that you think a change of public policy could improve? Literally. Mm. I think, I mean, simply just making it harder to get into this country probably will fix a lot of their issues. That's all about it. That's about it, really, I can think of. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap up the stream for today. Uh, Dixon, any final words, anything you want to add? No, good. It was a good stream. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Thanks, Dixon. Uh, curious, anything you want to add? Any final words? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to tell Dixon that I forgot one more thing that Luke Ford incorporates into his streams, and that is um, references to Dennis Prager, who runs Prager University. Um, and I always find that really fascinating. Because he, he does a full on like personality analysis of Dennis Prager and relates it back directly to the topic at hand and never kind of uh, deviates from the topic. And yeah, so thank you so much, Luke. I, I understand that I may have bored you in some parts with my uh, conversations about Morrison, but um, you're an amazing person. It was really fun to uh, speak to you tonight.